Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, welcome back again, somewhat earlier than expected when I made a similar statement a fortnight ago, and I thank you and those not present for their understanding. The Senate meets today in accordance with a request made by the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Cormann, with the agreement of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, under the order of the Senate of 23 March 2020. I notified Senators of the time and date of the meeting on 2 April and I table the correspondence. Before we commence, can I remind you of the minor procedural adjustments to apply to sittings this week to enable observance of social distancing and other health advice. First, you may speak from a seat that is not your own. Broadcasting has been provided with an informal seating plan based on advice from the parties. In lieu of calling a division, as occurred on 23 March, senators can request that their votes or the votes of their parties be recorded. If a division is required, senators may be counted if they are standing behind the bank of seats on the relevant side of the chamber. If the Senate is required to resolve into a committee of the whole, that committee may be chaired from the president's chair. The doors to the chamber will remain open throughout proceedings. Divisions will be counted with the doors unlocked, with the usual rule that senators may not enter the chamber nor move from the seats they have taken or the place they are standing once tellers are appointed. With the concurrence of the Senate, it is so ordered. Finally, work continues on the ability of the Senate to meet otherwise than in accordance with the existing procedures, including the consideration of electronic and remote participation. I'm not yet in a position to provide any firm advice on such arrangements at this stage. If they are required, they will be considered by the Committee on Procedure as ordered by the Senate on the 23rd of March. I thank Senators. The Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to hours of meeting and the routine of business for today. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate and I move the motion circulated in my name. The question is the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fieravanti Wells. I thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in my name for two sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Taxation Administration Private Ancillary Fund Guidelines 2019. Thank you. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Senator C. What I didn't see you there. You I also give chair. notice on the next day of sitting. Um, I'll move that the Senate expresses its ongoing support for the implementation of the recommendations of the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse, that acknowledges the pain and suffering of survivors of child sexual abuse, expresses its ongoing support for survivors of child sexual abuse and encourages survivors to keep coming forward. Thank you. Apologies, Senator Seawitt. I'll move to the placing of business. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you. The President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Leave granted. Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for today for personal, health and other reasons. Senators Abetz, Antic, Askew, Bragg, Canavan, Chandler, Fawcett, Griff, Hanson, Henderson, Hughes, Lambie, MacDonald, McLaughlin, McMahon, O'Sullivan, Rennick, Stoker and Van. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move, I, look that leave, I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for today. Ayres, Billick, Brown, Carr, Dodson, Farrell, Gallagher, Green, McCarthy, O'Neill, Polly, Pratt, Mariel Smith and Stirl. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Leave is granted. Senator Seward. I move that leave of absence be granted for the following senators for today. Senators Denatali, Faruqi, Hanson Young, McKim, Rice and Steelejohn. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. There being no others, I'll move to ministerial statements. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, at this, uh, one of the most difficult times in our nation's history, uh, we come together to serve the Australian people and guide our nation through this unprecedented challenge. Our focus today, as it has been every day <clears throat> since this crisis began, is to help Australians get safely to the other side. This fast-moving, Highly contagious disease is unrelenting, terrifying in scale and nature, a health crisis like no other in living memory. It does not discriminate young and old, fit and healthy, men and women, factory workers to CEOs, people from all walks of life, including, as we know, politicians. As the experience in the UK has shown, princes and prime ministers are not immune from this virus either. It has impacted many lives around the world and here in Australia. And we know that it will affect many more. Every Australian has felt the impact of the coronavirus, some very directly, but everyone through its, through its impact on our economy and our daily lives. 5,956 Australians have tested positive to COVID-19. Tragically, 48 Australians have died from this virus. It is worse, much worse, in some other parts of the world. Our thoughts are with those who have lost loved ones and friends, while we continue to support our fellow Australians battling ill health. We are all in this together. This is first and foremost a health crisis, and the government is dealing with the medical battle as our highest priority. But it is not only the health and well-being of Australians at risk. Life as we know it has changed in the face of COVID-19. In dealing with this challenge, we had to make changes that have affected the lives of every Australian. Businesses have closed their doors and workers have lost their jobs. It will be some time before we know the full extent of the economic and social impact of this health crisis. Schools have changed to different modes of learning. A number of community services are no longer operating. Facilities we've come to take for granted, gyms, pools, cinemas, are no longer open to us. Thriving industries have ground to a halt. Strict social restrictions have forced on us a new way of living. Actions we are taking in responding to this new reality are in the best interests of Australians. They are necessary to save lives. The steps we have taken are slowing down the spread of the virus to ensure our hospital system, in particular our ICUs, are able to deal with the flow of patients in need of care. Official data shows that we are heading in the right direction. When we last met, new cases were growing at more than 20 per cent per day. In recent days, it has averaged 2 per cent a day. This is, of course, encouraging. We seem to be achieving our mission to flatten the curve. But while it looks right now like the trend is our friend, we cannot take our foot off the brake in terms of slowing down the spread of this virus. We have to keep at it together and for all of us. It is important that all Australians continue to heed the advice of our top medical officials, particularly over the Easter break and over winter. 
The regulations, protocols and advice that federal and state governments have put in place are based on expert medical advice. And we all have a role to play. Self-isolating, working from home, practicing good hygiene, engaging with friends and family virtually and not physically. We are asking all Australians to follow the health advice that has been issued by the Chief Medical Officer so that they can protect their own health, the health of their families and the health of the whole community. We are asking Australians to stay home as much as they can, to work from home where they can. We know Australians um, are asked to accept a lot of changes to save Australian lives. And we need to lead by example. <clears throat> that is why the government moved <clears throat> during our last sitting to suspend the previously agreed parliamentary sitting calendar until 11 August 2020. We are a very large continent. The logistics involved in bringing this parliament together ordinarily involves 227 members and senators plus staff and many, many others travelling to Canberra from all corners of our great nation. In the context of the health advice, we expect all Australians to comply with, to, re to restrict travel, to stay at home where possible. This is not something we should be doing right now unless it is necessary. We are asking Australians to comply with these restrictions to help us save lives. Where we can, we, of course, also should and must comply with these restrictions. Most states and the Northern Territory have in fact closed their state or territory borders and imposed strict quarantine requirements on return travellers to their jurisdictions. Yes, as federal members of parliament, we do have access to relevant exemptions as essential workers, as we must. We have those exemptions appropriately, even though, without taking all these necessary precautions, we are seen as comparatively high risk of contracting the coronavirus disease given the work we do day in, day out. So on public health grounds, it is surely incumbent on us to use that exemption judiciously to act consistent with the public health advice directed to all other Australians to the largest extent possible and to minimise our travel during this period. Parliament not sitting for a period does not mean the government is not under scrutiny from the parliament. The government supports the important work of the Senate Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation, ably chaired by Senator Conchetta Fioranti Wells. We will also be supporting the establishment of a dedicated select committee to be chaired by the Shadow Finance Minister, Senator, Senator Gallagher, which will be examining and scrutinising the government's response to COVID-19. In fact, our government very much welcomes the establishment of this Senate Select Committee, which will have the job to scrutinise and question all of the initiatives and measures taken by our government in responding to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, that committee will be supported from the coalition side by Senator uh, James Patterson, a very experienced committee chair in the broader, across the broader uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet and Finance portfolios, who will be our nominee for Deputy Chair, and Senator Perrin Davey, who will bring an important regional perspective to the work of that committee. All interested senators will be able to participate in that long-term inquiry as they see fit. It, is also, it also, of course, remains possible for senators to ask ministers questions on notice, and I know a number of colleagues in this chamber uh, take a furious advantage of that opportunity. Furthermore, the parliament may well sit again between now and August, if and as required. The motion the Senate agreed unanimously when we last met um, allowed for the President to determine the day and time of the next meeting of the Senate at the request of and or the agreement of the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. That is in fact precisely how today's sitting of the Senate came about. I will be moving a motion to the same effect before the Senate adjourns today. To put it simply, the Senate can sit and will sit to ensure measures are implemented that protect Australians, support the economy, jobs and Australians in need of support in response to the increasing threat of the coronavirus. But during this period, we will only do so uh, if necessary uh, to um, act consistent as much as we can uh, with the public health advice directed uh, by medical experts uh, to all Australians. Mr. President, our nation has faced many challenges and history tells us we will emerge on the other side of this stronger and closer. 
Through our determination, our strength and our resilience, Australia and all Australians will see this challenge through in our own unique and gritty way. COVID-19 coronavirus is not just a health crisis. It has rocked the foundation of our economy and we know many Australian businesses and workers are hurting. As a government, we feel their pain and we are here to help. We want all Australians to have the best possible opportunity to get safely to the other side of all this. We want to help as many businesses as possible to remain in business and for as many workers as possible working for those businesses to remain in their jobs. And we want to ensure that those Australians who do lose their job receive appropriate support through our temporarily boosted social safety net. Our $130 billion JobKeeper package, which the Parliament, in a very unified fashion, will legislate today, will provide a historic wage subsidy to around 6 million workers. This flood payment of $1,500 per fortnight, paid through employers, will help keep Australians in jobs as businesses tackle the significant economic impact from the coronavirus. As of yesterday, uh, more than 730,000, as of this morning, more than 730,000 businesses have registered for this support. It is the equivalent to around 70% of the national medium wage for workers in the accommodation, hospitality and retail sectors. It will equate to a full medium replacement wage. Not since World War II has the government dealt with a piece of legislation as significant and as important as what we are dealing with today. What we are offering as a country to our fellow Australians economically impacted by the coronavirus is extraordinary in scale and size. These are extraordinary times. The JobKeeper package is one piece of the bridge we are building together to the other side of this crisis. It brings the total additional support for the economy to $320 billion or to 16.4 per cent of GDP. We have previously doubled support for welfare recipients, provided greater support for social security and veteran income support recipients and eligible concession card holders. Individuals in financial distress because of the coronavirus crisis can access part of their superannuation now to relieve financial strain. Retirees have more flexibility to manage their superannuation assets and lower deeming rates will help those under financial pressure. Eligible small and medium-sized businesses have received a boost to their cash flow and will have easier access to new loans. Rent relief is on the way for commercial and residential tenants. We have injected more money into our domestic violence and mental health support services which are so valuable to us. All the while we have continued to build our national medical stockpile. Over 30 million masks have arrived in recent days with more than 500 million masks on order. 500 million masks on order. Domestic production is also underway. I should also advise the Senate that since we last met, I made $800 million in additional funding available from the advance to the finance minister legislated during our last sitting. That $800 million in funding has been provided to the Department of Health to fund the further procurement of masks and other emergency medical or emergency health equipment to deal with the impact of COVID-19 in Australia. Mr. President, we have moved decisively as a nation to address the economic storm confronting us with an unprecedented economic and fiscal response. We have done what we believe was needed and will not hesitate to do more if required. As a government, we are forging a path through this crisis that will enable us to come out stronger and ready for the recovery that will follow. Because follow it will, and we do not want any Australian left behind in the meantime. Our government stands ready to add to these measures as necessary as this crisis continues to unfold. And as a government, we know, and the Australian people know, that during this time of serious challenge, of serious national challenge, all of us represented in this parliament and in this chamber will continue to pull together in doing what needs to be done in the national interest. I thank the Senate. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and uh, I join with my colleague, Senator Cormann, uh, in his remarks uh, and rise to reply on behalf of the opposition to the ministerial statement. Well, colleagues, in times of crisis, we show who we are and we demonstrate what we can be. Do we care only about ourselves or do we care about each other? Because to best face this crisis, we must face it together. And in this, we show who we are and what we can be.
Australians together. We need to care about each other as individuals, checking in with each other, maintaining physical distance, staying home as hard as that can be in so many cases, not being able to see loved ones who may be vulnerable. And we need to care about each other as a country and as a parliament. And that care should be expressed less in the words we speak and more in the decisions we make, in how we support our healthcare professionals, our cleaners, our people employed in essential supply chains, and how we resolve to support people whose lives have been turned upside down by this crisis. Australians who have lost their jobs, Australians whose businesses face collapse, and Australians stranded overseas, and many more. We need to support each other by maintaining a sense of common purpose, that we are all in this together, that we help our fellow Australians in times of need. The fundamental humility and egalitarianism of the Australian spirit, that spirit which recognises that what my neighbour, my friend, my colleague is going through could just as easily happen to me. Because none of us is immune to hardship. And this virus and its attack on the powerful and the vulnerable alike reminds us of that. And it reminds us we need to care about each other and to find and find common cause. Not just in times of crisis, but all the time. Because at this time, when this crisis presents itself as in life, we are all in this together. As is so poignantly demonstrated by those Australians on the front line, those who care for our sick, those who work in our hospitals, those who clean, who clean our workplaces, those who teach our children, those who stack the shelves, service in our supermarkets, those who transport the essentials we need, providing the public services we rely on, and so many more. You have our thanks and you have our respect. And in this crisis, the trade union movement is again demonstrating they are the champion of working people. Reforms driven by the advocacy of the trade union movement provide further protection for working people. And of course, some weeks ago, when the Labor movement and the opposition, the Labor Party, proposed wage subsidies as a critical means of ensuring that both workers and businesses are looked after during this crisis and to ensure that we emerge stronger than we would have otherwise. Because rather than sending more Australians to the unemployment queues, we want employers to be able to keep them on. We want to maintain the relationship between workers and their employer, rather than severing that relationship and creating a new relationship with Centrelink. We know how hard that is to break. Unfortunately, there are some key aspects of what Labor and the trade union movement have called for that have not been adopted by the government. And we have placed on record our concern that the structure of the JobKeeper payments will mean Australians will miss out. This is because the payments are directed on the basis of the structure of the employer, not on the need of the individual worker. And the reality of the government's policy is that employees in exactly the same circumstances may be treated differently depending on the size and structure of their employer. And we've spoken of the over one million Australians who are casual workers who will not be eligible for the JobKeeper program a program which we think fails to recognise that in any modern workforce, any worker defined as casual but who has been stood down has financial commitments, expectations based on work and income that has been, reg that has been regular. You see, Labor believes no worker should be left behind. And we are also concerned about permanent workers being forced to take annual leave at this time. So we see people who work in local, local government, who work for the NDIS, who work in the university sector, private education sector, temporary visa holders, all left out of JobKeeper, which we think is counter to the national interest. Now, consistent with this, Labor has been and will be moving a second reading amendments in the House of Representatives, and we will do the same in the Senate. And in the House, we will move in detail amendments that outline our major concerns. If these are not successful in the House of Representatives, we will not be pursuing those amendments, nor will we support amendments made by other political parties in the Senate. 
We do not want to see the circumstance where the House and the Senate are at loggerheads, bouncing legislation back and forth, causing delays the Australian people cannot afford, because this package must be passed as urgently as possible. And Labor will facilitate passage by the end of this day. I would also note that even if Labor's amendments are not accepted, it is within the power of the government to do the right thing, because with a stroke of a pen, Treasurer Frydenberg can fix issues with JobKeeper and Minister Rustin can fix issues with JobSeeker. The legislation already gives them the authority they need. Mm -hmm. Whilst we are determined to see the passage of this legislation today, this does not mean we think the parliament shouldn't be sitting beyond today. We've made it clear our preference that the parliament keep sitting, as so many others are around the world, and that we are here today at relatively short notice demonstrates it is possible to do so. And I do want to recognise that there are many senators who would have preferred to have been here today to advocate for those who represent. But just as other Australians are being asked to observe social distancing, so too must we. There are some in this place who have suggested the Senate alone could keep sitting, but of course we know that would be unworkable without the House, but more as importantly without a legislative program being brought forward by the government. So in the absence of the government supporting continued sittings, Labor is moving to establish an appropriate scrutiny committee, a Senate Select Committee, to provide scrutiny of the government's response. Uh, and Labor uh, will ensure uh, that our representatives on this committee demonstrate uh, the seniority we believe is required for such an important task. It will be chaired by Senator Katie Gallagher and will have on it the Deputy Leader, uh, Senator Keneally and Senator Murray Watt as the third Labor member. Mr President, as many have rightly noticed, noted, this is an unprecedented crisis. The government's domestic response does reflect that, even though we may think it should go further. And Labor has supported every measure put forward by this government. However, whilst the government's domestic response reflects the unprecedented nature of this crisis, I regret that its urgency in repatriating stranded Australians has not. Now, we have given the government a very wide berth to take the steps it deems necessary to protect Australians. And I do want to acknowledge the work of the consular service and officers of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and others. The reality is we have thousands of Australians, through no fault of their own, who found themselves in very distressing situations. I do not have the time today to fully document the hundreds of cases raised with my office and the offices of my colleagues, Labor members and senators nor to fully catalogue our concerns. I will simply say this. It has been clear for weeks that many Australians do not have recourse to commercial options to get home to safety, despite their best efforts and vast amounts of money blown on cancelled tickets. And they are concerned about many things, but two stand out. Many can, first, many can see what other countries are doing to repatriate their citizens from locations where Australians too are stranded. Germany alone has arranged 170 flights. Secondly, many feel that the government's uh, delays are simply putting more of them at risk as their situations deteriorate. So I once again urge the government to reconsider its blanket refusal to arrange affordable assisted departures for stranded Australians. And I urge the government to ensure that cost is not a barrier to return. It makes no sense that a UK citizen should pay £250 for a ticket that costs an Australian $5,000. It is untenable in this crisis to rule out assisted departures, and it is unsafe, and we must do more. And I say to the minister this, just as Labor has offered its support to all the government's domestic measures to protect Australians, we again offer our support to the government taking whatever steps are necessary to bring Australians home to safety. Mr President, we have much to be grateful for in our nation's history. We have been blessed in so many ways. But Australians have also known hardship and Australians have also known tragedy. We have known wars depression, recessions. We have known terrorist attacks. We have known natural disasters, bushfires, floods and drought. These and many more we have faced. We have faced them all, and we have come through each challenge that history has placed before us, and we have done it together. 
we have looked to one another and we have looked out for one another. And so too, and in the same way, we will come through this. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens in reply to the ministerial statement. COVID-19 is transforming the world and our country. It's exposing a lot about how we've structured our societies and about what's really important when it really matters. It's exposed that many of the jobs that have long been undervalued will in fact be essential to get us through this crisis and to help the country recover. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I acknowledge and commend the immense efforts of our nurses, doctors, paramedics, cleaners, pharmacists, aged care workers, teachers, early childhood educators and supermarket staff, many of whom are putting themselves at personal risk to save others and to support our community during this crisis. My heart goes out to all of those who have lost loved ones, to people who have the virus or whose family members or friends are unwell. To the families and friends who are separated by isolation, to parents struggling work from home, homeschooling and caring for elderly, elderly relatives, to those struggling without the social networks that usually sustain them, what you are doing is saving lives. It's been said repeatedly, but we are indeed in this together, and we need to make sure that no one is left behind. The Greens will be supporting the bills and helping to pass them today, but we owe it to those who will miss out to propose amendments to make this package better, to make sure that no one is left behind. We owe it to the one million casual workers who will miss out on the JobKeeper payment, those for whom an arbitrary cut-off date means the difference between keeping their job and being left out. We owe it to those in the arts and entertainment sector who we've turned to to raise funds during the bushfire crisis and whose films and books and games and shows that we are now relying on to keep us sane during isolation. We owe it to the renters who have been hit hard by this crisis but still have no national plan in place to protect them. Keeping a roof over people's heads during this crisis is surely one of the most fundamental things that this parliament should do. We owe it to those receiving disability support and carers' pension who are currently excluded from the COVID-19 supplement despite the significant additional costs that isolation is imposing upon them. We owe it to the million international workers currently here working under a visa, those who have been contributing some for many years in our communities, but who this government is now telling to go home. We owe it to the more than 500,000 international students that we wooed to our country, accepted their university fees, but now ask to fend for themselves. The Greens will not give up on these people. We will propose a suite of amendments today to plug the gaps in the government's safety net and make sure no one is left behind. We'll also push to ensure that there's appropriate oversight throughout this crisis. The scale of this crisis and the response that's required means we need more transparency, more democracy, not less. We're giving away extraordinary powers under this legislation, quite possibly the most powers conferred on an executive since World War II. It is necessary, but we shouldn't be abdicating our constitutional role as a house of review and of scrutiny. We will ultimately be supporting the proposed Senate Select Committee to oversee the COVID-19 response, and we will be absolutely ably represented by our whip, Senator Seawitt. But we will also push for Parliament to continue sitting to provide those checks and balances that this situation demands. This crisis has exposed the extent to which Australia's safety net has been picked away at for 30 years. But it's also showing the potential to rebuild. It's my hope that the structures that we're rapidly rebuilding in this crisis will be retained. And it's a chance to think about how we want this country to go forward and to dare to dream of a fairer, happier and more ecologically sustainable future. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as Leader of the Nationals, I stand to associate um, our party with the comments from Senator Cormann and particularly his references to the indiscriminate nature in the victims of uh, this virus. And Regional Australia is similarly not immune. It's a crisis, I think, as Senator Wong so eloquently stated, uh, is something that we will get through together as one. And we have faced seemingly insurmountable challenges in our past as a nation. And when we come together, um, 
we can do great things. And it's been really heartening, I think, as we've looked across the Federation uh, through the work of the National Cabinet and at a very much a community and organisational level, how Australians have really embraced the leadership from our premiers and our prime minister and adopted very tough measures around socially isolating, etc. And we're learning new ways of connecting, which hopefully some of them will actually stay with us once we get through this. But out in regional Australia, we are socially isolating. We're doing the right thing. We're also producing a lot of fresh food. Um, this unprecedented government response from the National Covenant um, in the face of this unique health challenge um, is so significant. I think the legislation we've been called to Parliament to pass today uh, will help us stem some of the more devastating impacts on our economy and our workforce uh, going forward. Regional Australians know about resilience and compassion in adversity, and I'd also like to associate the Nationals with Senator Wong's commentary uh, around the community response and the need to connect at a personal level. I thought uh, those were very apt words. And our nations, when you look around the globe, has actually chosen quite a unique approach to deal with this crisis. Uh, and I think we need to be proud of uh, our premiers and our prime minister and the way we're all working across all uh, party lines uh, to actually find a solution that's right for us. To our families living in the bush, we have your back and we're making sure any response that our government uh, puts forward recognises the challenges for rural and regional communities and our industries. Uh, the issue of telecommunication concerns, we're welcomed uh, the MBN SkyMaster program support and the increased data needs as rural and regional Australians uh, and businesses and families struggling to educate children at home need that additional data. Having a health package that recognises the unique aspects of uh, health provision out in rural and regional areas, specific measures for remote community preparedness, our Indigenous community, the establishment of respiratory health clinics. We've seen one open in Mildura this week uh, and one up in Emerald, and there'll be more rolled out in regional communities uh, over coming weeks. An increase to telehealth services has been a real boon for regional Australians to be able to actually stay on property or, or in their community and still access that specialist health services. And we've also put forward specific measures for rural aged care services. Uh, we've also invested money to support re remote communities to minimise um, the impact, have specific evacuation uh, strategies available to them because we know if this virus uh, gets into some of our more remote Indigenous communities, it will have a devastating impact. Uh, we're also focused on supporting Australia's regional airline network because many of our regional communities rely on air service for urgent and essential transport, medical supplies and personnel. We've been uh, really focused on keeping Australia's supply chain open so our food producers can get our crops harvested and to market wherever that happens to be. Uh, and that's been critical in keeping our shelves stocked at supermarkets. Our farmers across every state and territory uh, have been very committed to ensuring we'll not run out of food in this country, so please don't panic buy. Um, they're working very, very hard to make that happen. We've got a $110 million export initiative to help our agricultural and fishery sector get back that produce on planes and into key overseas markets, because that means securing regional jobs and making the recovery quicker once we're through this. It also means keeping the trucks on the road. And driving up uh, from Wodonga yesterday, there were barely a car in sight, but trucks on both sides to ferrying uh, essential medical supplies, food, etc., um, has been really, really key. And I think keeping those roadside service stations open, the road houses, the truck driver lounges, uh, so that our truckies can actually do this very, very critical uh, task, getting the rest, food and personal care that they need whilst making, keeping those supply chains open has been something that uh, governments have been very, very focused on. National senators have been fierce advocates on behalf of our growers to extend the working holiday maker visas, the seasonal and Pacific Islander uh, visa classes, because agriculture needs these workers on farm to ensure that we can have fresh domestic food supply uh, in our supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And I know whether it's Senator McMahon uh, for our melon growers in the NT, the mango growers with uh, Canavan and uh, McDonald in Queensland, or indeed uh, Senator Davy and myself with apple and pear growers in the southern area, um, that particular measure by the government, um, we, we can't underestimate what that means to uh, so many of our primary producers. 
Um, we have brought forward measures to keep a strong regional media so that we can keep um, informed out in regional and rural Australia, and small businesses are the cornerstone of our communities, so we have cut red tape. Uh, we have also bringing forward these supplements to offer an extra boost for rural businesses. Um, and I think the JobKeeper wage subsidy that will keep employees and um, businesses connected through this crisis um, is an absolute milestone achievement, and I congratulate everyone from Porter to McManus for getting this done. Uh, we're at home working wherever we are out in the regions as the Senate team, uh, supporting our communities, not just through drought and bushfire response and recovery, which is ongoing, but also making sure our communities can access this much needed government support from the trophy shop operator in central Queensland. Um, to the work that has been done, particularly by Senators McMahon and Macdonald, in making sure supermarkets, who won't let you bulk buy anything, actually revise um, those measures for our uh, people that live out on station, where a round trip to the supermarket could be upwards of 800 kilometres. That has been essential work, common sense approach in a time of crisis. I just wanted to inform the Senate of a good news story of what is happening out there in the regions. Um, Senator McMahon informed me of Gary Frost, who runs the Dunmara Roadhouse uh, on the Sturt Highway, way between Darwin and Alice Springs. Can't dine in, so he's got a plane and he actually drops pizza and beer out to stations uh, with, at no additional delivery charge. So there you go. Um, thank you very much, Gary. Thank you very much. But it's typical of the can-do attitude and commitment of communities <coughs> right across Australia in a time of crisis. Uh, I think, yeah, we should put his name forward for us. I'll take that, um, Senator. Thank you. But it is a story that's actually repeated right across the country. Um, unique um, stories of compassion, of resilience, of supporting the most vulnerable. Um, we are really at our best in a time of crisis. So I commend individuals and organisations that are being their very, very best selves at the moment. Um, we, the Nationals back our health uh, response, and particularly those in the front line. We don't underestimate how hard this will be. Millions have lost their jobs. 48 Australians have lost their lives, and we haven't seen the end of it. But in adversity through droughts and floods and fire, we've stood together. And finally, as we head into Easter, we know um, we made a big bang on about heading out into the bush so that you can support our businesses, um, recover from drought and bushfire, um, and that all beckoned. But please, today, uh, uh, this coming period over Easter, please do not visit your favourite regional Australian destination. We're not immune. Um, do the right thing. Stay at home. And when the time's right, we look forward to welcoming you all with open arms to celebrate our beautiful flora and fauna. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise to, to speak briefly uh, in response to the minister's statement. Uh, COVID-19 does indeed present a significant challenge for Australians, but I also would like us to consider, uh, in particular, some of our, uh, our regional neighbours, uh, places like Indonesia, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, uh, New Zealand, and indeed the South Pacific. And we should keep an eye uh, in, uh, on those jurisdictions and. and and, and look to uh, help and assist those jurisdictions uh, if, uh, if we can, even if it's only in spirit in some instances. The government has been uh, successful. The trend uh, is looking good in respect of the uh, flattening of the curve. Uh, the responses haven't been perfect, and no doubt this uh, Senate will deal with that uh, in time, and uh, I will say a few words on that uh, a little bit later. Um, I, I, uh, Centre Alliance will be supporting the government's bills uh, today, uh, but we will also be moving amendments to fill uh, cracks. Uh, I haven't seen all of the Greens' amendments. So I suspect some of them may be the same, but I just uh, uh, would address this to Senator Wong and the opposition, and that is that uh, as we move these amendments, uh, we may have some good ideas. We may have some ideas that fill cracks uh, uh, in the legislation and they should be considered. Our aim here is not to quickly get the legislation through the parliament. It's to properly scrutinise and uh, get a better outcome. And if that takes a little bit more time, then so be it. So I encourage you to look uh, closely at those, uh, at those amendments. 
I am glad that uh, there is support for a Senate committee that will look at uh, COVID-19 and the government's response. However, I will point out that the Senate committee uh, does not provide opportunity for debate on issues. Uh, it does not allow for disallowances as the Treasurer makes, makes changes to uh, the rules that uh, we are set to agree upon, or at least the, the, the shell uh, legislation that will enable uh, the Treasurer to make rules. It uh, does not uh, allow, because of comity principles, for uh, the Senate to call uh, ministers from the other place. Uh, at least uh, to require them. There is an issue with that, and I will uh, be putting a question uh, to, the, uh, to, to, the, to Minister Cormann on, in relation to that at question time. Um, and of course, uh, the business of government is continuing. We must uh, recognise and acknowledge there are a number of public servants around Australia that are continuing to do their work. They're continuing to uh, make sure the arms of government are working. And the parliament uh, should be, of course, uh, uh, examining what they're doing and, if necessary, criticising, seeking uh, uh, changes to the way they might be doing things. And the, a Senate Select Committee that is examining COVID-19 cannot do that. And that is, it's for that reason it is my, uh, very, my uh, very strong view that uh, the parliament should continue sitting. Now, uh, of course, uh, it's clear uh, that we won't have the numbers to uh, force that to happen. Uh, so uh, I would just like to remind all senators of Standing Order uh, 55-2, which allows, uh, and I'll just read from it, uh, the president, at the request of, the, of an absolute majority of the, uh, of the whole number of senators that the Senate meets at a certain time, shall then fix a time of meeting in accordance with that request, and the time of the meeting shall be notified to each senators. So there is, in fact, a mechanism, uh, and I uh, extend an offer to Senator Wong and uh, Senator Waters uh, and others that, if uh, indeed there is a problem where we uh, that that requires, well, and indeed Senator Cormann, uh, if there is a measure that uh, that is uh, that that is uh, implemented through the rules that is unacceptable, or if there is something that is happening that requires attention we have the ability to, to recall the, the parliament. Not my preference, but I just want to make sure all senators are aware uh, of that option. Uh, uh, once again, it, it, it is my, view, my strong view that we should uh, continue sitting. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek to make a statement in response to the minister's statement. We acknowledge that there is no manual for dealing with this virus, and we empathise with the government's challenge. That is, though, all the more reason for the government to openly share data, future projections and information with the people. As pressures mount regarding personal security, as well as emotionally and financially on people across our nation, any shortage of data is being seen as an absence of trust from the government in the people. And that will make it difficult for Australians to, in turn, trust government and the parliament. Government trust in the people and honesty will be met with trust from the people. One Nation would also like at this time to thank everyone who is caring for us and keeping us safe, including healthcare workers, police, defence, emergency workers, and, and everyone serving others, including helping to supply and feed us, teach our children, electricity generation, garbage collection, cleaning, water supply, and many more. People keeping, keeping services working for us all. COVID-19, Mr. President, has exposed as severely lacking in our current economic and industrial structures the productive capacity and economic resilience that were once part of Australian culture and history. We need to take this opportunity to take stock and then rebuild our society on the values, systems and cultures that ensure a return to personal enterprise instead of the creeping dead hand and suffocating blanket of a large and ever-growing central government. History shows that the secret of human happiness, human happiness and human progress is nothing new and has been dis discovered, lost and rediscovered for millennia and, more recently, lost in our country. We need to bring back Australia's economic sovereignty, productive capacity and economic resilience based on restoring personal enterprise and compliance with our constitution that enshrines competitive federalism 
and, in, and individual liberty. We all need, as representatives of the people and servants to the people, to ensure that people's government is held accountable for what it does and does not do during this emergency. We are giving the government a blank cheque, and rightly so, because there are many uncertainties in this. There's such a complex system that we are already trying to amend. But ministers have the power to make these changes through regulations. And that is given to ensure that cracks in the legislation are closed quickly to ensure people are covered fairly right across our country. It is a blank cheque, but we must do our job as, as uh, senators to make sure that we review that and the progress of it. What many Australians looking beyond our health and financial safety want is to make sure that we leave COVID-19 behind us with better freedoms and liberties and a stronger, freer economy than before. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister explain why casuals employed for fewer than 12 months, local government workers, many university and non-government school workers, temporary migrant workers who can't go home, most arts and entertainment workers and many charity workers have been excluded from the JobKeeper program? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for the question, uh, and in particular in relation to exactly why the Parliament is here today uh, to legislate this historic package by the government, $130 billion, uh, to ensure that uh, an estimated 6 million workers are connected with their employers uh, throughout the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, in relation to uh, the Senator's question, uh, because the government had to draw a line somewhere. $130 billion to almost 6 million workers will be passed by the parliament today. Uh, this is an incredible package. It has been carefully designed. It applies to, as you know, full-time workers, part-time workers, and as the uh, Minister for Industrial Relations uh, and the Minister of Finance uh, have both acknowledged in relation to the definition of casual that has been adopted for the purposes of this legislation, it is taken from the Fair Work Act. Casuals who have been in employment with their employer for a period of longer than 12 months. Uh, but, Mr President, this does not mean that the employee categories that the senator referred to are, are not recognised by the government. They are, uh, and they will be, in some circumstances, able to apply for the job seeker allowance. Uh, and this is, of course, with uh, the additional supplement that has been provided by the government in relation to COVID-19. Uh, but, Mr. President, this is an historic package that will pass the parliament today. It applies to in excess of six million Australian workers. Uh, it is a generous package, but ultimately, as both the, as the Prime Minister, uh, the Minister for Industrial Relations, the Treasurer, and the Minister Order. for Finance, Senator Cash, time's expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. How many casual employees will miss out on JobKeeper program? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Mr. President, it is not how many casual employees will miss out. It is how many casual employees are actually included in the package. Um, on, on a point of order, Senator Wong. Direct relevance. Um, I, I think, with respect to Senator Cash, having been speaking for ten seconds, I, 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 the question is not being answered necessarily in a way that people would like. But I can't say at the moment that the way. If I could finish what I was going to say, I'll come back to you, Senator Wong. The turn of phrase I heard the minister using then was actually turning directly to JobKeeper, if I, unless I misheard, which I'm going to say I will consider to be directly relevant. Senator Wong. Mr President, the question was very simple, very precise, very pithy. How many casual employees will miss out on the JobKeeper program? The minister then says it's not a question of how many will miss out, it's a question of how many are in. With respect, Mr President, it's not consistent with your previous rulings for you to suggest, for you to rule at this, on this occasion, that such 
a complete mirror image of the question can possibly be directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Cash was directly dealing with the question about job keepers, and of course, as Senator Wong well knows, the job keeper and the job seeker programs are complementary, and there is an opportunity for everybody that needs support to receive that support. On, on the point of order, um, we have always allowed ministers a moment of time to turn to a question. This question, I remind the minister, was very specific in its nature. Um, the minister has only been speaking for 10 seconds and I don't think had got quite to a full stop. I am listening very carefully to the minister um, and I will happily entertain other points of order later on in the answer if people feel that way. But at this stage, I think it's inappropriate for me to rule the minister as not being directly relevant. Senator Cash. And thank you. And as I was saying, Casuals are actually catered for if they have been in an employment relationship with their employer for longer than 12 months. In relation to the question asked by the senator, many casuals will still be in employment because there are a number of industries that are currently ramping up and recruiting. In terms of casuals, and as, as the Minister for Finance has acknowledged, the job keeper and job seeker programs are actually complementary. How many casuals are currently earning less than the $1,500 per fortnight? More than 50 per cent. Around 41 per cent of casual employees had been with their employer for under 12 months, as at August 2019. Order, and they Senator Cash, not... time for the answers expired. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Can the minister confirm that under the government's legislation, the Treasurer will have the power to extend JobKeeper payments to these casuals and to other excluded workers? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And I understand that uh, the Treasurer has today uh, uploaded a number of rules uh, that will be made in relation to the JobKeeper payment, um, and the Treasurer has stated um, that, and the government has actually stated at the time, um, this is an evolving situation, and uh, we continue to monitor it. But to go to your point, Senator Walsh, there are two types of payments: JobKeeper and JobSeeker. If you are not eligible for JobKeeper, then you are able to look at whether or not you will be eligible for JobSeeker. The two payments, as the Minister for Finance uh, has so eloquently pointed out, are actually complementary. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the minister update the Senate on further decisions and measures taken by the Morrison government to support the economy and jobs during the coronavirus-induced crisis? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator McGrath for that question. Uh, Mr President, the COVID-19 crisis is a battle that we are fighting on two fronts. It is both a health battle and an economic battle. Our health mission, uh, as we've discussed, is to slow down the spread of the virus to save lives. Uh, I can inform the Senate today that the early signs are promising. Official data shows that we are heading in the right direction in terms of slowing the spread of the virus, uh, with the growth in new cases going from uh, above 20 per cent when we last met to uh, just uh, 2 per cent in more recent days. But, uh, Mr. President, the government's economic mission is to keep businesses in business and as many Australians as possible working for those businesses uh, in their jobs. Today, our support for the economy has totaled $320 billion, or 16.4 per cent of GDP. We have doubled support for welfare recipients and provided greater support for Social Security and veteran income support recipients and eligible concession card holders. And indeed, I mean, for those casuals, who have been uh, in employment with the same employer for less than 12 months, uh, if they lose their job or um, you know, need that support, they are able to apply for the job seeker payment, which we have doubled, we have, which we have doubled compared to what was there before. Uh, individuals in financial distress because of the uh, coronavirus crisis can access part of the superannuation uh, to relieve financial strain. Retirees have more flexibility to manage their superannuation assets and lower deeming rights are helping those under financial pressure. Eligible small and medium-sized businesses have received a boost to their cash flow and 
now have easier access to new loans. Mr. President, rent relief is on the way for commercial and residential tenants, while business continuity payments are keeping childcare services afloat. The economic battlefront is the one Order. we have come Senator to continue Coleman. to deal with today. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you, yes. Can the minister inform the Senate how Australian businesses and workers will benefit from the government's JobKeeper program? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McGrath for that supplementary. Yes, I can. Uh, the JobKeeper payments um, is designed uh, to help keep as many businesses as possible in business and to help keep as many Australians as possible working for those businesses uh, in their jobs. It is paid to the employer to reduce their payroll pressures given a significant impact to their turnover, so they can keep employees in a job rather than uh, having to let them go. The historic wage subsidy will be delivered to around 6 million Australians, just under half uh, our working population, who will receive a flat payment of $1,500 per fortnight through the employee before tax. This $130 billion JobKeeper package will help keep Australians in job, jobs as well as tackle the significant economic impact from the coronavirus. The payment will provide the equivalent of around 70 per cent of the national medium wage and indeed for workers in the accommodation, hospitality and retail sectors it will equate to a full Order, medium Senator replacement Holmes. wage. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Minister, why is the JobKeeper payment so important to building a bridge to the economic recovery for the Australian economy on the other side of the pandemic? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McGrath for that supplementary question. Uh, Mr President, it is vital that through these challenging times, employers and employees stay connected uh, as much as is possible. Uh, this payment will ensure this uh, can be the case, even while many businesses move into hibernation because uh, their areas of activity have been impacted by the coronavirus crisis or they've been asked to restrict their activities uh, on the basis of medical advice. The JobKeeper payment is about enabling businesses to keep their workers engaged so that they're ready uh, when we come out of this crisis on the other side. Businesses must be in the best possible position to rebuild and recover, and the most important part of that will be having workers still attached to their businesses. Uh, Mr. President, the $130 billion JobKeeper package is unprecedented in our history. It is designed to get this country through an unprecedented challenge and places in the best possible position on the other side of this uh, pandemic. Senator Sheldon. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister confirm that those whose partners earn over $78,000 a year, New Zealanders who are permanently living in Australia and temporary visa holders are not eligible for job seeker? What is the government's plan for those that are, who are at risk of falling through the cracks as a result of not being eligible to either job keeper and job seeker. The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Sheldon, for your question. Um, the government has announced over previous weeks, and today we come to this place again with another um, package so that we can assist as many Australians as possible to be able to get to the other side of what is an unprecedented crisis. We are absolutely focused in the first instance uh, with our first package, which came out, which was the Job Seeker package and the Corona Supplement, to make sure that we address the concerns and the, and the, the, uh, the impact on those that are the most vulnerable in our society, those people who find themselves without income. Today, obviously, we have another significant package, probably the biggest package uh, that this parliament will ever ever have to, uh, to address. Well, hopefully we would never have to be in a position again to address a package the size of $130 billion, which will look to add on top of the previous two packages to support another group of Australians who have been impacted by the coronavirus. Um, so today, um, as we did when we were here last time, as we did before the parliament got up, uh, this government continues to put in place a range of different measures to make sure that a broad range Senator of Australians. Watt. Sorry, Senator um, Watt, on a point of order. On relevance, Mr. President, again, we've got a minister refusing to answer the question as to whether particular categories of workers are not eligible for job seeker. We don't need another well, Senator speech Watt. about how great we, 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 the government was, is. We just like an answer to well, our Senator question. Watt. That was the first part of the question. The second part of the question was somewhat broader, which commenced with what is the government's plan with respect. Um, well, I'm listening, and I, I, I'm listening to a description of. There, there, can I, I, 
I was going to finish. I was going to say, I'm listening to the minister. Um, the second part of the question was more broadly worded. Today, we do have an opportunity for debating the nature of answers to questions after question time. Senator Wong, you were seeking the call. With respect, Mr. President, um, the word plan doesn't exist you know, on its own. The word plan in the, in the question referred directly to those who are not eligible for either job keeper or job seeker. So my uh, submission um, is yeah. that direct relevance goes to what the word, the way in which the word plan is used. Ministers can't just pick a word no, and I'm extrapolate just... it from the circumstances. No, I, I take the point. The, minute, the question was, what is the government's plan for those? The, the question claimed falling through the cracks, I believe the phrase was used. I'm listening to the minister, um, who is addressing a range of issues. I think that question was by its nature broad. There's an opportunity to debate the nature of answers after question time and what senators think of the nature of those answers. But I'll continue to listen very carefully to the minister. She's now been reminded of it twice. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and as I was uh, trying to point out to, to those opposite, that the, the measures that have been put in place are, are extremely comprehensive, and seek to address the concerns that are raised about people who find themselves in particular circumstances. Uh, and that, in the first instance, had, with our changes to the job seeker payments and the Corona supplement, was about dealing with people who did not have a job. Um, we also, I note that you raised the issue in relation to, to visas uh, and those people that are in Australia who have, do, not, do not have um, direct access to benefits. Um, there are a number of measures that have been put in place, but particularly one that I would draw your attention to is the ability for those that are in Australia who have work rights as part of their visas, the ability for them to be able to access their superannuation. If Order. not, they are Senator welcome Rutten, to go time. home. The answer has expired. Senator Sheldon, <laughs> supplementary question. <laughs> Have you sought or received advice on, about how to assist those who fall through the cracks? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. And, and um, as I said, this is a very comprehensive package, um, and today is just one part of that package. Um, but there are a number of measures that have been put in place. I've mentioned a few of them in the, in the answer to the first question that was asked by Senator Sheldon. But in addition to that, uh, as part of my portfolio responsibility, uh, I am working with emergency relief providers, with food relief providers, with financial counsellors, to make sure that where people find themselves in a position where they really uh, they have no access um, to be able to get uh, um, you know, uh, assistance because they've chosen to stay in Australia, um, then we have a very comprehensive emergency relief response, uh, which I'd be more than delighted to run through uh, the components. It's a $200 million package which is focused almost entirely on the provision of day-to-day -day emergency relief, things like food, the payment of bills, access to cash, to make sure that those people in Australia who require this emergency relief will be able to get access to Order. it. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Well, the parliament has voted to provide the minister with expansive powers to vary thresholds for welfare payments to ensure that all those that will need support during this unprecedented crisis will receive it. When will the minister use those powers? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Sheldon. And as you rightly point out, and I think Senator Wong raised uh, the matter in her remarks uh, to Senator Cormann's um, ministerial statement, yes, I do have the power um, to be able to make changes to various cohorts, and, and this includes visa categories, should the need arise. At the moment, we're obviously <coughs> monitoring very closely uh, the impact of the coronavirus as it continues to have an impact across the whole of the Australian economy. Uh, we are responding, uh, and I think we're responding very quickly and appropriately, um, as I mentioned, in response to the concerns that were raised about visa holders in Australia who had work rights, the ability for them to be able to get access to their superannuation gives them the immediate opportunity to be able to get access to finance to support themselves. So, um, in response to your direct question, uh, Senator Sheldon, um, I do have those powers. I will continue to monitor the situation along with my colleagues, and should the need arise, those powers will be enacted. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Minister, can you please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting Australian primary producers to get their high-value products overseas despite the decrease in flights due to the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank Senator Brockman for uh, his question and his, uh, his ever vigilant, determined advocacy on behalf of, uh, of Australia's exporters. Uh, the decisions that, uh, that the Morrison government has been taking to protect lives, Mr. President, 
do, sadly, in many of their applications, threaten livelihoods. Not just livelihoods, but also the very viability of some businesses. Uh, those threats place at risk jobs today and, indeed, jobs in the future, even when the recovery comes. And that's why we've been taking extraordinary decisions to seek to support Australian business and their employees through these tough times. The JobKeeper allowance and a number of other measures. And in my portfolio, we took the extraordinary decision last week to support a new international freight mechanism. Now, this $110 million mechanism is going to support our primary producers, our farmers, our fishers, uh, to be able to continue to access the markets where their goods so often head to. Australia produces enough food to support more than 70 million people, uh, close to three times our population, and our export markets are crucial destinations for that. Uh, there is still demand in those markets, there's still production from our farmers and fishers, but they have been crippled by the collapse of international aviation in terms of their capacity to get to those markets. Our $110 million freight mechanism is going to help them to be able to reach those markets once again. And we're standing this up incredibly quickly, thanks to the appointment of the uh, Coordinator General for Freight, uh, Michael Byrne, one of Australia's most experienced logistics professionals. And indeed, in the next couple of days, I expect the first flight uh, to depart Hobart, packed full of Tasmanian salmon, uh, produced uh, by, uh, by company Tassel, uh, headed into uh, Asian markets. Similarly, I expect shortly thereafter we'll see from Senator Brockman's home state a flight headed out of Perth, again carrying premium seafood, ensuring we protect those Australian businesses and, most importantly, the jobs of the Australians who rely upon Order. them. Order. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how, the, how industry has reacted to the international freight assistance mechanism package? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, this isn't a free ride for industry. They still have to pay traditional commercial rates. Indeed, they'll pay those rates at a premium. But they have warmly welcomed the fact the government has stepped up with a solution and a solution to ensure that freight access is both reliable and affordable for them. Indeed, the Gerald and Fisherman's Cooperative, no doubt somebody Senator Brockman is familiar with, said that if we couldn't find a solution, we would have been stopping our boats and standing down our entire workforce. This action is helping to save many of those jobs. The Red Meat Advisory Council acknowledged that the continuity and affordability of air export capacity to our valued and high-end export markets is critical. And the seafood industry of Australia said that this marks the beginning of a return to normal. And perhaps most appropriately, they acknowledged and said, there's no better stimulus than getting back to work. That's what this is all about, Mr President, ensuring that we support Australians who can to stay in their jobs and businesses who can Order. to stay afloat. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the government also boosting ca cash flow for exporters through the Export Market Development Grant Scheme? Senator Birmingham. Our internationally exposed businesses were some of the first to feel the impacts of COVID-19, as many of our large international export destinations uh, shut down parts of their economies uh, before the domestic impact was felt here in Australia. So knowing that they were the first to feel the pain, we've put in place additional measures uh, to support them. The government's injected an additional $49.8 million into the Export Market Development Grants program, recognising that businesses who had invested in good faith in seeking to grow export markets are unlikely to yield dividends from those export markets this year. Now, since making that announcement just last week, we have ensured that $44 million has already flowed to almost 1,000 exporters. Another example of the government using existing mechanisms where we can to be able to deliver quick, effective support to those who need it. Now, this will help not just our goods exporters, but many across the services sector in arts, education and tourism. And in the tourism space, I particularly acknowledge those many regional tourism businesses who are doing such a good job as well of sending out a Order. clear message Senator telling Birmingham, Australians to stay home for the this Easter. The answer has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate and relates to oversight. The British Parliament is sitting. Both the British uh, Government and parliamentary authorities have been clear that they have no plans to shut uh, Parliament and would prefer to avoid this course of action. Speaking in the Commons on 16 March, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock stated, I think the whole House will be sure in our collective decisions that although Parliament may have to operate different, differently, it must remain open. The US Congress is sitting, the Italian Senate and the Spanish Cortes is sitting. Uh, despite 
uh, its coronavirus committee, the New Zealand Parliament resumes on the 28th of April with modified processes and procedures. The only parliaments I am aware of that have adjourned in the manner uh, the government is proposing tonight are those of the legislatures of Mexico, South Africa and San Marino. Why is the government seeking to suspend our parliament? The Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, I, I have addressed this in my ministerial statement, but what, what I would say, and I'm, I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I possibly can be here, I mean, we are taking an Australian path to protect and save Australian lives by taking very drastic measures to uh, stop or to slow down the spread of this virus. When we closed our borders or when we imposed border restrictions to return travellers from uh, mainland China and Wuhan province in particular, uh, a number of these other European and other countries that uh, the Senator has referenced did not take that course of action. And it took much longer in an Australian context for the spread to accelerate somewhat than what it did in places like Italy, Spain, Germany, France, the UK. Um, I mean, you know, I, I believe that the actions that we are taking in Australia are being successful in saving lives by slowing the spread, and all Australians are being given very strict instructions, uh, imposing restrictions on their travel, on um, encouragement to stay at home, work from home where that is possible. And yes, we do have a job to do, and where we must and where we need to, we should come together, and we can. There's a mechanism in place to help ensure that happens. But to the greatest extent possible, we should also comply uh, with the restrictions imposed on Australians. And we, sh we are a large continent. The logistics involved in bringing the parliament together uh, are, are very uh, significant with lots of people coming from all corners of Australia. And in fact, you'll find that health and police authorities around Australia would actually regard federal politicians as one of the comparatively higher risk categories when it comes to the spread of the coronavirus. Now, we, we have a job to do. We, um, you know, state laws can't interfere with the uh, exercise of, uh, you know, obviously uh, our federal parliamentary privilege. But nevertheless, uh, we should, to the greatest extent possible, comply with the public health advice and instructions that are imposed on Order, all other Senator Australians. Corman. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, uh, truck, bus and train drivers are doing their job. Journalists are doing their job. Factory workers are doing their job. Despite the risks, teachers, nurses and doctors are doing their job. Chefs, supermarket workers, public servants, police, aged care workers, ADF personnel are doing their jobs, some of them in ships. Miners are doing their job. Uh, everyone who can is doing their job. Why is the government proposing that senators don't do their job? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. That is not what the government is proposing. Uh, I believe that every single senator in this chamber is doing their job. Uh, whether the Senate meets in Canberra and whether we bring every single senator from uh, around the country to Canberra uh, in the context of uh, state border uh, closures in most states and indeed in the Northern Territory, uh, we will of course continue to do our job serving the Australian people and senators will continue to have the opportunity to hold the government to account. Uh, not, I mean, not only through our normal mechanisms, but also, of course, uh, through the Senate Select Committee uh, that uh, we are about to establish uh, later this afternoon. So I completely reject the premise of the question, which suggests that somehow uh, members of parliament, members of federal parliament, and senators in particular, are not going to continue to do their job. The government continues to do their job. Uh, all senators will continue to do their job. In fact, uh, I would suggest that many of us uh, are working much harder than we ever have uh, during this period. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. A Senate, uh, thank you, Mr. President. A Senate Select Committee can be obstructed by comedy principles. That means that it can't call the Minister for Health, uh, the attorney in his capacity as Industrial Relations Minister, or the Treasurer. Will the government commit to requiring these ministers to appear before the Select Committee, should such a request be made? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think that uh, the senator has just asked me a hypothetical question because I don't believe that the committee uh, has even been constituted yet, and it certainly hasn't made a decision yet on who uh, it may or may not want to appear. Uh, what I would say is that my expectation would be that that committee would operate in the usual way, uh, in the way that Senate committees and Senate select committees have operated uh, since Federation, and uh, the government will, of course, support the work of the committee and. Uh, all of the agencies and departments and all of the officials that are involved in the government's response uh, will make themselves available in the usual way to support the work of the committee. 
Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister advise the Senate what the Australian government is doing to help Australians overseas to return home? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, for his question. Uh, Australian officials continue to work around the clock, literally, to uh, help Australians overseas to return. This has been particularly challenging in areas where there are travel restrictions and where scheduled commercial flights have abruptly ended. And I want to today take this opportunity to acknowledge the efforts of those uh, diplomatic uh, and DFAT officials here and overseas. We're establishing a backbone, if you like, for international travel for Australians by working with both Qantas and Virgin to ensure that they can continue regular flights to four key transport hubs, to London, to Los Angeles, to Hong Kong and to Auckland, uh, important for passengers and also important for freight. The government is providing direct support to ensure our two major international airlines can continue these services. We're also coordinating closely with other governments to identify commercial means that continue to exist for Australians to return. Uh, in Cambodia, for example, uh, our embassy is currently finalising negotiations for a special commercial flight from Phnom Penh to Australia. Uh, we have had a very good response from Australians registered uh, for this flight and all things going uh, well, Mr President, and, uh, and I say that in the context of current events, that flight should occur this weekend. We're talking to Qantas about other special flights to assist Australians who have found themselves in countries that declared sudden border closures. I'd like to emphasise that we are working constantly with other governments, with cruise companies, with airlines, and harnessing those key relationships to get the most out of the existing global transport network. We know that many Australians need assistance right now, both overseas and at home, indeed. And this approach that the government is taking fits with our broader responsibilities as a government to support Australians. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise what steps the government has taken to both support and arrange flights to return Australians from international locations? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much. And again, I thank Senator Smith for uh, the question. The government has already uh, supported and facilitated commercial flights for hundreds of Australians to return home safely, including uh, from Uruguay, from Nepal, and from Peru. Uh, in the case of Peru and Uruguay, most recently, uh, we've supported the travel company Chimu Adventures through underwriting and indemnity to ensure that the flights could go ahead. We're supporting a further commercial flight by LATAM from Peru tomorrow uh, for passengers out of Lima, Cusco and Iquitos. Uh, also joining up other Australians which were in more remote parts of Peru uh, in terms of arranging transport to assist them to, uh, to reach that flight. We have had a very good outcome uh, in Nepal where our ambassador, Peter Budd, worked closely with authorities in Kathmandu and Nepal Airlines to facilitate a commercial flight that brought over 260 Australians and New Zealanders into Brisbane last week. Uh, I thanked my Nepali counterpart uh, personally on Monday uh, for that effort, which included bringing passengers to Kathmandu Order. from places Senator like Nupra, Pokhara and Chitwan. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate of the progress in helping Australians who are on cruise ships to disembark and return home to Australia? Senator Payne. Uh, thank the Senator very much for the uh, question in relation to cruise ships. Uh, since the 14th of uh, last month, the government has uh, assisted in more than 6,400 Australians disembarking and returning to Australia from 45 cruise ships uh, across the world multiple charter and commercial flights. I want to thank the cruise industry and acknowledge their cooperation and their work in uh, that outcome. To give a few examples, uh, over 200 Australians arrived from the United States yesterday after disembarking the Zandam, the Rotterdam and the Coral Princess cruise ships. More than 260 Australians from the Costa Luminosa, the Costa Victoria, arrived in Perth from Italy on the 30th of March. And of course, today, 288 Australians who had been on the Norwegian Jewel have now finished their 14-day quarantine after returning to Australia. 
These uh, outcomes have required significant amounts of uh, patient diplomacy from DFAT. And again, I thank those officials from uh, the Department of Foreign Order. Affairs and Senator Trade Payne, for managing these for the highly complex has operations. Expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government, Minister Cormann, uh, representing the Prime Minister, about some of the people left behind in the government's COVID support packages. The government has bent over backwards to ensure that commercial tenancies can be renegotiated to continue, but why have you continually pushed residential tenants to the bottom of the national cabinet agenda? Where is the action on the earlier commitment to prevent uh, residential evictions? And with half a million young casual workers getting no support from JobKeeper, how do you expect them to cover rent? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, we are providing uh, a significantly enhanced social safety net through the Job Seeker program, and we are uh, about to legislate a $130 billion Job Keeper program. Beyond that, we do recognise uh, the challenges that many uh, tenants in residential tenancy face, uh, tenancies face, of course. Uh, and the uh, issue of tenancy is fairly and squarely a matter for state and territory governments, which they recognise. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. The industries that have been most affected are the same industries that have the highest numbers of casuals employed for less than 12 months. Hospitality, retail, accommodation, tourism and the arts and entertainment industries. We're talking here about one million people, with half a million of those under the age of 24. Why did you exclude them? Was it just budget-saving reasons or because young people don't vote for your party? Senator Cormann. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll ask the minister. The minister has silence, so he can continue or commence his answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let me just uh, firstly utterly reject the offensive suggestion that any uh, partisan or uh, electoral considerations are involved in any of this. I mean, that is just objectionable. Yeah. And it's, it's very disappointing that you would choose to lower the tone uh, of uh, the national conversation in this context to that extent. You've raised some legitimate uh, issues of inquiries and, and you let yourself down, quite frankly, uh, by adding that snarky little bit at the end. Uh, and you, you should reflect on that. You should reflect on that. Now, Mr. Uh, President, uh, we are providing uh, JobKeeper support to six million Australians. Uh, we will be uh, providing um, job seeker support to well over a million Australians. I mean, more than half the Australian working population will be on some form of government payment to support them through this crisis. And um, yes, I mean, we did use the uh, casual worker, the long-term casual worker definition out of the Fair Work Act. We do, I mean, the whole objective is to keep workers connected to the business that they have an employment relationship with. Uh, and uh, the definition of an employment relationship for casual workers is that they've worked <coughs> for that business uh, for at least 12 months. But it's not as if uh, casual uh, workers who have worked for that for order. business for Senator less time Coleman. can't get access Senator, to I didn't think I'd need the standing orders today, but can I remind senators of standing order 73, which says that questions shall not contain imputations, amongst other things? I would say that was getting a bit too specific, Senator Waters. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. The increased costs for disabled people and carers as a result of needing to self-isolate are greater than the general population. Private transport, food deliveries, health care and personal protective equipment are all basic needs now. Will you extend the coronavirus supplement to DSP and carer payment recipients to acknowledge their higher living costs and not leave them behind? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the uh, Minister for Social Services just uh, confirmed for me that uh, pensioners are already on the highest uh, income support payment. And on top of that, of course, we are making two uh, $750 additional contributions, uh, one in this uh, which has gone out from the end of March uh, to the middle of April and the second one which uh, will go out in July. Uh, so we, we are recognising that there are additional uh, challenges, of course, which is why we've made these additional contributions. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is protecting and supporting rural and regional Australians through the coronavirus pandemic? 
Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator McKenzie for the question and acknowledge her deep commitment to those in rural and regional Australia. Uh, Senator McKenzie, as you, as you would know, uh, we are supporting our rural and regional Australians affected by the COVID-19 uh, crisis with a $1 billion recovery and relief fund. Uh, Senator McKenzie, to confirm the words of you have used, we are in this together. Regional Australia is not immune. Uh, Mr. President, the Liberal and National Governments will provide fast, targeted support through our Relief and Recovery Fund to address emerging needs of specifically affected sectors, industries and communities, and to immediately reduce pressures in regional Australia. This includes further support under the Regional Air Assistance Package to maintain air network, uh, to maintain the air network across regional Australia, support for the agricultural and fisheries sector to continue export of their high quality produce into overseas markets, complemented by the waiving of fisheries levies for Commonwealth fishers. Uh, we also know that disruption to labour supply uh, and the agricultural food supply chain have been key issues for the agricultural sector uh, in managing the effects of COVID-19. And we're committed to ensuring agriculture is well supported and Australia remains in a position to produce the food we need and continue to provide food for the world. We're also responding uh, to calls from farmers across the country. And, uh, as Senator McKenzie has already alluded to and referred to, we've made temporary visa changes to allow those in the Pacific Labor Scheme and seasonal worker program uh, and working holiday makers to continue working in agriculture uh, and food processing. We're also keeping regional Australians connected with the changes to how schooling and work is being carried out during this crisis. We have new initiatives from NBN Co that will provide more broadband data for Sky Master satellite customers living in rural and remote Australia. And Senator McKenzie, we also have, as you know, our $2.4 billion dollar health package. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Uh, can the minister advise how these measures add to our government's other support initiatives for regional communities affected by bushfire and drought? Senator Cash. Uh, well, yes, I can. And despite the current crisis, our government stands with drought and bushfire-affected regional communities. Uh, again, Senator McKenzie, as you know, we have not forgotten them. There are a range of programs available to immediately support those affected by the drought conditions, including the Farm Household Allowance, which gives farming families the assistance they need to put food on the table, and has recently been given a boost due to the government's COVID-19 supplement. We also have the recently expanded Rural Financial Counselling Services, the Drought Community Support Initiative, uh, mental health and wellbeing support has been boosted, and concessional loans and generous taxation measures continue to be available. Uh, we also know the drought just doesn't stop at the farm gate, which is why there is also a range of programs for communities doing it tough. The Drought Communities Program, which gives a $1 million stimulus to councils, which can then allow them to boost tourism or provide additional employment through infrastructure projects. Um, there is also additional funding for road infrastructure and more support available Order, for Senator schools Cash. and childcare Time centres the that have taken a financial— Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Minister, what advice is there on how we can best support rural and regional Australians during the pandemic, including in relation to travel this coming Easter? Senator Cash. Well, Senator McKenzie, you actually raise a very good point, and you've already referred to it in your ministerial statement. It's been sent out uh, via australia.gov.au, and many of us will have received it on our mobile telephones. And that is, of course, this Easter, over that holiday break, the message is clear. Stay at home. Don't travel to the coast. Don't travel to the country over Easter. Don't go and visit family and friends in the regions or your favourite holiday destination this season. You may think you are doing the right thing, but you will not be. Continue doing what you've been doing for the past few weeks. Stay at home. That, Mr President, is what is going to see us all collectively uh, as a nation through this crisis. At this time, as Senator McKenzie acknowledged, uh, regional Australia they need our support, but the support we can give them over the Easter long weekend is to stay at 
home. So the message Order, is clear. Senator Stay Cash. at home. Time don't for travel. the answer has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. The Biosecurity Act of 2015 requires cruise vessels to report any passengers who show symptoms of infectious diseases to the Department of Agriculture biosecurity officers before arrival in Australia. According to a COVID-19 fact sheet titled Information for the Cruise Industry released by the Australian government on 6 March, if an ill traveller is reported, quote, a biosecurity officer will liaise with the vessel to screen for COVID-19. The Ruby Princess reported 158 ill passengers, including 17 with high fevers. How many federal biosecurity officers met the Ruby Princess's 2,700 passengers when it docked in Sydney on 17 March? And what actions did these officers take to screen for COVID-19? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Keneally, for her question. In relation to the specific questions that you've asked, I will take those on notice and we'll get you an answer from the Minister for Agriculture. Um, but can I absolutely assure the Chamber that the Australian Government is totally committed to protecting Australians from COVID-19? Uh, and that includes through its biosecurity measures that operate through the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, and that we are working very closely with the Department of Health, which is obviously leading the national health response uh, to COVID-19. But as you rightly point out, biosecurity plays an extraordinarily critical role, uh, particularly at our borders, uh, to make sure that we continue to protect Australian citizens, because as we all know, uh, much of the identified um, transmission of COVID-19 has come from overseas. Um, as of 1 February 2020, all travellers arriving from or who have been in mainland China, um, have, uh, regardless of nationality, have been subject to control measures and subsequent to that time um, other countries have also been subject to control measures, as we have seen in recent days when those um, who have been brought home by the extraordinary work of the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and Trade through the, the work of, of Minister Payne to bring Australians home uh, to Australia. So uh, I thank the Senator for her question and I will get the details of your question on notice. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. The same COVID-19 fact sheet states that disembarking cruise ship passengers with no signs or symptoms of COVID-19 must, quote, wear a surgical mask when traveling domestically or on public transport or taxis in Australia to reach their home. Did federal biosecurity officers direct the 2,700 disembarking passengers from the Ruby Princess to wear a surgical mask to travel home? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and once again, thanks, Senator Keneally, for her question uh, and continued interest. Um, I will take the specific nature of your question on notice, and I will make sure that I provide you with a very timely response. But you know, there is absolutely no doubt, Mr. President, that um, cruise ships have posed a very unique uh, issue to manage during the COVID. Uh, pandemic, whether it's cruise ships in Australia or Australians on cruise ships that have been around the world. Um, obviously, we took very strong action to ban international cruise vessels from docking in Australia some weeks ago. Um, however, however, we have had uh, some vessels that were already on their way here um, and that, that, that ban to make sure that the Australians that are on board many of these vessels um, are protected and also to make sure that we can continue to protect Australians uh, from this disease that is ravaging the world and where Australia has been working extremely hard to make sure that our transmission levels have been kept at the absolute lowest through the very strong management of, uh, Order. of the measures Senator in Rustin. Australia. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. The Prime Minister said on 15 March Quote, the Australian government will also ban cruise ships from foreign ports from arriving at Australian ports. On 19 March, the Ruby Princess arrived and disembarked 2,700 passengers. That ship is now linked to 600 COVID-19 cases, 13 deaths and 19 cases of community transmission in Australia. Does the government take any responsibility for failing to stop the one ship that mattered? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Senator Keneally, for her follow-up question. Um, can I um, say that 
First of all, there is an investigation obviously being undertaken around this particular ship that you refer to, and it would be inappropriate for me to make any comment. I have already undertaken to take on any specifics of the questions that you've asked on notice. But can I also um, take the opportunity um, to acknowledge that there are a number of people um, who have some very tragic circumstances on the Ruby Princess and to um, express our condolences to the families of those people? Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government is protecting and supporting individual Australians who are being impacted by the economic downturn caused by the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Scar, for the opportunity to be able to inform uh, this place of some of the most important legislation and changes um, to our uh, work environment, our social services system, but also the uh, the impact of the changes that will hopefully be passed through today in this place. And, and I acknowledge that the uh, the acknowledgement of those in this place that these measures will pass with the $130 billion uh, job keeper payment which is a support to businesses and to workers to make sure that they remain connected through what is an absolutely unprecedented situation that we find ourselves in in Australia. But equally, um, Senator Scar, um, if those people who are not uh, eligible for the JobKeeper payment, um, Australians who uh, are unable to access their payment will, uh, in many instances, in most instances, be able to access the job seeker payment. Because we've, we have moved very quickly to supercharge our social security system to make sure that Australians who have lost their jobs as a result of the coronavirus will be able to get quick and easy access to support to get them through. Um, this very, very quick but time-limited response uh, is supported by the coronavirus supplement, which is a $550 uh, dollar per fortnight uh, increase in the amount of money that people are able to receive. Uh, when they are on job seeker payment. And this has also been extended out uh, to youth allowance, to parenting payments, to farm household allowance, and to special benefits and also to students. Um, and anybody who is eligible for the, for the base payment will receive the $550 a fortnight um, supplement. But in addition to that, there are a number of things that have changed, including the waiving of many of the conditions for access to make sure that many people who would not otherwise be able to get access to this payment will be able to. This includes changing eligibility, waiving waiting periods and also asset testing, um, both liquid assets and other asset testing. So I want Order, to assure Senator everyone— Senator Rustin. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr President, I thank the minister. What is the government doing to support the most vulnerable people outside of the welfare system? including in my home state of Queensland. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much. Um, the government has made a commitment in recent days of an additional $200 million to go towards emergency relief. This urgent funding will be distributed through a very complex uh, and uh, comprehensive uh, charities network that works around Australia. And can I um, say a huge thank you to our emergency relief providers, uh, to our food relief providers, to our financial counsellors and those people that have, have taken on this enormous role. Um, you know, the Red Crosses, the Salvation Army, um, the St Vincent de Paul's, uh, the Anglicare, the Uniting Care, Wesley Mission, I could go on all day. The amount of amazing organisations that are out there supporting vulnerable Australians uh, with, uh, and, and also, at the same time, administering the additional $200 million that we have made available uh, to support them. Uh, emergency relief and food relief remain an absolute priority for this government to make sure that people have got access to the things that absolutely basic things that they need uh, for Order, everyday Senator life. Senator Rustin. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Mr President, how is the government helping aged pensioners and other vulnerable cohorts through these challenging times? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, as, uh, as has been mentioned um, before, this very comprehensive group of packages that have been put through this place to assist Australians as they um, face uh, the, the consequences of the catastrophic impact of, uh, of the coronavirus, one such of those measures has been uh, an additional $750 uh, payment, which I am 
most Australians who are eligible, the, the six and a half million Australians who were eligible for the first payment, uh, most of them would have already received. In fact, my understanding is uh, nearly five billion dollars has already gone out the door in the last week to people who were eligible for the seven hundred and fifty dollar uh, um, payment. In addition to that, there will be another $750 payment made to the same group of people with the exclusion of those that now will be able to access the COVID uh, supplement. So this will include aged pensioners, carers, um, those people on family tax benefits, disability uh, pensioners, uh, veterans and the like. Uh, this Order, will be paid Senator Rustin. Senator Wall. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Through no fault of their own, many Australians are stranded overseas, unable to follow the advice of the government to return home, as governments abroad have implemented lockdowns and commercial options for flights have dried up. Germany has arranged some 170 flights. The UK has partnered with airlines to re repatriate its citizens, and Canada has organised well over a dozen flights from different locations. The Australian government's communications to Australians on the ground say, and I quote, the Australian government's policy precludes assisted departures. Why is the government ruling out assisted departures to get Australians home to safety? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and uh, I uh, thank Senator Wong for her question. I think it is very, very important to be quite clear about this, because the government has made our position very clear that we are considering, on a case-by-case -case basis, supporting our airlines to, to operate non-scheduled services to less central locations to bring Australians home. That we will do that where it is feasible, where all other commercial options have been exhausted and where local authorities will permit such flights. Uh, and the last uh, factor, uh, Mr President, uh, is particularly uh, relevant as well. So we don't have plans for assisted departures in the context in which uh, we, for example, conducted flights to the, what was then the epicentre of the COVID-19 outbreak, Wuhan uh, in China, and then secondly for, to Japan, because those flights were unique and complex. Medical exercises to the epicentres of the virus at the beginning of this crisis to Wuhan. The situation of, the, of, of Australians at the moment is quite different from that, Mr President, and I have uh, been through that uh, in, in context in the chamber today and on many other occasions. So that we are considering, on a case-by-case -case basis, supporting our airlines to operate non-scheduled services to less central locations to bring Australians home. And some of those uh, decision-making processes in uh, parts of South America uh, and in other uh, countries, Mr. President, are well underway. What we have also done, as I uh, explained to the Senate in response to uh, Senator Smith's excellent question, uh, in places like Nepal, where we have been able to work with a commercial operator, uh, we have brought Australians from very remote parts of Nepal, from Pokhara, from Chitwan, from Lukla, for example, to Kathmandu to make sure that we could put as many Australians as possible on that flight and New Zealanders Order. to Senator bring them Payne. to Australia. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Uh, while the UK government ensured their citizens could come home from Peru for some £250, Australians in Peru were forced to pay $5,000 for a privately arranged charter option. And Australians are being surveyed by this government about how much they would be willing to pay to be repatriated to safety. Does the government agree that cost should not be a barrier to Australians getting home safely? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Every single one of these cases, Mr. President, is different. Uh, every single country has different circumstances. Every single flight is different. Uh, in some, they are able to be commercial flights uh, on scheduled, uh, scheduled uh, arrangements. In some, they are charters. Uh, in others, they are a commercial venture, which was uh, the one that Senator Wong referred to, organised by Chimu Travel, not by the government, but by Chimu Travel, uh, which was in fact supported by the government uh, so that it was able to occur. Uh, we provided uh, uh, important uh, uh, indemnity and underwriting for that flight and for the flight of Australians from the Ocean Atlantic in Montevideo, which was also organised by Chimu Travel. But every single one of those uh, is the same. Uh, we have not been involved in setting up uh, those, uh, those prices, Mr President. 
So, although there are Australians literally everywhere, we are endeavouring to work Order. with uh, Senator those. Senator Payne, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. As more time passes, health systems overseas are becoming more stretched, and the situation in some locations is deteriorating. There are reports to my office that locals are arming themselves in some locations to prevent foreigners leaving their accommodation. Will the minister commit to providing assistant departures where this is necessary to get Australians to safety? Senator Payne. So, Mr. President, uh, I, I think that uh, it is perhaps a question of nomenclature more than anything else that uh, Senator Wong is, is, is raising. I think that we are talking about doing flights on a case-by-case basis, as I have clearly outlined to the Senate, uh, and as uh, will support Australians to return home. Uh, and indeed, I have also outlined the many Australians who have been able to return home in recent uh, weeks. The government has been explicitly clear in relation to, uh, to our travel advice, and I think that that is also uh, a very important aspect of the information we have provided to Australians consistently indeed since the 9th of March when, for example, we advised Australians to reconsider taking a cruise at that time. On the 13th of March, advising all Australians to reconsider the need to travel overseas. On the 17th of March, advising Australians overseas who wanted to return home to do so as soon as possible. On the 18th of March, raising our travel advice Senator to Payne. level four of four, do time not for the answer travel. Has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals in government are protecting Australians and responding to the global coronavirus pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for the question. Uh, Mr President, in Australia, as at 10.30 a.m. this morning, there have been 5,977 confirmed cases of the coronavirus. And sadly, as at 6.30 a.m. this morning, there have now been 49 deaths. Globally, we have seen over 1.4 million confirmed cases and over 81,865 lives have now been lost. Our priority as a government is to flatten the curve and to reduce the number of cases. Australia's health emergency responses are flexible and they are scalable in order that we can respond effectively to the evolving situation. We are well placed to respond to ill travellers and those at risk of contracting infection with border isolation, surveillance and contact tracing mechanisms already in place. We have one of the world's leading testing programs with just over 313 tests conducted in Australia, one of the highest per capita rates of testing in the world. The National Cabinet, on receipt of the expert medical advice, is continuing to coordinate a national response, working with the states and territories. We have taken further steps to enforce social distancing measures, implemented further travel restrictions to prevent the spread of the virus, and we have more than 220 fever clinics up and running around the country. The rates of new cases in Australia have been declining over the past few weeks, which is an encouraging sign. However, as we all know, now is not the time for complacency and Australians must continue to practice social distancing measures. And again, as we approach the Easter long weekend, the message to all of us is clear. Stay at home this Easter and help save lives. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. What additional investments is the government making to ensure that Australia has access to all the health care needed to continue to manage the containment of the virus? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And as we are all aware, Australia isn't immune from COVID-19, but we're as well prepared as any country in the world. The government recently announced a $1.1 billion worth of initiatives, including $669 million will be provided to expand Medicare subsidised telehealth services for all Australians, with extra incentives to GPs and other health practitioners also delivered. An initial $150 million will be provided, and I commend uh, the Minister for Women and the Minister for Social Services, to support Australians experiencing domestic, family and sexual violence due to the fallout of the coronavirus. An extra $74 million will be provided to support the mental health and wellbeing of all Australians. 
An additional $200 million will be provided to support charities and other community organisations which provide emergency and food relief as demand surges as a result of the coronavirus. And this, of course, builds on the $2.4 billion of measures Order. we've already Senator announced. Cash. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Finally, how should Australians respond to the increasing measures that are being implemented to contain the virus? Senator Cash. And as the spread of coronavirus increases in the community, it's important that Australians know the practical things that they can do to protect their own health, the health of their families and the health of the community as a whole. The Chief Medical Officer advises, as we all know, of these five simple actions, actions that we should all practice on a daily basis. Be at least 1.5 metres away from everyone, wherever this is possible. Wash your hands, do it often, and do it properly for at least 20 seconds. Cough or sneeze into your elbow, <coughs> not your hands. Do not touch your face at all, even if it itches. And if you're sick, of course, the very obvious advice, stay at home. The reason we're undertaking all of these very simple actions, though, is of course we need to work together. We need to work together to protect the elderly, to protect the vulnerable and to protect those who have lung conditions. All of our advice is that this will be for around a six-month period. Order, Senator Cash. Time Senator for Coleman. the answer has expired. Senator Cormann. Yeah. I ask that further questions be placed on notice paper. Oh, Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by government senators to the questions asked by Labor senators. It was only a fortnight ago that we witnessed scenes no one thought imaginable in modern First World Australia. The images beamed to us from Centrelink offices across the nation, where lines of people snaked around the block, evenly distanced at 1.5 metres apart. They were more reminiscent of wartime bread lines or depression job queues than what we would expect to see in the major cities of one of the richest countries in the world. We have been blessed with almost three decades of uninterrupted economic growth, Madam Deputy President. But for Labor's swift and decisive go hard, go early and go households response to the GFC, this uninterrupted economic growth would have ended a decade ago. But here we are. In just a few weeks, a localised coronavirus outbreak in China has morphed into a global pandemic that not only threatens the lives of potentially thousands of Australians, but also the social and political order that is the bedrock of our proud democracy. Economists are positing a question that is no longer about whether there will be a surplus or the size of a surplus or whether the surplus will be wafer thin but rather will we avoid a depression. And that is why we are here today, to avoid that worst-case scenario. Like many governments around the world, we have had to act quickly and decisively to stop the spread of the virus and protect our health systems from collapse. But in tandem with this, we have also had to scramble together plans to save the economy and, with it, the nation's workforce from falling off a cliff. Just like the GFC, that response has been to implement some good old-fashioned Keynesian economics, get the money to households, get the money to businesses and get it done quickly. If we allowed a sustained break to be created between employees and their employer, once lost, that job may never exist again. This is the theory underpinning the JobKeeper package that we are here to consider. Labor supports the government on this, because Labor supports the Australian worker. We are the party of the Australian worker. It is in our DNA. Indeed, it is in our very name. The Prime Minister has said that everyone who has a job in this economy is an essential worker. And of course that is true. There is no hierarchy of importance on how we pay to put food on the table. This is why we on this side have been dismayed by firstly the Government Services Minister Stuart Robert, the member for Fadden, claiming a distributed denial of service attack on the MyGov website, and then of course having to reverse it and admit that the system had been overwhelmed, only to actually worsen that 
by saying it was my bad. Secondly, of course, we have been dismayed by the government's unwillingness to include various groups in the job seeker, job, sorry, job keeper package. Casuals who have been employed for under a year, workers in industries where short contracts are the norm, local government workers and various other groups. Teachers, Madam Deputy President, teachers as well, one of the most precious cohorts in this country. Across the country, casual teachers are being told that they don't have any shifts for the foreseeable future. If you're a casual teacher, you may well miss out on this package. Those teachers have been here for us throughout this virus, throughout um, the spread of it. So we should at this time be there for them. The government has the discretion to include these Australian workers in today's package. And of course, we heard in some of the answers given by government senators today that that is the case. They have the discretion to offer them the support needed to get over this unprecedented health and economic emergency. We hope that they use this discretion and put into practice a plan to uphold the words of the Prime Minister on the 24th of March. Everyone who has a job in this economy is an essential worker. Another group, of course, Madam Deputy President, who is at the coalface of vulnerability are our older Australians. And this horrible virus has shown to us that they are disproportionately affected. We will also need to have a conversation about why our native capability to manufacture equipment such as PPE in this country has been so severely diminished. But that perhaps is a conversation for tomorrow. We are, of course, a country Thank before you, we are Kitchen, an economy. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'm very pleased to be able to make a contribution to this Take Note debate. Like a lot of simple pleasures that we previously took for granted, I have a new appreciation for Take Note. I do so as the government's nominee as Deputy Chair for the new Senate Select Committee to be established to scrutinise the response to COVID-19, and I want to take the opportunity of the Take Note today to reflect on the task of that committee and all of us as parliamentarians in the months ahead. I am honoured to be joining this committee because I'm a big believer in parliamentary scrutiny of the decisions of executive government. I particularly have great faith in the unique capacity of this chamber to provide that scrutiny. I congratulate the Chair and Deputy Chair of the Senate Standing Committee of Delegated Legislation, Senator Fer Ferravanti Wells and Senator Carr, for their initiative to continue the important work of their committee at this time. In times of crisis, parliamentary scrutiny remains important. It is even more important given the extraordinary measures governments have been forced to put in place to respond to the coronavirus. Measures this parliament would normally never agree to have been put in place, for good reason, very rapidly. Normal parliamentary oversight, like Senate, like Senate committee inquiries into proposed legislation, has not been possible in this environment where responding quickly is essential. That's why I'm pleased the Senate is establishing a Senate Select Committee to be led by Senator Gallagher to help fill that scrutiny gap, given the parliament may not have a regular sitting schedule for some time. The committee and all of us as parliamentarians have a significant task on our hands in the months ahead. The most obvious and immediate task is to examine the health measures put in place to slow the spread of the coronavirus and how effective they have been. The first duty of any government is to protect the health and safety of its citizens, and this will undoubtedly be the major focus of the committee. Many of these public health measures, implemented in conjunction with the states, have also had severe economic consequences, which we are only seeing the beginning of. It will be important for the committee to carefully consider the economic costs of these measures on the lives of ordinary Australians. And of course, that cost is not just measured in terms of dollars. We know from recessions past that lost jobs and failed businesses leave behind many human tragedies and a significant personal toll of their own. Those economic consequences have necessitated a strong fiscal response from the federal government. While the need for these fiscal measures is obvious, they represent some of the largest ever peacetime Commonwealth outlays. Meeting the cost of those outlays will be a shared national task for many years ahead, and depending on the extent and the length of the economic downturn we are all anticipating, it will potentially be an intergenerational one. As a younger member of this place, I am particularly conscious of this. The interests of taxpayers must be carefully considered by the committee, given the burden the parliament is asking them to bear today and in the years ahead. The path out of this public health crisis is understandably of great interest to all Australians. It will be appropriate to question decision makers in government and the experts who advise them about alternative pathways from here. 
Australians will also look to all of us for the reconstruction project ahead. Putting the economy into hibernation and starting it up again on the other side has never been tried before. The closest historical an analogies we can draw are the transitions we've made in the past from a wartime economy to a peacetime one. Once the immediate danger of the virus has passed, rebuilding our economy and public services to a degree of normalcy will be our challenge. In the longer term, we'll also have to consider questions about our national resilience and self-sufficiency. In response to the crisis so far, we have seen the suspension of normal partisanships, which defines our politics. My sense is that this has been warmly welcomed by the Australian people. Inevitably, though, there will be things on which we disagree, and that is normal and healthy in a liberal democracy. We come here informed by different values, and that is reflected in our policy preferences. We have all been required to set aside, to some degree, our political philosophy in this crisis. When the conversation returns to the post-coronavirus world, it is likely that they will re-emerge, although perhaps not in the exact form that they took in the pre-coronavirus world. The challenge for us will be to set aside the gratuitous partisanship and to explore those differences constructively in the spirit of national unity that has defined this crisis so far. That is what the Australian people expect of us. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, yes, Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam De Deputy President. Uh, we're in this chamber today as expectations on us as elected representatives has changed. Uh, in the short time that I've been a senator over the last four years, the politics as usual approach that certainly was the pl place in the last term of parliament uh, can no longer cope and deal with the issues that people are confronting today. And I think it's important to note that the role the opposition has been playing has been responding to this and being constructive. I think that, as Senator Kitching said in her contribution to this, that the impact of seeing those queues outside Centrelink offices, obviously for those people directly impacted, but also for those people who observe those, uh, really uh, took home to people how uh, devastating uh, the changes that people are confronting is going to have. I know from people of my generation that have been uh, in the workforce now uh, since school for 20, 25 years and basically been employed that whole time, uh, to now find themselves uh, out of work and relying on government subsidies for the first time in their life is having a dramatic impact on those people as well. So it's really important that uh, the role of the opposition plays uh, continues to be constructive. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the work of the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, and the senior shadow ministers, particularly in uh, Health and Treasury and others, uh, Tony Burke, that have had uh, to uh, be holding the government to account, but doing it in a way where they have been constructive, which we saw through the first part of this year with the bushfires, and as we've seen dealing with the COVID-19 emergency as well. And it's often the case that the government have got to uh, the right decision after insistence from Labor. And I think that that is an important role for us to play, where Labor has identified gaps in the health and economic response, but instead of just identifying those gaps uh, and trying to charge at the government to say they've been shortcomings, uh, what we have done is we have been constructive. Uh, so we have been constructive in the health area and we have been constructive in the economic response uh, which is the substance of why the parliament is back here today. The Australian people are no doubt looking for outcomes, so uh, they don't want to see unnecessary political debate. Uh, they don't want to see unnecessary political arguments and game playing. Uh, they want to see a constructive approach and they can look to this parliament for guidance and hope that there is going to be the support for them when they need it, both uh, from a health point of view and from an economic point of view. But they also want to see hope for the future so that they can see the country is going to get through this and come out the other side in a stronger case. And there's no better example of the way that the Labor Party as opposition have uh, behaved during this uh, is when we talk about the job seeker package that we are here to debate today. Uh, and the government initially rejected uh, the Labor idea of a wage subsidy. Uh, and that was designed from a Labor point of view to help keep people in work. Uh, we welcome the package, but acknowledge the fact that the government 
have been working constructively with the union movement as well, which I think has been an important development uh, for workers in Australia. But what is disappointing is that the government can't bring themselves to bring forward a package that supports more workers. So just focusing on the requirement that the government have insisted on in regards to an a casual employer needing to be in that place, workplace for 12 months. So just looking at the ACTU data from based on ABS modelling, there are two, 215,000 Queenslanders uh, who do casual work but have been with their current employee, employer for less than 12 months. This includes 11,000 people in central Queensland, uh, 8,300 people in Wide Bay, uh, 11, almost 11,000 people in the Moreton Bay region of Brisbane. 3,400 in Toowoomba and 82,000 people in Brisbane. So these are just some of the areas that I look after uh, in Brisbane uh, that are going to be adversely impacted because the government quite couldn't bring themselves to have that Team Australia movement that they like to talk about. Um, they like to talk about it when uh, they are setting the agenda, but they can't quite bring themselves to talk about it. And when there are going to be people who are adversely affected because of the decision-making of this government. Uh, so we will continue to pressure the government over this issue. There are a lot of people who will be adversely affected, and we need to be on thank their you, side. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I rise to participate in the take note, and I appreciate uh, the contributions that have um, occurred thus far. I, like Senator Kitching, um, acknowledge the images that we saw of the queues outside the Centrelink offices. I think we were all aware of uh, the impact of the decisions that were being made and uh, what would occur, but those images really brought it home that this is very much real and it's very much being felt by all of our constituents right across the country. Um, and uh, it, has, it has made us all even more aware of the importance of what we do in this place and the fact that the decisions we make here have a very real impact on people uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and that's why uh, what we're doing today, passing the JobKeeper package, is so fundamentally important because it does extend um, support to people who would otherwise be joining those queues and exacerbating the problem. And I acknowledge uh, the concerns that have been raised by the opposition regarding those who seemingly miss out, those who are missing out on the JobKeeper package. But as was stated by Senator Cash in her response to some of the questions during question time, we have to draw a line somewhere. We don't have a magic pudding of money, and we have to be as responsible as we can be fiscally and economically as we try and address this health crisis. In saying that, it is really important to note that those who do miss out on the JobKeeper package do get access to the other packages that we have put out there. The job seeker payment and its increased capacity is in place because we knew that there would be those who would not be ultimately eligible for other measures we consider, including the JobKeeper package. What we've done with JobKeeper is we've ensured that we've extended to casual employees who have an ongoing relationship with their employer. Um, and those permanently employed who have that ongoing relationship for 12 months or more, we've extended a status that's already recognised under Australia's taxation system. And so in putting together the $130 billion package, that is where we ultimately drew the line. Because when you put these lifelines in place, you have to draw a line somewhere. And as heartbreaking it is, as it is that some people will miss out, we have to be responsible. We have to remember what we are in this place to do. And we are in this place to do the best we can do for the whole 
of the Australian community and not individual sectors and not individual circumstances. It is impossible to individualise as much as we all may want to. Um, I also I really want to note the opportunity that we may face at the other end of, of this outbreak. I truly believe our regions will emerge stronger at the end of this. What we are seeing is our key regional industries are essential. Our agricultural industries are essential. And we need to get behind those industries to ensure they're strong at the other end. But also, our regions are very well placed to welcome back manufacturing opportunities that we once thought were lost to this nation. As was mentioned before, we can manufacture right here at home things like uh, personal protective equipment, and we do that in our regions. And I think that now is an opportunity for us to recognise that our regional Australia and agriculture is the lifeblood of this nation. And we've been through a lot. We've been through drought, we've been through bushfire, and we've had flooding in certain regions. And our regional and remote communities also rely on tourism, which has been absolutely slammed at this point. But if we get behind those industries and if we support those industries and our regions on the other side of this outbreak, we will be stronger and we will be stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Urquhart. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Can I just begin uh, my contribution by thanking those on the front line, our medical people, our paramedics, um, those working in workplaces that are actually staying open to ensure that we get the supplies we need, um, and those delivering the service um, at this time. And there's many people out there working um, without the necessary personal protective equipment to keep them safe while they're doing their job to try and keep us safe. So I want to thank you to all of those people and recognise the contribution that they're making. I think. Um, both Senator Kitching and Senator um, Chisholm in their contribution talked about the way in which Labor has worked constructively with the government to put forward, certainly from our point of view, improvements to the legislation to ensure that not as many people fall through the cracks, or no one, hopefully, would fall through the cracks. But there still are many thousands of Australians who will miss out. <coughs> and, um, Earlier, I think it was earlier today, or it may have been yesterday, um, I heard the Prime Minister talk about um, cooper cooperatively working with business and unions. For us on this side, that's not a new process at all. Um, it's, our, it, it's something that we've done for years. Unions are representative of those workers that are out there on the front line. They're representative of the workers who are um, <clears throat> dealing with the um, difficulty of uh, a very worried public at the moment, um, and they should be consulted. So for us, it's not a new concept. And I hope in the future that um, discussions around all sorts of different things occur continually, both with business but also inclusive of the union movement um, through the ACTU. But I just want to talk a little bit about some of the responses that we got from the government today, and particularly those um, thousands of um, people who aren't eligible, and I think over a million, that casuals, labour hire, the nature of the industry. Um, you know, there are a, we understand that this legislation needs to get through, and I think Senator Wong, in her contribution to the ministerial statement that Senator Cormann put forward earlier talked about the fact that we will not hold this up. But there are amendments that will help people. Um, <clears throat> and I heard Mr Porter um, the other day talk about this being our Dunkirk moment, that it was get the lifeboats out. And I guess <clears throat> one, one of the areas of concern that I have is that um, there are many Australians who are not going to get access to those lifeboats. Um, and that's why I would urge the government to, to consider the, the amendments put forward by Labor, because we do need as many people in those lifeboats as possible. Um, Minister Cash talked about those being included and that the government had to draw a line somewhere. I mean, I've been getting, as I'm sure everyone on this side and probably all of us have been getting lots of emails. We've seen the images of Centrelink, we've seen all that. 
Um, and I think that you know, we really need to think about the difficulties that some of those workers are going to face into the future, but not just the workers, the employers as well. When they lose employees, um, that they may not get back who have trained and, and understand their industry. There's a lot of workers in sectors, particularly labour hire, and I know from my background, the AMWU, there are uh, a lot of concern around some areas where workplaces, some workers have worked in workplaces. Shipbuildings in Tasmania is a good example that I can give you. Who there are some employees who have worked in a workplace for over 10 years, some 13 years, who have worked at the same workplace for that period of time. They've been moved on to labour hire, then the employer employs them back. They then go back to labour hire. They've been in and out of that same work uh, site, the same address. The only thing that's changed is their employer, the name of the person that employs, not their workplace, not their address of work, not their pay address, uh, not their pay rate or their classification. They come in one day employed by ex employer. The next day they're employed by Y employer, yet they're not eligible. That doesn't seem to make sense to me, and there's no logic in this. And I would urge the government to look at these areas, and particularly um, Senator Rustin has the ability to look at those areas, and I would urge her to do that for those long-term employees who would be considered um, casual employees in excess of 12 months' work, bar the fact that their employer has actually decided to change the method or the employer and the process of how they're actually employed. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Kitching to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answer uh, given to me uh, to my question of the Leader of the Government. Um, now, we asked about the people that are left behind in the government's COVID support package and why decisions were made to leave those particular cohorts of people behind. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like we got satisfactory answers and we will be moving amendments uh, once we come to this legislation to fill those gaps, to make sure that no one is left behind. It seems to be a phrase that's been bandied around a lot, but actually a lot of people are being left behind. Now I asked firstly about renters. We've seen the government take action on commercial leases, but despite some early commitments a week or so ago, we've seen no actual action to protect residential tenancies. And I asked why and was told that it was a state issue. Well, commercial tenancies are technically also a state issue. So that still doesn't explain why you're leaving renters behind. And it's not clear whether or not renters might be subject to a rent increase next week, or their landlords might be able to evict them once this pandemic is over. We need a national coordinated response on residential tenancies to protect renters. We need a national rent holiday. We need a national mortgage holiday. We need a national response on housing. Surely that is the most fundamental task of government, to ensure that people have a roof over their heads. Now, there's some power, um, discretionary power that will be granted to various ministers, and we will continue to urge those powers to be used to protect people, to keep them safe at home, and to ensure that landlords can't increase rent or boot people out onto the streets. Now, I asked also about why casuals have been left behind if they've not been employed for that one-year time frame. I asked why, why the one year, why this arbitrary distinction between people in precarious and casual work, um, wh why draw that line? What's the justification? Now, it's very telling that of the uh, one million people who are casuals that will miss out on JobKeeper because they haven't been an employee for one year, half of those are young people, half of them are under 24. So they're also facing those other precarious rental um, and insecure income situations. They're already struggling with the realities of everyday life that has left young people behind for so long. And now they're facing this added insult of being left out of the JobKeeper package. I'm afraid I didn't feel like I received a, um, a, a, really a response as to why that line was drawn. Reference was made to the Fair Work Act. Well, you're still leaving 
a million people behind, and half of them, half a million people, are young people. So we will continue to campaign for casual workers, um, all casual workers, to be eligible to receive that JobKeeper allowance. Now, I lastly asked about the increased costs for disabled people and their carers um, and why they haven't been um, topped up to the rate of, of job seeker. And we were told that well, this is because they used to get paid more than the old rate of New Start. And they've had a few increases. I think there's been two that we were, we were informed of. But sadly, those increases still don't see disabled people or those on carer payments receiving the same amount as the new job seeker amount. And yet, these folk are facing increased costs. The burden of self-isolation is increasing their costs. We've had um, stories shared with us. People that used to be able to catch public transport now can't take the risk. They're immune suppressed, a whole variety of other reasons. The cost of transport has increased for them. And yet, they're now getting less than others in a comparable situation. So again, we don't want to see anybody left behind, and we want those words to mean something when they're used by the big parties in this parliament. We will be moving amendments so that renters are not left behind, people with disabilities and their carers are not left behind, casual workers, irrespective of how long they've worked, are not left behind. We'll also be moving amendments to protect uh, people and residents who are temporary workers, who are migrant workers who are uh, visa workers who are being left out of this support system for no good reason. We'll also be moving to protect international students and, crucially, people in the arts and entertainment sector that are providing us with such joy and reflection in these times of self-isolation. They do not deserve to be left behind. Nobody does. We can fix these things later today, and we will be moving to ensure that this parliament does just that. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Now move to the establishment of the Select Committee. Senator, uh, Senator Gallic. Deputy President, I seek leave to move the motion that's been circulated um, to colleagues. Uh, you don't need leave, Senator. Oh, I was told I did need leave because I checked. Yeah, you told me I didn't need leave. Someone else told me I did need leave, and then I thought, well, I'll just ask for leave, and then if I don't need it, someone will tell me. It's always me. good and to ask. As it turns out, I don't need it. So I move uh, that a select committee to be known as the Select Committee on COVID-19 be established to inquire into and report on the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and and any other related matters. Um, I won't. Um, in the interest of time, read through all of the other aspects to that motion, um, but uh, it's been circulated to senators for their consideration. Um, I would like to just say a few things, if I could. Yes. Yeah, I'm just looking for the clock. It always provides me with guidance. Um, Senators, the establishment of this committee is uh, is very important, and it will have an important role going forward as Australia deals with the immediate challenges presented by the COVID-19 outbreak and, indeed, for what happens after. I would like to thank the government, particularly uh, the leader of the government in the Senate, uh, Senator Cormann, Minister Cormann, for working with us to put these arrangements in place. This committee, in its early stages, particularly will provide the country uh, with the scrutiny that's needed on the government's response in the absence of the parliament not sitting. And I would say that, of course, it remains Labor's view that the parliament should be able to sit, um, but that with the government um, not willing uh, to agree to that, this select committee will be an important vehicle for examining um, the government's response and to providing the transparency and accountability and scrutiny that uh, the people of Australia deserve and indeed the role that this Senate importantly plays across the political system. Um, we have tried to represent the uh, a broad makeup of the Senate in the select committee of seven senators so that all the crossbench is represented, the Greens political party is represented, the opposition and the government. Uh, it does have a long reporting date and, indeed, uh, the terms of references uh, are very broad uh, to allow us to inquire into any aspect related to the COVID-19 pandemic and the government's response to it. 
uh, and of course that covers areas we know already, but also importantly it gives us scope uh, through this committee to examine and inquire into areas that may not be known to us at this point in time. And as we know, we are learning things all the time about this uh, pandemic and how governments are, are responding to it. So I hope uh, I get the support of uh, the Senate for this motion. I thank the government for working with us. In terms of the approach that Labor senators will bring, you'll see the same approach that you've been seeing in terms of our dealing with the legislation that's come to this place. It will be cooperative uh, and working in the national interest uh, as our first uh, point, but if there are gaps, if there are problems, then we will be raising those and pursuing them vigorously. I urge the Senate to support this motion as it really is the only motion that's going to get uh, it's the only option and it's the only vehicle that we will be able to put in place to provide the appropriate sc scrutiny that's needed, um, not just over the next few months, but indeed over the next 18 months or so. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the amendment as circulated. Again, my understanding is I don't need leave to do that, but I do seek leave to make a short statement of no more than two minutes. Oh, you can speak to the amendment, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. Um, oversight and transparency is crucial. And the fact that people are still being left behind by this government's package shows precisely why we need genuine and independent oversight. But the amendment that the Greens have circulated um, builds on work done by the House crossbench, including Leader of the Greens, Adam Bant, um, and it's to establish joint standing committees, uh, sorry, joint select committees, and two of them. Um, now, the reason that we believe we need joint committees rather than Senate committees are, are numerous. We need to be able to call the Prime Minister and ministers who sit in the House. There is otherwise no forum to properly hold those decision makers to account. The Senate Select Committee that we will shortly be voting upon um, will not have the power to call those ministers or the Prime Minister, significantly hampering that committee's ability to perform an out accountability and oversight role. Um, likewise, there's a lot of expertise in the other place. They've got 151 members, and we should use their expertise in public health and economic matters, including the expertise of those on the crossbench. Likewise, we need to ensure that local areas are represented where they're hardest hit, but a joint committee would show a collective approach to a collective challenge, and it would show that the government and the opposition are serious about accountability. Um, under the model that was agreed to by the crossbench in the House and that was put in the public domain a week or so ago that we've now circulated in this chamber, one committee would scrutinise the economic programs being developed and rolled out, and a second would scrutinise the measures being taken to protect the nation's health. Now, in normal times, we rely on the parliamentary committee system to ensure that our laws are considered and they're robust and they're scrutinised and they're amended where need be. And in times of crisis, and with the parliament potentially suspended for August, unless we're otherwise called back, and we'll speak to that issue later, this is more important than ever. We need to be able to act fast. We need it to be done right. And those committees are a powerful way of ensuring that we can get it right. So it's disappointing that the two large parties have um, not agreed to that approach of, of joint select committees and two of them to separate out, separate out those economic and health issues. But we don't intend to stand in the way of this motion. Um, and we flag that our excellent and exceedingly competent Senator Rachel Seawitt, our whip, will be, uh, we will be nominating her as our representative on this committee. Senator Patrick. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, you can speak to the okay, amendment, thank Senator you. Patrick. Um, uh, I just rise to indicate Senator Alliance uh, will support uh, the amendment by uh, the, the Greens, uh, I, I, and I hope that helps in, in terms of whether or not we need to call a division. Um, we support the, joint, uh, support, uh, the joint committees on the basis of the statements made by Senator Waters. Uh, I would add also uh, that, of course, we as senators tend to look at things in a different way from a state perspective uh, and often are more uh, from a strategic perspective rather than dealing necessarily with individual constituents uh, in much the same way that uh, or in the same way that members of the House of Reps 
uh, uh, deal with constituents in their electorate. And so it is important. Uh, there is expertise in the House that is different to, to, this, uh, to this place. Um, and uh, you know, the reality is, if, uh, uh, if uh, this is not supported, we will tr truly have a, a, uh, the other place in holiday mode. They will be uh, away for the entire period uh, between now and, uh, and August. So uh, just indicating Senator Alliance will be supporting uh, the Greens' uh, amendment. Senator Gallagher. The amendment, sorry, um, just on the amendment, Labor won't be supporting the amendment, um, I think, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, we don't think a joint select commi committee is the best vehicle. Uh, we think the expertise for scrutiny lies in uh, the Senate. And over time, when you look at the work that's been done and the information that's been gleaned and the reports have been written, they've been written by Senate committees. Um, so we don't accept that. We also actually understand how the numbers work. And the government has the numbers in the House, and they're not going to support the establishment of a joint select committee. So it wouldn't get up. So that's my point. The only vehicle available to senators today to put in place proper independent scrutiny is, this, is the Senate Select Committee. That is the only option available. The Joint Select Committee will not get up. And aside from that, we don't think it is the best vehicle. We think the expertise relies, uh, is found in this chamber uh, with the processes available to the Senate. Um, and in terms of uh, the expertise centres bring, I think we bring varied uh, experiences. I deal with constituent matters all the time, and I imagine many of us in this place do. So we don't just come from a state's point of view. And uh, people in the House uh, and other senators who are not on this committee, and any senator can be a participating member, will be working very hard. I mean, my experience is that all of us have been extremely busy since this outbreak occurred because we've been dealing with a very distressed community that is knocking on all of our doors. And we have a job as civic leaders to play in providing them with the support they need, albeit in a, probably a different way than we've normally done in the past. But my expectation is that members of parliament are going to be extremely busy. But the motion that I move is the only way that we will get scrutiny arrangements put in place, and the Senate should support that motion. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thought that I uh, contribute uh, to this uh, debate on the Greens amendment in, uh, and indicate that the government will not be supporting the uh, Greens amendment. And uh, you know, very much for the reasons um, outlined by Senator Gallagher. Um, I mean, we welcome the scrutiny. We do believe there is a need for scrutiny. I mean, we understand and appreciate that in these extraordinary times, uh, the government has uh, been. Uh, required to make uh, very significant decisions. And uh, as uh, one of the senators mentioned earlier, there is no manual on how to uh, deal with this crisis in the best possible way. We're making judgments every single day to the best of our ability, but it is appropriate that those judgments that we made are scrutinized, are challenged, and help us uh, you know, even make better decisions as we go along. So it is, it is very important to have a committee uh, of, uh, the, so, uh, of the type that is being proposed by Senator Gallagher uh, in place to do this job. And let me just say, it is entirely appropriate for this to be a Senate select committee. Uh, I mean, it, it, is, it is the Senate that has, uh, you know, the, of course, the tradition and the, and the expertise in scrutinizing the activities of government. It's the Senate that runs the Senate Estimates Committee process. It is the Senate that has got the uh, committee uh, scrutinizing delegated legislation. The House doesn't have an estimates committee process. The House doesn't have a, 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 scrutiny, a committee process scrutinizing delegated legislation. I mean, I see this very much in the fine tradition of the Senate uh, as it has developed uh, over 120 years of federation. Uh, and um, it, it, is, it is, of course, uh, appropriately uh, opened to all senators to participate. Uh, we, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, Labor mover has ensured that every single senator is able to participate as a participating uh, member of this committee. And, and of course, uh, uh, the uh, Senate Select Committee uh, into the, um, to be known as the Select Committee on COVID-19 uh, into the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and any related matters has got a very broad-ranging brief, an extremely broad-ranging brief. It has got all of the uh, usual 
uh, uh, powers um, of um, uh, Senate uh, committees, uh, which of course are in full display uh, during uh, Senate estimates hearings or indeed during Senate committee inquiries uh, more, more generally. Now, uh, Senator, um, um, Senator Patrick, our good friend and valued colleague from the great state of South Australia, is concerned about who he may or may not be able to uh, call as, uh, as witnesses. Well, let me tell you, you will have access to the full breadth of uh, government, uh, departmental uh, and agency officials in the usual way as that happens during the Senate economics, uh, during the Senate uh, estimates uh, committee hearings. And, uh, and we, we will continue to make ourselves uh, available in the appropriate fashion. And of course, you will continue to be able to ask questions on notice. Uh, you, you talk about uh, responding flexibly to this situation we find ourselves in. Well, that is what we're doing. And you will continue to be able to ask questions of ministers. I mean, we do have a, a long-standing uh, process under our standing orders where you are able to ask questions and we are required uh, in uh, fixed uh, deadlines to provide answers uh, to, these, to these questions. And look, I, I won't uh, hold the uh, Senate up uh, much longer. I had hoped that perhaps uh, during uh, my contribution that the uh, bills in relation to the coronavirus um, economic response uh, package might have made it to this chamber, but I thought that I would just uh, make a, uh, a succinct contribution uh, to uh, the debate on this amendment uh, for the uh, interests of um, senators and those listening. I'm keeping an eagle eye out through the chamber, Senator Coleman. Well, if there being no other contributions, what I'll do is I'll put the amendment moved by Senator Waters first. So the motion is that the amendment moved by Senator Waters to the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator, see what you would like to avail yourself of the. You obviously read my mind. So um, I will then ask that the journals and the Hansard record uh, that the Australian Greens votes registered in favour of the amendment. <laughs> Senator Patrick, you would like the same? Yes, please. So recorded. So I'll now put the motion as originally moved by Senator Gallagher. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So, Senator, uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I move that the sitting of the Senate be suspended uh, till the ringing of the bells. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Um, the sitting of the Senate is suspended until the ringing of the bells, which I understand will be very shortly.
Thank you. I have received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Bill 2020 and three related bills for concurrence. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. I put the motion moved by Senator Cormann. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, the clerk. Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Bill 2020, Coronavirus Economic Response Package Omnibus Measures No. 2 Bill 2020, Appropriation Bill No. 5 2019-2020, Appropriation Bill No. 6 2019-2020. Senator Cormann. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I um, welcome the opportunity to speak on this very important legislation uh, today. This package of bills um, forming the government's third economic response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, largely built around the $130 billion jobs, job keeper payments. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge uh, those workers who are keeping the place uh, going, those frontline workers uh, providing the health response uh, in our supermarkets, tradies, cleaners, garbage collectors, truckies, public servants right around the country in both state and territory and federal governments who are all turning up to work every day to keep the rest of us at home or at home as much as we can be. It's very clear that in just four short months, uh, COVID-19 has really changed the world as we knew it and as we all understood it and how it operated. I don't think anyone could have predicted the virus, uh, the extent of the virus, uh, the challenges presented by the virus or indeed the impacts it's having on the global economy, on individual countries, on individual cities and on all of us and our families. It's changed the way we live, the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we shop, the way we educate our children. So many of the things that we thought were fixed and immovable have been upended and thrown into a world of uncertainty. And for some, way too many, with devastating consequences. The lines outside of Centrelink, the calls to our offices, the emails and letters coming in outlining individual circumstances, individual businesses, local businesses, long-term businesses, all telling the stories of the economic reality of what happens when a busy, thriving economy can be changed in just a few days. It is for these people for whom we are here today. COVID-19 touches all of us, not only in our jobs, but it touches us personally talking to the children about why they can't go to school, why they can't see their friends and family, and not being able to answer the things children most need from us, which is when is it going to be back to normal or when will things get better? And none of us can answer those questions at this point in time other than to reassure that we know it will one day. For me, my sister, who I'm very proud of every day anyway, she rises every morning to her job as the senior nurse on the ward that cares for COVID-19 patients. For 30 years, she's tirelessly cared for people, often in the background, but with dedication and professionalism. And today she finds herself right on the front line. You can't get any closer than she is, really, providing care and compassion to those who fall sick and are hospitalised from this awful virus. She won't see her children, her adult children or her grandchild, or really any of us for some time, and she keeps herself away to ensure that the rest of us are safe. Her and her colleagues are the bravest of the brave, and their fearlessness and their dedication to their profession provides instruction to all of us. It is for my sister and her colleagues all around the country that we are here today. Because compared to those on the front line, we have a relatively straightforward job to do here. We must pass these bills to support the economic response to COVID-19, just like we have with the previous packages. We will raise our concerns with aspects of the government's response, and we will move second reading amendments about those issues which we have raised publicly and to which the government at this stage has refused to budge. But we will not block these bills, despite them not being perfect and not being exactly as we would have designed them in government. 
but because six million workers and their families are relying on us doing the right thing today. This third response brings the total financial support provided as part of the economic response to COVID-19 to over $300 billion. Throughout this time, over the last couple of months, Labor's priority has been to ensure we support the economy to protect jobs, to help Australian workers, businesses, families and communities through this difficult time, and to ensure that vulnerable Australians are supported. We have been supportive of the government measures and we have been working constructively and in a bipartisan manner. And this is the same when it comes to the JobKeeper payments that are before us today. Will it be ensuring that it passes through the parliament today? Because it was a, a wage subsidy was something that Labor had called for the government to introduce. In fact, I think in the last time we were debating an, the, economic, the second economic response package, we were calling on the government to consider a wage subsidy to make sure that employers were in the position to retain workers. The JobKeeper payment will provide $1,500 per fortnight for every eligible employee. These employees have to be part, full-time, part-time or casuals employed on a regular and systemic basis for more than 12 months as at 1 March 2020 and at least 16 years old. They also have to be either an Australian citizen, a holder of a permanent visa or a special category subclass 444 visa holder as at 1 March 2020. Employers, which include not-for-profits, will be eligible for the subsidy if their turnover has or will likely fall by 30 per cent or more, or 50 per cent uh, for those be sorry, for 30 per cent or more for businesses with an annual turnover of less than one billion, or for 50 per cent for those with a turnover over one billion and, then not, and not subject to the bank levy. There's a carve-out for charities where they only have to show a turnover reduction of 15 per cent. The legislation before us sets out the mechanism by which the Australian Tax Office can administer the JobKeeper payment program. Rules will be made by the Treasurer setting out eligibility details and details of the administration of the program. The fact that these details are in rules means there is significant flexibility regarding how the program will operate into the future, and the Treasurer is able to widen eligibility as required. The Tax Commissioner will also have significant discretion in the administration of the program and will publish detailed guidance for businesses, including how to self-assess the reduction in turnover, how alternative tests may be applied to assess eligibility and how consolidated groups of companies can independently assess isolated entities. It must be made clear that our support for the JobKeeper payment does not change the fact that Labor has concerns with the measures namely with the groups of people who will miss out on the valuable support offered through this program. And we're not talking about a small cohort either. 1.1 million casual workers will be left out because they've worked for their current employer for less than a year. This includes a large number of casual teachers, many of whom are reaching out to their, employee, uh, to their MPs uh, over the last couple of weeks. Temporary migrant workers who are not eligible for JobKeeper or JobSeeker or the coronavirus supplement local government workers who have been stood down, charities who, while the government did act recently to lower the turnover threshold, reduction threshold to 15 per cent, may still miss out because of the grants they receive, disability service providers who may miss out, universities and non-government schools, as my colleague um, the member for Sydney has outlined in the other place today. I'm sure as many of my colleagues in this place and the other place we have all been inundated with correspondence from concerned people about how they may, their individual circumstance may mean that they miss out on the JobKeeper payment. We do, uh, whilst we will be raising these issues in our second reading amendments, and they have of course been raised in the other place uh, prior to this debate, we do acknowledge that there is significant flexibility provided to the Treasurer to widen eligibility for the JobKeeper payment, and indeed the Treasurer himself has acknowledged that in question time today. We know, and all of those out there who are doing it really tough and falling between the gaps, that there is nothing preventing the Treasurer and government from providing JobKeeper to these groups other than their current refusal to do so. They could uh, act and ensure that more jobs are protected. And we know the Prime Minister has said that all jobs are essential jobs. Well, this gives uh, them the opportunity to um, walk the walk, um, not just talk the talk, because it, this would ensure that more people are brought into a scheme that protects more jobs. 
These concerns that uh, we will raise and my colleagues will raise in the second reading debate add to the issues we have about the government's economic response in general, which also includes the, is in the issue of residential renters, uh, the early release of superannuation funds, uh, funds from superannuation accounts, which we believe risks undermining retirement incomes and should have only been used as a last resort, not the first stop, and the speed and urgency at which the economic support is going out. But as our leader, um, Mr Albanese, has said today in the other place, despite our concerns, we will deal with this bill today. We will not engage in a situation where the legislation could get blocked between chambers. That is not an option. The six million people who are waiting for this wage subsidy and the businesses that employ them require us to pass this legislation uh, today. Unfortunately, our amendments did not uh, succeed in the House, and the government has shown in a very clear and concrete way that they are not prepared uh, to support the amendments, the reasonable amendments that we put forward. As such, it's very clear that if we were to pass amendments that pass this chamber here, they would return uh, to the House and we would get ourselves in a situation which I don't think the Australian people looking on us today would expect us to engage in. They want their parliament to act in their interests, the interests of all of those people who have been affected. We've done that with the first and second package, and we will do that with the third. I will foreshadow and I, I move uh, my, the second reading amendment that's been circulated in my name. Uh, this uh, amendment goes to um, the extraordinary powers which I have just um, spoken about uh, to include uh, that the Treasurer has been given uh, to essentially set the rules on eligibility for the JobKeeper uh, payment and calls on the Treasurer to use this power under the legislation to ensure more jobs are protected and that struggling otherwise viable businesses and organisations are able to access the JobKeeper payment. Uh, the, the power is there, the capacity is there. At the moment, the will is not there, but we would urge the Treasurer and the government to, uh, to use this power and to ensure that more people are offered the support that they are after. I would just like to make a couple of uh, comments around the appropriation bills, which we support as part of this package. Um, we do think it's important that the um, supplementation is provided for agencies that are have been inundated and those that have lost revenue and are providing a high level of quality service to the people of Australia through the departments. Today, the bills uh, seek to appropriate about, I think, $650 -odd million dollars, uh, across a range of departments uh, that are being affected one way or another by the coronavirus and, indeed, other important payments to the non-government sector to uh, respond to issues of increased demand around domestic violence and uh, food, uh, food um, bank programs. So we do support those. Um, also, the uh, $40 billion advance to the finance minister provision, we accept the government's uh, point that it may need access to those funds earlier than what would normally be available through uh, the financial year and that these, this access to those funds should be made um, available from an earlier date, I think from uh, April, and we believe that is a sensible approach and uh, we support the government's uh, amendment to allow that uh, to happen um, with the conditions that have been placed on that uh, from the last debate uh, and are working well. Uh, so, In conclusion, I think the job before us today is very clear. Uh, whilst this scheme is not perfect, it is a big deal. Uh, it is something that we had called for, and we are pleased that the government has responded in this way. Uh, there are too many people with uncertain futures. There are too many businesses worried about how to get through the next few months. And this parliament, uh, through the passage of this bill today, can offer them a bit of light in what has been a very difficult and challenging time. Um, perhaps this is the, the most important job we'll do for a little while, uh, and it is important and we need to stand up to the challenge because workers right around this country are doing that every day. As the world has changed, our lives have changed, restrictions have come in, 
Uh, and uh, you know, we need to do play our bit there too. In conclusion, um, you know, the sooner we can deal with this, uh, I think the, we can get back to our constituents and start dealing with the very day-to-day -day real problems that many people are having and encourage everyone uh, to stay home, to stay safe uh, and to keep other people safe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. And I rise to speak to the package of bills uh, that have come before us today. This is not an easy time for anyone. I'd again like to acknowledge and commend the immense efforts of our nurses, our doctors, our paramedics, cleaners, our pharmacists, our aged care workers, our supermarket staff, all of those who are helping us get through this most challenging time. We recognise the immense risk that healthcare workers in particular are taking to save others, and we will be pushing to make sure that they've got the personal protective equipment and the ICU beds that they need to tackle this crisis. We'll be proposing changes to allow healthcare workers to access workers' compensation if they test positive for coronavirus without having to prove that they contracted it at work. Our hearts go out to all those who have lost loved ones, to people who have the virus um, and to those have, who have family members or friends who are unwell, to families and friends who are separated by isolation and those who are struggling without the social interactions to, uh, that usually sustain them again. We are thinking of you and we are you. In these uncertain times, the financial difficulties and anxiety continues to put a strain on support services. So I'd like to acknowledge the social workers, the mental health support teams, the frontline domestic and family violence workers, the child support agencies and others who are working tirelessly to keep people safe in this pressure cooker environment. Experience in other countries shows that these services, sadly, can expect to be stretched for many months to come. And whilst I welcome the announcements made to date for increased family violence, crisis accommodation, support for referral services and a funding reprieve for the crucial WESNET Safe Phones program is still not enough to meet increased demand and keep everybody safe from family and domestic violence. I urge the government to provide the significant extra funding that's needed to allow frontline family violence services to actually keep up with demand and make sure no one is turned away. The Greens also acknowledge that uh, teachers who've borne the brunt of policy uncertainty for weeks and who'll spend their Easter break working on ways to deliver classes remotely in term two, often whilst homeschooling their own children at the same time. We also acknowledge the early childhood education workers who've been at the forefront of our collective response to this pandemic. This crisis has highlighted the essential link between accessible and free childcare and workforce participation. And the Greens will push for childcare to remain free once this pandemic has uh, concluded. But we also recognise that the risks to those workers um, are immense, and we will continue to insist that early childhood teachers have options to protect their health and have access to appropriate prote uh, personal protective equipment. The Greens would also like to acknowledge the millions of parents who are struggling to work from home whilst homeschooling their kids and mediating between warring siblings trapped indoors, um, caring for elderly relatives and negotiating changes to shared care arrangements whilst maintaining their own mental health. As a, a Green spokesperson on women and a proud feminist, I'd also like to reiterate my colleague Senator Faruqi's observation at the last parliamentary sitting that this is also a gendered crisis. Women are disproportionately represented in the frontline roles needed to respond to this crisis. 80 per cent of our healthcare workers are women, 70 per cent of pathology services are provided by women, and the majority of teachers, carers, cleaners and social services are also women. And so women are disproportionately represented in the short-term casual roles that are currently ineligible for the JobKeeper's support especially those in the hospitality, healthcare and retail sectors. They're also disproportionately at risk of domestic and family violence whilst during, uh, in isolation with an abusive partner. And women will have, uh, sadly also bear the disproportionate load of the caring required to see us through this crisis. Now, we will be proposing amendments today which address some of those issues, but as a society we have a lot to do to address this gender imbalance in the future. After a summer of bushfires and now a pandemic, it's clearer than ever that Australians are all in this together and we need to support each other. Now, on transparency, I wanted to touch on the importance of democratic institutions in a crisis. Some decisions need to be made uh, efficiently and uh, decisive actions need to be taken in an emergency. 
But the scale of this crisis and the response that's required means we need more transparency and not less. We need more oversight and more debate to make sure that we're making public health decisions that are informed by the best expert health advice, uh, and to make sure that we're targeting funds to those who need them most. This can make sure that we come out the other side of this crisis in the strongest, fairest, most equitable and sustainable position possible. Now, the Greens support the Oversight Committee that was established earlier today, although we're disappointed that our amendments, which would have allowed the Prime Minister and other ministers in the other place uh, to be called, were not supported. But we also believe that Parliament should continue to sit during this crisis, and we've called on the government to find ways to make that happen. Critically, given the limited oversight that's available outside of Parliament, we must make sure that any regulatory actions enabled by these bills are strictly confined. And I'll be moving an amendment to restrict the rulemaking powers given to relevant ministers. The country's response to this crisis will be judged on how well we manage the health risks, but also on how well we helped those who needed help to survive in this difficult period. And whilst we welcome the increase in New Start, now called Job Seeker Allowance, something which my uh, colleague Senator Seawitt has championed for 10 years and which we probably wouldn't have seen happen without the efforts of her and the sector, we will be fighting to make that increase permanent once this pandemic is over. From the outset of this pandemic, we have said that a wage, substance, sub, a wage subsidy was the most equitable way to offer security to the people who were most affected, and we're pleased that the government's finally come around and supported this intent behind the JobKeeper scheme. But we are concerned that those schemes still fail to cover a number of critical and vulnerable sectors of our society—casual workers, migrant workers and international students, people receiving disability support payment and carers uh, payments. And so my colleagues and I will be proposing a number of amendments to plug those holes in the safety net and make sure that no one is left behind. So on casual workers, every job that we're able to keep through this crisis is a job that we don't have to recreate when we get through the other side. When large-scale events were first being shut down, the arts and hospitality industries were the first to ring the alarm bells. They warned that this crisis wouldn't put just their jobs in jeopardy, but risk the stability of their entire industry. Festivals, concerts, musicals and theatre productions have been shut for weeks. These closures have pushed arts workers to the brink, but despite being some of the worst off, they're getting nothing from today's package. We've heard from a flood of people that have been working in the service industry for years, but have been shut out of the support because they've recently moved jobs. By limiting the job seeker and job keeper uh, payments to people who've worked for their current employer for more than a year, the government has shown that they don't understand the modern workforce. If they'd spoken to young people or people who work in hospitality or arts or the tourism industry, they'd know that many industries rely on seasonal and irregular work. Bartenders, tour guides and even teachers are now expected to move through several workplaces and are just as important to the success of a workplace whether they've been there for two months or two years. The arts, hospitality and tourism sectors have high levels of seasonal unemployment and this package has done nothing for them. My colleague will be moving, moving an amendment to address that, and we hope to receive support, although sadly we are not expecting that to occur. Last time we were here, the, Greens, uh, the government made a mistake by refusing to accept the Greens' amendments to include wage and job guarantees in their stimulus legislation. We acknowledge that they now redress that, but today they're making a mistake by leaving over one million casual workers behind. Now, on temporary visas. Over a million people have chosen to make Australia home, um, helping make our country stronger by contributing their skills and paying taxes here. They've been contributing like any other person here, but when they need help, this government has turned their backs on them. Many work in sectors that are essential to our survival during this time—health, age, aged and disability care, agriculture and childcare. The government has made changes to visa arrangements in order to gather a workforce to help our farmers, acknowledging that these visa holders fill a critical workforce gap, but despite this, the government refuses to extend eligibility for JobKeeper to them. Many of these folk are also ineligible for Medicare, and that is a very scary thought during a global pandemic. How does the government think these people will get by? They aren't eligible for any support for being out of work. They can't get any support to stay in work. They've got bills piling up, and with international flights being cancelled across the board, many will find it difficult or impossible to go back home. This isn't just a betrayal of the workers who put their faith in Australia, it's a betrayal of the businesses that choose to employ them. 
If an employer has chosen to employ migrant workers, today the government is punishing them for that decision, and this will particularly harm the service and hospitality industries. Now, universities have also been left out in the cold. Many universities these days rely on a casualised workforce. They're trying, to, trying their best to get through this crisis, but they've been hit for years by declining government funding. They've had their enrolment numbers hit hard through bans on international travel, and they're now being told by the government that their employees aren't worth keeping on. What an insult. Universities are incredibly important and should be protected. They taught the scientists who are working around the clock to find a vaccine and save people's lives. They're not only places of learning, but play a massive role in our communities. Think of the important community radio stations that are run out of universities, of the fact-checking units that keep, out, keep us all accountable, and the contributions that they make to local business and community programs. These institutions will provide a vital recovery op opportunities from this crisis. We're going to need highly skilled workers to pull us out of this recession, and without universities, we're going to find it a lot tougher to find them. Um, now, on charities, under the JobKeeper scheme, charities are only eligible for the subsidy if they estimate that their turnover has fallen by 15 per cent um, relative to a comparable period. And whilst this helps some charities, those that rely on large government grants won't be able to, de to demonstrate the 15 per cent decline in revenue if tied grants are included. That's why my colleague will be moving an amendment to address that. Now, on disability support payment and carers, the COVID-19 supplement has been a welcome relief uh, for many recipients of income support, but two key groups continue to miss out, carers and those on disability support pensions. And yet, the living costs that they face are higher in these self-isolation days. Instead of the extra 550 a fortnight that's allowed so many Australians to be pulled from poverty, many carers and DSP recipients are still living with the threat of eviction, hunger and worrying about keeping the lights on. The Minister for Social Service Services was given extraordinary powers in the last sitting of parliament to extend the supplement to other categories of income support recipients. With the stroke of a pen, she could help uh, DSP recipients and carers survive this crisis, and we Greens urge her to do just that. Now, on renters, housing is a human right. Keeping a roof over people's heads during this crisis is surely the most fundamental thing that we could do. The government can't tell people to stay at home but look the other way when the crisis puts them in a financial situation so tenuous that they don't know if they can pay the rent. The Greens have heard from so many people who have been threatened with eviction by their landlord in the same week that they have also lost their job. We have also heard stories of landlords who have reduced or waived rents, and we commend that. But leaving it to the goodwill of individual landlords is not enough. National Cabinet met yesterday and again failed to come up with a national plan to support tenants. We've had broad aspirational statements, but no legislation from this government. We need a solution. Our Greens colleagues in several state parliaments have secured temporary bans on eviction to give tenants security during this crisis. That's fantastic, but we need a national eviction ban and we need rent holidays for tenants who are struggling to meet payments during this crisis. Now, this crisis has highlighted the extent to which Australia's safety net has been picked away at for 30 years. We've decimated the public health system and the social security system. We've become over-reliant on so-called corporate responsibility, and we've hollowed out the manufacturing sector. That means we weren't as well set up to face this crisis as we could and should have been. In just a few short weeks, we've seen the beginnings of a stimulus that could set us up for better things and play to our collective strengths. We've seen the importance of a strong social safety net, and it's my hope that the structures that we are rapidly rebuilding in this crisis will be retained. It's a chance to think how we want this country to go forward and hope to dream for a better future. We are all in this together, so let's not leave anyone behind. Um, I'll be moving a second reading amendment uh, on sheet 8950, which has been circulated in the chamber in my name, which would ensure that all casuals, people on temporary visas, those in the gig economy and those in universities and charities can uh, fully access JobKeeper. And I want to flag that um, we've heard some statements by the government that they won't be countenancing any amendments. Well, shame on them. That is the job of this parliament, to scrutinise this legislation, to seek to improve it, to make sure that no one is left behind, 
That is precisely what the Greens amendments will be doing today, and we urge folk in the chamber to give them serious consideration and to act on them. If not today, then at least to use those discretionary powers which various ministers have been granted under these laws to close those gaps, to genuinely not leave anyone behind. If we are indeed all in this together, then that's the least we can do. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy President. We're here today to help save Australian jobs, to save Australian households and families, to save the Australian economy and the Australian community. Today is not about catchy names or slogans. It's not about political point scoring or personal backslapping. Today, just like nurses and police, childcare workers and supermarket workers, we're just doing our jobs so Australians can keep theirs. Labor supports this JobKeeper legislation because it is the right thing to do. JobKeeper is a wage subsidy. It's a policy labor, the union movement, the business sector, and many groups in our society argued for long before the government took action. If it weren't for those who called for a wage subsidy for Australian workers, we would not be here today. When asked about a wage subsidy on Sky News on the 27th of March, the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Cormann, ruled it out. Now, just 12 days later, we are legislating a wage subsidy to keep Australians employed. And we are pleased that the government have listened. They have worked cooperatively with the trade union movement. They have listened to the business community. They have listened to the pleas of millions of Australians who are losing their jobs. Our intention throughout this crisis has always been to work constructively with the government to highlight emerging issues and, where possible, suggest solutions. JobKeeper will see a flat wage subsidy of $1,500 a fortnight for six months for employees of businesses that have had a significant revenue downturn. Labor's priority is to protect jobs, to help Australian workers, businesses and families through this difficult time, and to ensure that vulnerable Australians are supported. That's why we will support this legislation and facilitate its passage through the parliament today. We say to Australians, we are on your side because we are all in this fight together. Now, Labor will continue to be supportive, constructive and responsible throughout this crisis and when it comes to addressing both the health and the economic responses. Where Labor has had concerns, we have raised them. We have raised them today about charities, about local government workers, about university workers, about casual workers who've been with their employer less than 12 months, and about temporary visa holders. Indeed, Labor, in the other place, in the House of Representatives, moved a substantive motion to seek to have these workers incorporated in to the JobKeeper program. The government voted against that amendment. The government deliberately voted and opposed to keep those workers outside of the JobKeeper program. Now, I say to those in the crossbench who are going to move amendments later, I understand your desire to do so, but understand this, you are engaging in an exercise in futility with a government that has already made its position crystal clear that it will not support those amendments. And we do not want to see the JobKeeper legislation that will see some six million Australian workers get the direct wage subsidy that they desperately need, the certainty that they need, delivered as soon as possible. We cannot risk engaging in some kind of rep repetitive bounce back around the chambers with a government that has already made clear that it will not support this, these amendments. Now, I want to turn, in my capacity as Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, Immigration and Citizenship, to the issue of temporary visa holders. And let me say right up front, I actually agree with the Prime Minister when he says that the temporary visa holders in Australia should go home during this health crisis. He's right. I'm sure many of those temporary visa holders would like to go home during this crisis. The reality is, for the 1.6 million visa holders in Australia, many of them, I dare say most of them, are not able to go home right now. 
They're not able to go home because borders have been closed. They are not able to go home because international airlines have been shut down. So the reality is most temporary visa holders are now stuck here in Australia. No matter how often the Prime Minister says they should go home, the reality is most of them simply cannot. That means that they are here in Australia during, for the duration of this health crisis. Now, yesterday I had a Zoom call with migrants living in Australia on temporary visas. These are people who have jobs or have recently lost them because of the coronavirus crisis. One of them said to me that they feel like they are currently living through the certainty of the uncertainty. Well, that's what we're all living through right now. We're all facing this crisis together. I want to acknowledge of the 1.6 million visa holders, which that figure includes New Zealanders, the government has, through this package, given 444 visa holders, people from New Zealand, access to JobKeeper. I thank them for that. It is a position Labor has been advocating. But regardless where visa holders have come from or what visa they might be on, these people are members of our community, they're our neighbours, our co-workers, our friends. These people are like you and I. They work hard, they pay taxes, they are building lives and relationships here in Australia. And for 1.1 million of them, they are not eligible for JobKeeper. Many of these people will have been in Australia for years. Some of them will have built their own businesses. And the reality is, this virus is not going to check anyone's visa status before it infects them. All of us in the country are vulnerable to the COVID-19 virus. A survey undertaken by Unions New South Wales of over 5,000 respondents showed that 70% of temporary migrants in Australia are now unemployed as a direct impact of COVID-19. One in two temporary migrants are currently living off savings and expect these to run out within a matter of weeks. A staggering 43% of temporary migrants are already skipping meals on a regular basis. 98.7% of temporary migrants received no form of government support, and only 1.5% had access support from a charitable organization. Now, we acknowledge the government has also uh, listened to another of Labor's requests to give temporary visa holders early access to their superannuation. I acknowledge in the chamber here Senator Hume, the Assistant Minister for Superannuation, who has made this change. It's a position that Stephen Jones, my colleague in the other place, uh, had been advocating. This is not a position Labor would normally advocate for, early access to super, but given the large number of people on temporary visas in Australia and the absence of other support, this is a fair and equitable proposition. But despite these small steps, this is not enough. If the 1.1 million visa holders in Australia who don't have access to JobKeeper, who don't have access to JobSeeker either, are not able to access any form of income support, they're going to be forced to keep working or keep seeking work. They risk homelessness. They risk impoverishment. If they cannot self-isolate, that puts every public health measure we are currently enacting at risk. It is no good the Australian community to be practicing self-isolation if we have over a million people living in the country who cannot self-isolate because they lack the income support or access to medical testing or treatment. We risk prolonging this crisis if we ignore what is happening to over a million people currently living in this community. Now, today's legislation does give the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, broad discretion to expand JobKeeper to other classes of workers by regulation. And I would say this to the Treasurer. It is in our national interest for you to do this. It is in our public health interest for you to expand JobKeeper to temporary uh, migrant workers. The Treasurer will be able to, with a stroke of his pen, make this change. We don't have to recall Parliament. We don't have to have another piece of legislation passed. And this discretionary power is similar to the one given to the Minister for Social Services, Anne Rustin, at the last sitting of Parliament when it came to job seeker. She is able, with the stroke of her pen, to incorporate temporary visa holders into the social services system. So following the passage of this legislation today, the only two people standing in the way of temporary visa holders being able to access support, income support, social services support, are 
the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, and the Minister for Social Services, Anne Rustin. They have been given extraordinary powers by this parliament in this extraordinary and unprecedented crisis, and we encourage them, in the sake of Australia's national interest, to use those powers. Now, migrants, both newly arrived and permanently settled, have stepped up to support the broader Australian community during this crisis. Colombo Social, a Sri Lankan restaurant in Newtown in my state of New South Wales, provides employment for asylum seekers and, and supports their integration into Australia. The restaurant, of course, is now closed, but they're keeping the kitchen open to help feed vulnerable communities in Sydney, providing up to 2,000 meals a day free of charge. I've seen the Sikh community here in Canberra Turbans for Australia, they call themselves, currently on the streets of our capital, delivering hot meals and hampers. And as the immigration minister said himself on the weekend, there are 8,000 skilled medical professionals on temporary visas helping fight the coronavirus on the front line. This includes thousands of international student nurses on visas, as well as nurses on working holiday maker visas who've had their visa requirements relaxed by the government so they can work as nurses after Labour called for this to happen. The irony here is almost grotesque, though. We have thousands of temporary migrants working on the front line of our health system to keep Australians safe and well, safe and well as possible during this COVID-19 crisis. But if those very same temporary migrant workers fell sick themselves, what kind of support would they get from Australia? Would they get income support to self-isolate? Would they get access to Medicare, medical testing and treatment? It is grotesque to consider the fact that we are relying on temporary migrant workers to help us through this crisis, but we are not giving them the support that they need to be part of our community and to be included in the measures we are all taking, the extraordinary measures to keep our community and our economy safe. Now, like so many actions by this government, we have been frustrated that they ha failed to have a comprehensive plan to manage the return of Australians back to this, to this country, those Australians who are stranded overseas, as well as to assist temporary migrants to depart. My colleague Senator Wong has been encouraging the government to deploy Qantas and Virgin to bring Australians stuck overseas back home. I wrote to the Minister for Immigration on the 20th of March to say, what a good idea. Why don't you use the outbound legs of those flights to help temporary migrants have affordable options to depart Australia before the brunt of this crisis hits us? But regrettably, the government has chosen to bury their head in the sand. The Prime Minister, the Minister for Home Affairs, indeed the Minister for Social Services in this chamber today, can cry out that temporary migrants should go home all they like. But when international borders are closed and there are no international airline flights, to tell them they should go home is simply futile. The reality is many of the 1.6 million temporary visa holders in Australia are trapped here. Putting in place a plan to help temporary migrants depart Australia should not be beyond the government, and rescuing Australian citizens trapped overseas should not either, and supporting those people who are trapped here to keep Australians' public health as safe as possible should be a sensible measure this government takes up. I'll conclude on this point, just as Labor is committing to helping all Australians, we're committing to scrut committed to scrutinising the government's response to the COVID-19 crisis. We will do exactly as the, we will do that in the newly established Senate Select Committee chaired by Senator Gallagher to ensure all Australians are being protected during this crisis, indeed that all people in Australia are being protected during this crisis. I look forward to being a member of the committee and working with my colleagues, the crossbench and the opposite, members opposite alike. We're here today because this crisis has ground our economy, our community and our way of life to a halt. Australians are resilient, but at times, they look to their government, they look to their parliament for help. And this is exactly what this package does. The measure of a society is how it treats the most vulnerable in its community. And this package, while it is flawed, will help millions of Australians who are incredibly vulnerable right now. And Labor is very pleased that the government has taken up 
the recommendation to have a direct wage subsidy. This is a significant moment in Australian history. It's a significant move by this government, and we acknowledge it. And it comes after significant lobbying by the Australian trade union movement, the Labor Party, the business community, and civil society. And we're pleased the government have listened. We will continue to work together to fight through these health and economic crises as Australians, because the livelihood and the lives of all Australians depend upon it. And, Madam Acting Deputy President, as I conclude, I foreshadow I will be moving the second reading amendment circulated in my name. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to discuss our people's health and safety, the security of our national economy, and thirdly, our national economic recovery in the near future and the long term, because no one is discussing the key issue and one nation has solutions. I remind people of government's three primary roles, protect life, protect property and protect freedom. Importantly, in democracies, those governing do so only with the permission of the people governed, and those governing are responsible to the people. I will in this speech discuss a former Prime Minister who had, I had respected until I did my research. I want to thank everyone who is caring for us and keeping us safe, including healthcare workers, police, defence, emergency workers, and everyone serving others, including helping to supply and feed us, electricity generation, cleaners, garbage collection, water supply, and many more. Many of us feel gutted that this year will be the first time Anzac Day public commemorations have been called off. This illustrates the seriousness of the threat we face. Firstly, health and safety. This must be every government's primary focus. Now, there is no manual on dealing with COVID-19. So while I empathise with government's challenge, people want answers. People are feeling confused, afraid, concerned. Some feel lost, grieving for those dying and grief for our country. Some feel angry. Many are still living in disbelief. Why? Because people want to know what has to be done, why it has to be done, and how long before it's over. And what will it cost? financial, social, personal, mental, emotional. Remember, we have to pay these bills. People have a right to know the fair dinkum facts, and right now many people are, like me, in the dark or plagued with uncertainty. Two and a half weeks ago, in this place, I praised the success of East Asian nations in combating COVID-19, particularly Taiwan and South Korea. Their focus is on people's health and safety. Both are democracies, and government provides strong, clear leadership. The people trust those governments because they used facts, instituted rigorous widespread testing of body temperature and virus infection, relied on sharing data and had solid processes and systems with medical supplies and facilities. Both those nations quickly arrested the virus and instead of isolating everyone, they quickly and rigorously isolated the infected and the vulnerable, allowing the majority of healthy people to continue working. This is their lesson to us acting decisively to make health their first priority, minimise disturbance to their economies. Western nations, though, have tried to balance health and the economy, and as a result, both have been compromised. Australians are asking serious questions. Why did it take so long for the government to publicly discuss modelling, as it pretended to do so yesterday, yet not release the modelling? Why did the modellers release the draft version separately, yet not to release the model? Why did the government not dis discuss the underlying assumptions, including infection, transmission and mortality rates? Why did the government not discuss the variables modelled? Without that, we can make no conclusions. Why did the government not disclose the modellers' result? Did the government gather data and facts from successful nations like Taiwan and South Korea? And if so, what did it learn? Now, modelling is often flawed, yet in this case, isn't failing to get the data or failing to model acceptance of needless deaths? When did state and federal health ministers last get together to scenario plan the effects and management of a virus pandemic? Have they ever have they considered their interaction with border security and who to allow into our country from planes and ships? Did they involve the hospitals and medical colleges? Data suggests Australia's testing for the virus is narrow and well below the world's best per capita. Why is the government's data on number of cases continually revised with dramatic changes to its graph? Are casualties and deaths from flu and pneumonia here and overseas being reported as from COVID-19? How many people will die with the virus 
compared with how many people die from the virus. In some, nation, uh, some nations, are deaths inflated? What is the government's plan for treatment using hydroxychloroquine, showing amazing results in New York and elsewhere, and ivermectin being 100 per cent effective in Monash University's in vitro tests? What is the plan for mental health issues? Everyday Australians want to know, how long will I be working from home? When can we get back to work and school? When will we be safe from this virus? I now turn to the Chinese Communist government that harmed the Chinese people and people worldwide. It hid the outbreak, suppressed the views of the virus and punished the doctors who wanted to inform and prepare the world. That meant the virus spread rapidly around the world. What will it do now to people in poorer countries, Africa, India? Instead of protecting its people, the Chinese Communist government neglected, controlled and punished them. Worse, in January, the United Nations World Health Organization spread the communist government's lies that there is no human-to-human -human transmission of the virus. Then in March, the UN's World Health Organization said the time to act was two months earlier, in January. The, the World Health Organization, gutless, bumbling, incompetent, hopeless, dishonest, inherently corrupt, just like the whole UN. This virus needs to be renamed the Chinese Communist Party UN virus. The Chinese Communist Party and UN need to be held accountable. Compare the Chinese Communist government with that of Taiwan's democratic government. Taiwan's 24 million people responded freely and, as of today, had just five deaths. Freedom works. Freedom works, providing the government serves the people. With freedom comes responsibility and self-control, always far superior to imposed control. The communists gave us the virus. Democratic Taiwan gave us medical equipment. Now let's turn to our fragile economy. People expect governments to lead and expect leaders to have a plan based on solid data and facts. Economies are living organisms <laughs> comprised of families. Economies depend on human interaction. Isolate people and economies wither. So what is the plan for bringing back our economy? What are the government's trigger points for changing strategy from isolating everyone to wider testing and then isolating only the sick and vulnerable so the healthy majority can return to interacting, producing, exchanging, getting back to work like Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore? The government shutdown is a ticking time bomb. It is necessary, but it is a ticking time bomb. Humanity needs security, connection, family, friends. The worst thing we can do to a person, after all, is take their job off them. I note now, for now rather, that this bill needs to be structured as an open check to the government to ensure the flexibility to support people. Thirdly, this crisis has highlighted a huge gap in our country's security. Shortages of critical equipment like basic medical supplies. Worse, an inability to manufacture medical equipment, cars, many goods that we once made ourselves are now imported. Why? Because the Whitlam Labor government signed the UN's Lima Declaration in 1975 and the Fraser Liberal Nationals government ratified it the very next year to transform manufacturing to third world countries. Worse still, an inability in Australia to grow our own food. We were exporters of basic food commodities like rice and wheat. Now we cannot get enough rice and due to the virus, Vietnam has blocked exports for us to ensure supplies for its own people. Durham wheat for pasta is in shortage. Why? Because the Howard government, under the guidance of Liberal Senator Robert Hill, National's Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson and Liberal Prime Minister John Howard, in 1996 stole farmers' inalienable rights to use the land they bought and, to avoid paying compensation, colluded with Queensland National's Premier Rob Borbidge and, later, Labor's Premier Peter Beattie and with New South Wales Labor's State Minister Bob Carr. Why? For the Howard government to comply with the UN's Kyoto Protocol. The UN. Let's get out. And who buys our farms? The Chinese Communist government, despite banning Australians from buying Chinese properties. Water. What about water? Farmers lost their water as a result of the Turnbull Howard Water Act of 2007 that, according to world-renowned John Briscoe, took the world's best national water policy under the Murray-Darling Basin Commission and made it the worst under the Turnbull-Howard Murray-Darling Basin Authority. How? 
infecting it with politics, UN rules and regulations. The UN exit. This week, yet another farmer, Tanya Ginns in New South Wales, asked, please help us. Help her against the government, the global corporates, the UN. Our own farmers asking for help against the government so she and her family can produce food for our people. And then energy. Never before have humans materially advanced so quickly as in the last 170 years. And it was due to ever decreasing real prices of energy, electricity, oil and gas. The miracle that raised living standards gave us independence from weather and eliminated famines. It gave us longer, healthier, safer, easier, more productive, more comfortable and secure lifestyles. We are the world's second largest exporter of coal and, and largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. Yet we now have high domestic energy costs. In just a few decades, we went from the world's cheapest electricity, thanks to our clean, high energy coal, to the world's most expensive electricity, thanks to the Howard government policies based on the UN lies and fraud. Eight years after John Howard was booted from office, he admitted in Britain that on climate science he was agnostic. He had no science, yet he destroyed all these industries. We now export our coal to China so it can produce cheap electricity because China sensibly uses hydro, coal and nuclear, being the cheapest forms of electricity generation. The Chinese already produce about eight times more coal than it does Australia entirely, and they're rapidly increasing their production. India is furiously increasing its production. Why? Because they know cheap energy is the key to productivity, and productivity is the key to wealth generation, and wealth generation is the key to raising everyone's living standards. At the same time, China exports wind turbines and solar panels to us that wreck our environment and steal our precious farmland. We subsidise Chinese companies to install these inefficient monstrosities that raise our electricity costs, destroy reliability of supply and drive our manufacturers and jobs overseas. Why? In our renewal plans, this must be reviewed and dumped. Mind you, it provides entertainment with Barnaby Joyce and Senator Canavan first speaking clearly as climate sceptics, then contorting and converting to speaking for the UN's climate rort, and now, now backflipping to copy One Nation's stance. Yet although they now speak like us, they still vote, vote like Trent Zimmerman, Zali Stegall and the Greens. Despite Roberts, the recent droughts, Senator Roberts, may I remind you to refer to others in the other place by their correct titles? Thank you, Madam, Madam Deputy President. Despite the recent drought, farmers with water could not afford to pay for electricity to dump irrigation water to pump irrigation water to grow fodder in a drought because of our electricity prices. China and the UN doing this. Exit the UN. Seafood. We have the world's largest continental shelf fishing zone, yet import almost three quarters of the seafood we consume. Why? because we have 36 per cent of the world's marine parks that previous ministers like Lab Labor's Mr Tony Burke and Liberal Senator Robert Hill handed to the UN as World Heritage Areas all now manage under UN rules. And who is our largest supplier of seafood imported? China with its tiny coastline and 56 times more mouths to feed compared to ours. China and the UN. Exit the UN. In Queensland, we have 31 major federal and state policies gutting farming. And as Charleville farmer Dan McDonnell says, with every farm input now completely under regulatory control, farming is nationalised. We have lost our food security, our manufacturing, our farmers' land use, our water, our energy security. We have lost our productive capacity, our ability to produce. We have lost our economic resilience, our ability to rebound. All to globalism in the name of interdependency. The corporate elites benefiting from our bureaucrats' gift of farming land and water and benefit from owning Chinese manufacturing. Interdependency is a con. It means we are dependent on others. We are dependent. This virus crisis is exposing a huge gap in our security, from face masks to food to loss of our independence. We voters have allowed our government since the formation of the UN, especially since 1996, to sacrifice our country's productive capacity, our economic resilience, our economic independence and security. Did you elect UN bureaucrats to be in charge? I didn't. Our national debt now is around 600 billion. Queensland's around 90 billion. Before this package, members of parliament and senior federal public servants need to share the burden, stop the perks like flying business class, cut our superannuation rate, reject or defer salary increases. Let's look to the future. 
What will the world look like after the Prime Minister's quaintly named six-month hibernation? In just three to four months, what will people be doing? Will people emerge from hibernation when we look, we look around? Will we, as a nation, feel supported, excited or depleted, hungry and angry? We need two plans, one for now and one for bringing back our productive capacity and economic resilience. One Nation will return with our, will return with our detailed analysis. When this is over, though, everyday Australians of all backgrounds expect to see and deserve to be a healthy, secure people with a proud, independent Australia that reflects our lifestyle, culture, values, freedom, democracy and potential. All people want is a fair go and governance we can trust to work for our country. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Deputy President. I want to explain what today means for casual workers. Casual workers in sectors like hospitality, where around 80 per cent of the workforce is casual. Last month, as we all know, the hospitality sector essentially shut down in this country overnight. And this is a sector that employs a huge number of Australians, nearly a million workers. It employs permanents as well as casuals, women and men, young and old, people just starting out and people with families to support. It employs Australians and it employs people who've come from overseas to work and study for a few years in the hope of making a better life. And for so many hospo workers, the JobKeeper package is great news. And it is because of the work of the union movement and Labor working together and lobbying for this wage subsidy that hundreds of thousands of workers can have their jobs and their incomes protected in this sector, along with many millions more workers around the country. This bill offers hope. Because of unions and Labor, hundreds of thousands of permanent hospo workers will feel safer in coming months than they feel right now today. And for casual workers who've been with the same employer for 12 months, today's bill offers real hope too. But let's face it, sectors like hospitality have been built on the backs of casual workers and migrant workers for years. And HOSPO is a sector where people move from casual job to casual job to make ends meet. There are, in hospitality, casual workers who've been working in the sector for 5, 10, 15 years, working 30, 40, 50 hours a week and more. They've been supporting themselves and their families on this work, but right now, today, they've been employed with their current employer for less than 12 months. And those workers are excluded from this wage subsidy package, and that is a real shame. With no amendment to this bill to include them, these workers will be left behind. And I'm talking about people like Madison, a casual supervisor in hospitality, who says, as a casual hospo worker, I live week to week. I have no long-term financial stability. I don't know when I'll be able to get a job again. I'm talking about casual hospo workers like Peter, who says, I'm now in the position where I can either pay another week of rent or buy food and other supplies. So not only were casuals the first workers to be laid off in this crisis. Not only were they then told by the government that they should have saved enough on their minimum wage jobs to prepare for this pandemic. Now, over a million casual workers across Australia won't qualify for the government's wage subsidy. And if we want to save jobs in this country through this crisis, we need to accept the reality that one in four Australians are casuals and casual workers need to put food on the table too. They need to pay the rent too. They need to support themselves and their families too. And they need to stay with their employers through this crisis just as much as the next person. And the same goes for hundreds of thousands of temporary migrant workers. Think about the thousands of chefs in Australia who've come here on skilled working visas. Their jobs have been shut down overnight and they don't qualify for the JobKeeper payments. They also don't qualify for Centrelink job seeker payments. How are they meant to survive? How are the hundreds of thousands of international students who came here to work and study in Australia meant to survive? What about the refugees on bridging visas who've lost their jobs or people on working holiday visas who've lost their jobs? 
Many of these workers have absolutely no way of getting home. They have no way to travel back to their home country. They are trapped in Australia. They are here with us in this global pandemic. And these are the people who pick our food on farms across the country. These are the people who make food in our restaurants. These are the people that wash dishes in the back of house in restaurants and cafes. These are the people who deliver food around our cities. And these are the people who are the backbone of life in this country today. And now the government is confirming that they're not eligible for this wage subsidy. And they're not eligible for unemployment benefits either. And according to this government, they should just go home. So this is the message from Scott Morrison to migrant workers in Australia today. We invited you here. We wanted you here to pay your tuition fees. We wanted you here to wash our dishes, to cook our food and to deliver our food. We wanted you here to pay taxes, but now we want you to go home. Go home when you can't get a flight. Go home when borders are closed. Go home when it's not safe to do so. This is not right. It is just not right. And I'm talking about people like Santiago, a hospo worker who's been in Australia for three years. And he said, I've lost my job. This is real. I have to pay rent and I can't go back to my own country. I'm talking about people like Neil, an international student, who said, I am so stressed and I'm so scared. I feel I've got nowhere to go and ask for help. I just want to be treated like other citizens since I've been paying tax and enormous school fees in Australia for over two years. Their situation, like so many other workers around Australia, is dire and they need support now. So let's be clear, workers who are in desperate need today are going to miss out on this wage subsidy. And as the Prime Minister often likes to remind us, Australia is the country of the fair go. Well, these workers are calling on the government to give them a fair go. We're all in this together, so let's stand with them and give them the support that they need. Let's make sure that no worker is left behind. Supporting and, amendments. Deputy President, I foreshadow that I'll be moving the second reading amendment circulated in my name. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, Deputy President. I want to make some opening statements about how we collectively, both as a parliament and a community, respond together to tackle this crisis. It is critical that we are able to act swiftly, clearly, decisively, to do what needs to be done to contain this epidemic and ensure support is available to our Australian community and particularly to those who need it most. But we also need to act well. We have to be both swift and smart, both quick and careful. We do not want to be cutting the wrong corners or rushing critical measures in ways that make them less effective or inclusive. To be very clear, a $130 billion package to keep around 6 million workers connected to employment and to make sure that those who have to be stood down are looked after are better able to bounce back. To ensure that is a very good and very important thing. Our job today is to review this legislation to make it better where necessary, to make sure that it is as effective and as inclusive as possible, to do everything we can in the short time available to us today to improve this package, to make sure that its major benefits are delivered for the health and resilience of Australians and our economy. Anything that we do to make it better is likely to have long-lasting and even lifelong impacts on the prosperity and well-being of Australian workers, businesses and families. We know that this is a huge effort and it has been pulled together in a short space of time. And I think that even the government must surely admit that it is unlikely that it is perfect at this point. In fact, the Australian Greens argue that it's not. Our task tonight is to identify the issues and try, please, to fix them. We need to be asking the right questions and thinking about the big picture so that we can fill in the gaps and include those currently at risk of missing out, because this package does miss out people, the same as the previous package missed out people. We want to deliver the best possible support to Australians and those non-citizens that are here in Australia during this crisis to ensure that our community is healthy and resilient, to make sure no one is left behind, particularly those that need the support the most. 
I'm deeply concerned about large sections of our populations who are being left behind, who are being disproportionately affected by this health and economic crisis. Disability support pension, pensioners and those on carer, carer's allowance are facing significant extra costs at this time, driven by the crisis and their need to self-isolate. This includes costs of food delivery, health care, medical supplies, personal uh, protection equipment, PPE, transport and utility bills. Many services disabled people rely on are being closed or withdrawn, including access to allied health and informal supports, and the uh, options to replace these services are extremely expensive. I've been inundated in my office with messages from people who are trying to exist on the disability support pension and carers. Um, I am, and and uh, I'll quote a couple of the, the things that I've heard from people. I am unable to access any PPE and struggling to find the essentials, meaning more energy sapping running around online. It seems all groceries are full price, barely any specials, which is great for supermarket shareholders but not for us. Having to try and stock up one month in advance for medications with no disposable income is near impossible. It's demoralising not being included in the conversation about COVID-19. I, I still have two kids to care for on my DSP payment. It's not just about me getting more money. I'm raising a family just like those on parenting payment. Why are our children different, uh, children's needs different? I'm paying $15 per delivery and can only purchase two, one or two of each item. That means no more bulk buying to save on delivery costs. Treat disabled people and carers with the same level of dignity as everyone else. I'm a carer with two adult sons with disabilities. We need the extra support or extra help as much as others. And that's just a few of the hundreds of comments that we have received in my office, and I'm sure uh, people around this chamber have received similar messages. The higher rate of job seeker um, payment compared to DSP is leading to perverse outcomes, where people are, have been asking my office whether they should drop off DSP and apply for the job seeker instead. Of course, we say it's not a good idea, but I can totally understand why it is tempting for people to try and do that. Today I'm moving an amendment to provide the uh, coronavirus supplement for, D for those on DSP and carer payment recipients in recognition of the higher costs and significant barriers to entering the workforce that they face. I'm particularly also worried about aged pensions who are renting during this crisis. The evidence shows that older Australians who are renting experience higher rates of poverty and increased risks of homelessness. The current rate of the Commonwealth rent assistance is woefully inadequate at the best of times, let alone during this crisis. We must uh, urgently work together to come up with a solution to uh, support older Australians experiencing rental stress and homelessness. I now turn to the significant uh, problems um, that people have been experiencing with Centrelink. We have, we have been witnessing very significant problems over the last month. Um, what we have been seeing is not just a product of more people needing support, although I admit it plays part of it. Um, the cause is years and years of staffing cuts, funding cuts, IT cuts and bungles and not investing when we needed to, outsourcing and privatisation. When you take money out of the ser service delivery, you are left with a broken system that can't support Australians in their time of need. When, my, when the MyGov system constantly crashes, it causes stress to those applying for income support and hurts people who are already on income support payments. Over the last two weeks, my, offices have received, my office has received countless messages on both uh, phone and online from people who have been unable to report their income to Centrelink. A lot of people ended up receiving the whole rate of uh, job seeker because they were unable to report their income. And these people are very worried that they're now going to be hit with debts. I understand they won't be pursued by Centrelink, but I ask the Minister for Social Services to guarantee these people won't receive debts. The government has extended the suspension to mutual obligation requirements until the 27th of April, and people are very pleased about this. But we need to make sure that they are in fact suspended for the whole of the duration of this crisis. The government must prioritise the health and safety of all people on income support payments and employment service providers. It's not safe for people to be attending meetings and appointments, and I don't expect 
this to change over the next three weeks. At this time of great uncertainty and anxiety, people in income support deserve clarity around their responsibilities. There are thousands of asylum seekers and refugees with no income safety net. They don't have access to Medicare, Centrelink or other critical care services. Without support, they will be exposed to the worst economic and health impacts of this crisis. In recognising this, I am moving an amendment today to extend eligibility for the job seeker payment to temporary visa holders within the meaning of the Migration Act of 1958. I, seek, uh, and I also seek leave, um, which I understand um, the, both the government and the opposition agree to, to table uh, a petition from the Asylum, Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, which has 20,528 signatures asking for the government to include emergency measures to protect people seeking asylum and uh, refugees. So I table um, that. Um, I also foreshadow that I'll be moving a second reading amendment uh, calling for support for um, access to uh, the, corona the supplement. Um, I'll be moving a second reading amendment um, to address the issue of people who are being left uh, behind. I want to address the issue of employment service because I've just addressed the issue of mutual obligations and wanted to extend that. Um, I think there's still a critical role for employment service providers. Um, they, they will play an important role during this crisis. While the package is an important, important step forward, the job keeper, pe keeper package is an important step forward, it is, it is likely that there will still be millions of Australians who still face unemployment. Now is the time for a new approach to helping people to find and maintain connection to work. We want to see the compliance process removed from the system. Employment providers need to start providing individualised, responsive and tailored supports to people. It is time for providers to play that connecting role um, to, identify, to support and identify emerging opportunities and connect people, to support people through outreach and other community support. So they still have a very important role to play. Casuals employed under 12 months and part-timers are uh, missing out through this package. They are another group that's being left behind. The rules re uh, requiring casuals to be employed for longer than 12 months will unfairly penalise people with a large uh, cross-section um, across a large cross-section of our society. Yesterday, I heard from a part pensioner who was undertaking casual work in hospitality to help pay the bills. He was recently stood down from his job and he is not eligible for JobKeeper because he was employed for less than 12 months. Short-term casuals make up an important part of our workforce and should not be excluded from this package. I would like to draw the attention of the Senate to the COVID-19 data insight series produced by the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre. Um, they have done a series of reports and part of the work they have done highlights that short-term casuals com contribute an average over 50, on average over 50 per cent of total earned household income in the, income in the households in which those casuals are part of. The majority of short-term casuals are employed in key industries including food services, retail trade, health care and social assistance. They deserve our help. It is a concern that at the moment we have been unable to find out whether part-time workers who are on the flat rate of 750 will, could be forced to work additional hours um, by their employers. We have been seeking that information and to date that, uh, the information has not be, been um, forthcoming. I will be moving an amendment in the Committee of the Whole around that particular issue. I want to go to the critical role that charities play in our community and particularly during the crisis we are facing. Under the JobKeeper scheme, charities are only eligible for the subsidy if they estimate their turnover has fallen by 15 per cent of more relative, or more relative to a comparable period. Many charities largely rely on government grants and contracts, which means they don't meet this threshold. This is a grossly unfair as charities are suffering major losses of income from a decline in fundraising, donations and volunteer capacity. At the same time, our charities are supporting us through this crisis and experiencing an increase in demand for their services. 
Businesses that, make up, that are made up of sub-entities are having their revenue measured at the sub-entity level. Why can't charities also be assessed at a discrete service level, for example, childcare, disability support, op shops, where they are seeing huge downturns in income? This is why I uh, will be moving an amendment again in the uh, Committee of the Whole to ensure that the revenue test for charities excludes government grants and includes income from donations, investments and other areas. I'm also asking for charities revenue, the charities revenue to be uh, assessed as discrete at the discrete service level instead of the whole entity. This is absolutely critical, and I acknowledge that some improvements have been made for charities in terms of the 15 per cent. But like I said at the beginning, let's not rush this through without actually looking at the fact that you could improve this to get a much better outcome for charities. This is a crisis that we all face. We don't want to be leaving people behind. I will acknowledge, and I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge, that over the last couple of weeks, whenever I have reached out to try and help people, reached out to the government and to ministers, they have been responsive. I do appreciate that collaboration and cooperation to solve the problems that people are facing. But right here and now, we are facing the fact that we are leaving so many people behind, those with disabilities, carers, age pensioners who are renting, those age pensioners that are part pensioners, so many casuals, a million casuals being left behind because they don't make up the 12 months, and they are playing a critical role in delivering services or could be playing a, uh, such a role in delivering services. I think I brought that thing. I'd like to end on please encouraging every Australian to make sure where they can, because I know we'll, our health workers who are doing such an amazing job will be out there working. But if you don't have to work, if you're not working supporting people in our community, stay home this Easter. I know it'll be tempting to go out and try and see your families, but stay home, think of your families, Skype them, Zoom them, and save up your hugs, because we will get through this, which is why we want to see these amendments made, so we get through it, taking everybody with us. Senator Shelton. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I've been a proud member of the trade union movement uh, for over 40 years. And time after time, this movement has backed the working men and women of this country. The work has been done over the last few weeks by unions and the Labor Party to fight for every working person and their family in our country has been nothing short of phenomenal. Sally McManus, Michelle O'Neill, the leaders of the unions across the country have joined with Labor leadership, including Anthony Albanese, Christina Keneally, Tony Burke, Linda Burney and others to stand up for all Australians. My message to the working people of Australia, especially to younger workers, is that you're not on your own. And you're, you're not have to, you do not have to be at the mercy of the market, mercy of whatever the market will bear. But when you're a union member, you'll never be alone. Come war, economic downturn, global crisis or pandemic, the members of unions and the entire community are going to receive benefits from this hard struggle to make sure this proposal for extra support for our communities goes ahead. And I'd also like to congratulate the, the, the government for buckling under the logic, and they finally saw it, that what Labor and the trade union movement, civil society and corporations have been saying now for many weeks. The support that's being delivered and the proposal is because of so many Australians standing up. As a proud member of the Labor caucus, I've come to this place with the same aim as many of us in here, whether Labor or anywhere else. In the case of Labor, we've also come here with the desire to make sure that working people in Australia maintain their connection to their employer so that they're in the best place to support themselves and their families until the global health crisis is over. The coronavirus pandemic does not discriminate based on who you are. It does not discriminate on whether your employer is big or small. 
It does not care if you work for the government, the private or not-for-profit sector. It does not care if you are full-time or casual, or if you have one employer for the last year, or more than one. It does not care if you are an Australian citizen, permanent resident or visa holder working here in Australia. To be a victim of the economic crisis brought on by COVID-19, you just have to be a worker, full stop. And if you're a worker, you deserve not to be sent to the Centrelink queues, made worse by the underfunding of this vital service and the cutting of Centrelink staff by this government. If you're a worker, you deserve to have a wage subsidy that you stay connected to your employer and together you can ride out this crisis. When Scott Morrison says, we are all in this together, what he really means is this. Except if you're a casual worker with less than 12 months. Except if you're a worker for a local council. Except if you're a worker in the arts and entertainment sector. Except if you're a worker in the disability support services. Except if you're a worker for a charity that is not covered by the current JobKeeper package. And this includes private schools and universities. They were initially told they would be included with other not-for-profits at the 15 per cent threshold for loss of revenue, only to be told that they would be treated like other businesses when they are clearly not like other businesses. Hundreds of thousands of school university staff, including casual workers, are facing job losses, but that will not be eligible for this job keeper payment. And finally, the Prime Minister seems to think that we all are in this together. And we are, because we're all victims. But are we all in it together? Because if you're a worker that's a visa holder, you're not included. Hundreds of thousands of visa holders, including international students who have paid fees to our universities, have been left out of this rescue package altogether. Acting Deputy President. I also want to foreshadow that I'll be moving the second reading amendment circulated in my name. In that, we'll be calling on the government to ensure that JobKeeper wage subsidy is only used by employers to pay their employees' wages and not to subsidise their company's balance sheet, noting there will be no provision for business to force employees to use their annual leave. Entitlements and pay for that leave with a JobKeeper wage subsidy. And I look at a particular example of Qantas. They've told very clearly to tens of thousands of workers money that they have contributed as workers in their entitlements, that they have to take those entitlements and that company will be still receiving the $1,500 that was intended for them. But don't worry, Qantas has got it covered. They've actually made a decision that they are going to pay dividends to their shareholders in September. So not only did we see these hundreds of millions of dollars in less taxes being paid for aviation costs, we're now seeing the $1,500 that's supposed to be going to their workforce being used to line their own pockets and the pockets of shareholders, which this money was not intended for. Recognize, we should need to recognise that the Australian arts and entertainment sector needs a specific tailored fiscal response package to ensure its ongoing viability, given the structure of the JobKeeper payment has been designed in a way that leaves many workers in this sector ineligible. A multi-billion dollar industry, the heart of our culture within Australia, the important rebound, not for just mental health, which is critical, but for economic health of this country, and yet the government has left them swinging. They won't get support. It's important that we extend the 15 per cent reduction in turnover threshold to all national disability insurance schemes and disability, NDIS, employment service providers, DES, and deliver a retention and support package for the disability sector workforce. Some of the most vulnerable people in our community and vulnerable organisations that deliver those services that are so critical to our civil society. 
could also call on for more support to, for staff in schools, TAFE and universities affected by the crisis, noting that hundreds of thousands of school and university staff, including casual workers, are facing job losses but will not be eligible for the JobKeeper payment. And the government should be saving jobs and make sure Australia has a strong and sustainable education and training sector on the other side of this crisis. We need to have that bump when we move out. We need to have that capacity to rebuild economically. We need to have the foundations, and yet the government has deserted these people. Casual workers working from for school to school, not included, educating our children, the people that are so critical to be connected connected to our schools and connected to our education system. And we also call on the government to recognise the importance of the local government, acknowledging that closures of council facilities has resulted in significant revenue loss and workers being stood down and without support. Up to 45,000 local government workers could lose their jobs, demonstrating the need for the government to work together with state governments to address these important issues. And in the Prime Minister's own electorate, my own uh, place where I spent my childhood, Sutherland Shire, 330 people, his own community, have lost their jobs because they're casuals working for the local council at Sutherland Shire. What's he doing for his residents, those 330 residents those 330 families, those 330 individuals need the support of the government. They need not to be exceptions, but they need to be part of the rule. We've seen examples, of course, on the reach outs, what could be done with local council. And I make this particular plea. Council areas, and two particular council areas, in a number of council areas in some of my duty electorates in New South Wales. Clare and Lyne, Bathurst, Blaney, Lithgow, Oberon, Orange Councils, the list goes on, Lyne, Mid-Coast Mid Council, Port Macquarie, Hastings, Dungog, parts of Port Stephens. Port Stephens. These councils do not have the capacity to turn around and survive the jobs and keep them critically employed as major employment hubs within those communities. It's essential that government acts for regional Australia, hit by bushfires, hit by the drought, and now hit by coronavirus and lack of government action. It's critically important, as in significant as this change is, and congratulations to civil society and corporations for joining the labour movement, joining the union movement, and to the government finally coming to the table. But millions upon millions of people left out are millions and millions of people deserted in our local councils, in our arts and entertainment industry, right across our very important areas in the NDIS and charities, right across the areas of visa holders and the many other people that are affected as a result of these circumstances that we now find ourselves in. There are three particular you know, examples, and I gave this, this example in Sutherland Shire, and I plead to the Prime Minister to reconsider his position on local government and, this, and his parties. In the Prime Minister's electorate of Cook, the Sutherland Shire, for more than five years, Sally, it's not her real name, for the council, works at the council leisure centres. She was sacked last week and is one of 330 workers some who have worked in the Southern Shire for five and ten years. She is not eligible, she is not eligible for JobKeeper, nor any council workers in Australia. Gig economy sole trade is an important question to be raised with the government. I'd be keen to hear the, the minister's comments on this. The government's options for self-employed business people also leaves a lot to, to be desired. For example, it is not clear how a family partnership, like those used in small trucking companies, would work. Right now, partnerships where multiple partners are active business partner, par participants, they are limited to a single 
JobKeeper payment. They cannot claim two, for example, in the case of husband and wife trucking company. Visa holder, holders and international students. The visa holder I've had the uh, joy of my office speaking to, Xu He, is a 23-year-old international student visa holder in Sydney. He has paid nearly $100,000 in fees to the, an Australian university and is in his final year of his degree. He, is, he has supported himself and his wife and baby as a rideshare and food delivery worker for nearly three years, delivering food and people during this critical time, putting himself exposed to make sure he can support his family. Well, rideshare is certainly drying up. He's working 20 hours a, he'd been working 20 hours a week. He's paid for his own health insurance, as required by his visa, and he's never asked for any money from anyone, certainly from the Australian taxpayer. Now, through no fault of his own, Shuhil is sick and has been advised by his GP to self-isolate. He now must choose between feeding his family and paying his rent or trying to work when there is a massive drop-off in work. Shuhil says he does not want to ask for help, but his parents in Bangladesh have also lost their jobs and cannot afford to get home for him to get home safely. He just wants his family to be safe and for him to be able to finish the degree he paid for. He's not eligible as a job seeker or a job keeper. It's critically important that we remember that the minister, the welfare minister, uh, Rustin, has the capacity to make changes. It's very important to know that the treasurer has the power to make further changes beyond the propositions being put today. And I say this to every Australian, I say this to every working person and the two million that have been left out. And I say to the millions of others that care so much about a fair go, make sure that two million other people living in this country, working hard and paying their taxes, also get a fair go. Senator Patrick. Madam Acting Deputy President, it is a great truism that, as a British Prime Minister once said, a week is a long time in politics. But my, how time flies when you're in the midst of a pandemic. Everyone is a bit punch uh, drunk by the speed with which COVID, this COVID-19 outbreak has spanned the globe and by the appalling human toll the disease has already had. It was only over two and a half months ago that the Australian government was beginning to react to the news of, coron of a coronavirus epidemic in China. On the 23rd of January, some weeks after the first report of the virus outbreak, the government moved to apply a biosecurity screening uh, to direct flights uh, to Australia from Wuhan, the epicentre of the disease. However, those flights immediately ceased because the Chinese government imposed a blanket quarantine on Wuhan and the Hubei uh, province with no flights in or out. Although the epidemic had already spread across China, flights from other parts of the People's Republic of, uh, of, of uh, um, China continued, some 40 flights a day to Australia at that time, including flights from Hong Kong. A week later, from 1 February, the Australian government banned the entry of foreign nationals who had been in China for two weeks prior to arrival in Australia. Australian citizens arriving from China were also asked to self-quarantine. At that point, the Prime Minister was insistent that Australia was well ahead of the game. He expressed confidence that the uh, consequence here would be modest, saying, and I quote, we're a big country and the people should go, away, go about their business in the normal way. In talking points issued to coalition MPs and senators on the 4th of February, the government focused uh, on, on its desire to further lower taxes, expand trade and keep the budget strong. It was business as normal. With regard to coronavirus, the government declared, Australia is ready. How ready were we? I think that the answer that, to, to that question is that we weren't very ready at all. I don't make that, uh, that uh, point as a, uh, observation as a partisan point. Uh, we do now have the benefit of some hindsight. But it is the case that the pandemic risk really hasn't received the attention it deserved. Governments 
uh, didn't properly manage the risk nor adequately plan for something that numerous health experts and even the likes of Bill Gates had, had warned was inevitable. Successive Australian governments were well aware of the risk of pandemic, whether a new form of influenza or another disease such uh, as is the case with COVID-19, and broad plans had been drawn up following the SARS outbreak of 2002 to 2004. But we failed to flesh out those plans. They were left as very high-level frameworks. We failed repeatedly to test them, and we failed to develop our understanding of the likely economic impacts of the measures that would be required to slow and reduce the human toll of a pandemic. The only full-scale national pan uh, pandemic exercise was Cumston 06, which tested a short-term government response to a, no a novel influenza virus pandemic, and Sustain 08, which explored maintaining a whole-of-government response over an extended period. These two exercises, which were conducted on a whole-of-government basis and fully involved states and territories, were held 14 and 16 years ago. That's right, a decade and a half ago. Although some smaller tabletop uh, uh, exercises have been carried out since within the health and home affairs portfolio, and some uh, response capabilities were uh, tested with uh, the 2009 H1N1 influenza break, uh, outbreak, pandemic planning and preparation faded. It was well and truly relegated to the back burner. If anyone doubts this, they only need to look at the government's response to the one recent parliamentary uh, committee report on these issues. In March 2013, the House of Representatives, uh, a, a committee, tabled a report entitled Diseases Have No Borders, a detailed examination of health issues across international borders. The terms of reference for that inquiry noted that, and I quote, Growing global interconnectedness and close proximity to regional neighbours increases Australia's exposure to imported infectious diseases and to the risk of epidemic or pandemic disease outbreaks. The committee made a number of recommendations aimed at improving, improving Australia's ability to respond to international disease outbreaks, including that the Australian uh, government undertake a large-scale pandemic exercise uh, across relevant uh, Commonwealth, state and territory uh, government agencies. Senators will be familiar with the long delays uh, before government responses to committee reports. We've all seen that. Um, uh, and in this case, it was no different. There was a federal election, a change of government in 2013. Um, that said, it is a disgraceful fact that it took the current government one month short of five years that is until August 2018, to respond to that committee report. The government's uh, response eventually, uh, did eventually come and included some inf uh, useful information, but a five-year delay was inexcusable and demonstrated a clear failure to properly prioritise a vital public health issue. Had the government engaged properly, had the government planned in greater depth and exercised to explore all aspects of, a potential, of potential scenarios, then we might not have been forced into the extraordinary improvisation of the past two months. Back in early February, by its own admission, the government had no idea what the economic impact would be. The Treasurer said it was impossible to say what the economic consequences would be, but it should have been possible even then to model the likely impacts of border closures, quarantine and the shutdown of many industries and social distancing. Some people, including myself, have compared the current challenges to those of a war. The problem is that uh, if this is the equivalence of a war, then the government has gotten, uh, had no real mobilisation plan. It's all been improvisation. It's all been improvisation, vast improvisation certainly, but imp improvisation nonetheless. Had government engaged in proper preparation and planning, uh, they would not be scrambling now as they are to gather information on the ability of Australian companies to supply uh, personal protective equipment and the ingredients for a COVID-19 testing kit. In saying that, I don't wish to be overly critical or to take unfair advantage of hindsight. The government does reserve, deserve credit for its response to the pandemic and for the extraordinary budget measures it has brought to the parliament. But it should not have been flying quite so blind. 
and it should certainly not be unmoored from parliamentary oversight and accountability. Before the uh, Senate today, we have the framework for the government's $130 billion go uh, JobKeeper wage rescue plan to support some six million Australians. This is an enormous commitment over the next six months. It is an extraordinary measure uh, to deal with an unprecedented shutdown of a large portion of our economy, something that will inevitably lead to a recession, likely a severe recession, perhaps even a depression. Among uh, specific measures before us is the Coronavirus Economic Response Package, uh, package in brackets Payments and Benefits Bill, the framework for the creation and implementation of the JobKeeper payment. The payment is a sensible response uh, to assist employees to retain staff and for employees to retain uh, a job as part of the, uh, the economy is forced into hibernation. However, the framework removes the ability for the parliament to really make sure this economic response package is fully inclusive. It spectacularly fails at being fully in in inclusive. It misses out in supporting fundamentally in important industries and workers. A few examples. The Australian agricultural industry relies heavily on migrant workers to pick our seasonal fruit for both export and local markets. With the picking season commencing in autumn and continuing to summer, it is a long uh, season of steady work. Migrant workers on temporary visas are not included. So the moment, at the moment they, they are in limbo. They can't work, they can't go home and their finances are quickly running low. Also locked out from the financial support uh, are those uh, people who have come here seeking a fair go. In the true spirit of the Prime Minister's mantra, if you're having a go, you'll get a go, he says. There's a local cafe owner in Adelaide. His cafe is running a family affair that's been highly successful for over four years, almost five. And as a law-abiding person, he's tried to alter his dine-in cafe to a takeaway, but it just wasn't doing well and he's had to close the doors, lay off his staff, and because he's on a temporary visa, he doesn't meet the requirements for JobKeeper. He wants and intends to reopen. He just can't uh, keep it open for now. Where's the fair go for him? What about casual workers with less than 12 months of employment? Where's their fair go? Centre Alliance's amendments, and I foreshadow moving two amendments, will extend the JobKeeper payment to, temporary to tem the temporary workforce whether that these are migrants or casuals, with three months employment. The Prime Minister says his aim is to get as many people and businesses over the bridge to the other side. He should ensure no one is left behind to fend for themselves. Right now we are in this struggle together and we need to get through to the recovery phase together. <clears throat> Those concerns aside, um, uh, these are without, doubts, without doubt vital measures. They are the economic equivalent of an oxygen tent. The big question to come will be how sustainable uh, uh, such measures will be and what will follow them. The pandemic modelling released by the government yesterday leaves no doubt that in the absence of a vaccine or effective therapeutic treatment, we are in this for the long haul. It's not just the peak of the uh, ep epidemic curve that counts, it's also the breadth of the curve that, that uh, plays a critical part in this. Continued border controls, quarantine, isolation, a significant level of social distancing with con uh, consequent restrictions on our economy and on many people's livelihoods are likely to be of lengthy duration. They will likely extend well beyond the six-month time frame the government is presently working to. The Prime Minister acknowledged this issue at his press conference yesterday, but the government is only starting to come uh, to grips with this wicked problem. In the months to come, the Senate, through the Senate uh, Select Committee on COVID-19, will need to keep a very close eye on the evolution of the government's response. We will need to conduct um, uh, that scrutiny in a fair, open and non-partisan way. Open-minded, I should say. Um, but we will also need to pursue that oversight duty with absolute rigour and a preparedness to test the fundamentals of government policy and action. 
We, we, we will need to look very closely at all aspects of the government's response so far with the benefit of hindsight, because that's how lessons are learned. We will need to pay uh, very close attention to future steps, especially those critical decisions about how to move our economy out of hibernation without sparking new epidemic flare-ups. Rigorous oversight will be absolutely critical in relation to what may be very contra controversial government decisions. Meantime, I would conclude my remarks by again reminding the Senate and listeners how time flies in these extraordinary circumstances. Only four weeks ago, the Prime Minister was still actively encouraging people to go to the footy. Now, social distancing rules ban non-essential gatherings of more than two people. There will, there will be in a, where will we be in another month's time, in six months' time, in a year's time? No one can be sure, but all Australians listening to this debate should be assured one way or another the Senate will be here and uh, they will be, uh, we'll be doing our duty to help out. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy. President, first of all, I would like to acknowledge all of those Australians who are currently going out to work. Whether it's in this place or elsewhere across the country, thank you for the service that you are providing. It's very hard with the stay-home messages, but I do want to acknowledge and thank um, those workers leaving their homes each day and doing work. I'd also like to acknowledge many of those are members of my union, United Workers Union, and uh, I say a special thank you to them. I then want to congratulate the government on this bill for taking the advice of Labor and for implementing what's become known as this job seeker, job keeper package. Um, for many workers, we know it will be a lifeline and it will enable them to keep vital connections with their employer and be ready to play a part in Australian, getting Australia working again once we're through this COVID-19 pandemic. But this legislation does not go far enough. Most working people are already doing it tough. Before the pandemic, they had not seen their wages rise, they were stagnating or they had no wage increases at all. Many were part-time workers with second or third jobs working to make ends meet. Australians were experiencing mortgage and rent stress. These issues haven't gone away. They're still there. And for some of them, this JobKeeper package will be a lifeline. But for those who miss out, many millions, um, the government has deserted them in their moment of need. And I just want to talk about them. You've heard Labor senators in this place talk about the million casual workers who will miss out on this package. We can't allow that. Some of those workers are Labor hire staff. Many of those workers are women and young people. We've also got visa workers or international students. We've got local government employees who are not eligible for the JobKeeper scheme, and as we move through the next week, more and more will be identified. WA's largest employer, Crown Casino, directed by the government, closed its doors overnight. It threw out its many casuals, many of whom will not be eligible for JobKeeper, and its many international students. Those are the people we need to be looking after uh, into the future. They've been left without an income, totally without an income. We don't want to create a situation in this country where casual workers go to work sick because they have no other alternative. That's dangerous and it's irresponsible. I want to talk about aged care workers who've also been hit. They're low income. They're part time. They're predominantly women workers. Many work second jobs to make ends meet. Now they're in a double jeopardy because for many of those women, their second job is with an agency, commonly referred to as a labour hire company. Well, guess what? They're not eligible for JobKeeper either. And not only that, they've been directed by their employers because they're working in a vulnerable sector that they can only have one job, and that's the aged care. Um, work that they're currently doing. And I'm glad the minister's in here at the moment because that's what employers have be, are being told in Western Australia. Uh, and I'm sure we can get you examples if you're interested. 
And so we see these workers now have their income halved overnight. These are the workers the Prime Minister has thanked for their service, and yet he has not looked after them because they now are without their second job because the employers see that second job as too risky and have said to them, if you want to continue working here in aged care, you have to give up that second job. And that second job is with a labour hire company where they will be excluded from the job keep keeper package. The very workers the Prime Minister has stood up and thanked for their service. Well, he's not taking care of them. They're taking care of the most vulnerable in our community, but the Prime Minister has clearly let them down. This could be fixed overnight. This could be fixed with the flick of a pen by the Treasurer, Mr Josh Frydenberg. So we know many workers are making sacrifices. Security guards at the airport in Western Australia have lost 80 per cent. 80 per cent of their hours. Imagine that. 80 per cent. What that does to, again, low-income workers. And they are probably not going to qualify for JobKeeper because they work for very large multinational companies who won't be able to demonstrate that they've um, made the required loss to enable that, them to get into the JobKeeper uh, line. So these are workers who, again, are on the front line, who are at work right now, but they've lost 80 per cent of their hours. Um, and employers are also asking full-time workers to try and keep workers employed to share out their hours. So someone who was full-time is now being asked to go part-time uh, with unended contracts for who knows when, for who knows how long. This is clearly not fair. Last week, I spoke to many councils in WA. I've got to tell you that councils are absolutely pulling their weight. They are checking on the most, most vulnerable in our community. They are redirecting staff to go and work for Red Cross. They are offering staff to the WA government to put on COVID helplines, and yet they are not eligible for this scheme. They are freezing their rates. I spoke to one council in WA, one of our largest councils in WA, who was more than happy to pull their weight, more than happy to pull their weight, more than happy to freeze their rates. 89 million in lost revenues for that council. And not only that, just from the rate losses, they've also been asked that they've closed their revenue raises, their gyms and their pools. So they're losing already more money on top of that, and yet they are not eligible. Walga in WA, the local government association, says in WA it represents about 6,000 workers being stood down, 6,000 workers with no access to JobKeeper. Now, it is the government really does need to fix this. Mr Frydenberg needs to fix it for aged care workers, the workers that get thanked almost daily uh, by the Prime Minister who are putting themselves at risk. Mr Frydenberg needs to fix it for long day care. He needs to fix it uh, for family day care. He needs to fix it for local government. He needs to fix it for security, and the list goes on. Yes, it's a good start, but it's not good enough because too many Australians are being left vulnerable, left with no money, forced to work when they're sick. This is not fair. Uh, it's a risk to all of us to have workers out there working who are clearly unwell. And I urge Mr Frydenberg tonight or tomorrow to fix this for those millions of workers who are currently not eligible for JobKeeper. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Can I say I'm glad to be here tonight at doing my job? And we should be doing this regularly through this crisis. My party feels this deeply. The Greens have been on record consistently raising the issue that parliament should continue to sit through to August. We heard today from the government that this economic package is the biggest, most important piece of legislation since the Second World War. And while we find ourselves in dangerous, uncharted waters that require all political parties to work together for the good of the nation, the powers and discretion given to this government over the period of this pandemic are also unparalleled in recent history and need to be watched closely. Decisions need to be questioned constantly, if not respectfully and professionally. That is our job as senators. All governments, including state governments, need to answer reasonable questions and requests for information and provide full 
transparency. I'd like to note up front the hard-working public servants here in Canberra and abroad who have worked tirelessly around the clock to bring this legislation before us tonight. Up to those workers, staffers in Treasury, the Attorney General's Department and so many other portfolio areas of government, a big thanks and shout out to you all. In my books, you're as much of a hero as anyone else in this country. I'm also glad to be here tonight at this historical emergency sitting because over recent weeks, indeed the past month, I have lived and breathed stimulus packages, especially in relation to helping small business and their workers. And it's finally happening tonight. It's far from perfect, but we are all in a much better place than we were even a few weeks ago. And I've literally lived it and breathed it because I've mostly been staying at home like so many other Tasmanians and Australians, and I watched my wife and her business partners spend hour after hour, day after day, on Zoom, on the phone, working through this pandemic, talking to their dozens of employees, agonising over shutting down or staying open, lengthy landlord discussions, exchanges with the banks on interest rates and loans, and lastly, seeking advice on eligibility and how to use both the job seeker and the job keeper packages. Day in, day out, I've watched it unfold in real life and in real time, and I know just how hard it's been for many small business owners. Um, Mr President, the Greens called for a job wage guarantee from the start. We worked out very early the first two small business packages were not going to be anywhere near enough. And indeed, they were the wrong approach. I said this nearly three weeks ago. I've seen and worked through a number of crises in my life, as I'm sure have many other senators in this chamber. The GFC, stock market crashes, and my family and I lived through SARS up in Hong Kong. I understood early that this crisis required everything to be on the table, a whatever-it-takes approach to see us all through. And I mean all of us, not just the lucky few. We said this was mostly a crisis of confidence that required solutions immediately to restore trust. Because ultimately, if you want a pandemic to not be a panic, you need to provide certainty and restore trust in government, in community, in our laws, in our economy, but most importantly, in people's futures. And of course, this can only be done by governments. At first, your government didn't listen to calls for a wage guarantee, but ultimately I'm glad you did. And to the small business groups, to the unions uh, and to the opposition, uh, including of course the Greens, uh, we finally got a wages -style guarantee, UK wages style guarantee. As I've experienced in this crisis firsthand at home for many small business owners and their workers, I've also reached out to small business groups, organisations and communities themselves. I've talked to employees who are uncertain what this all meant for them. Many, many employees. I've asked for input, for feedback. Consistent messages have arisen, which I promise to take to Canberra. I'm deeply concerned today that after fighting so hard to get a wages guarantee in this place, I've had so much feedback that too many small businesses aren't getting on board with JobKeeper. Too much hesitancy. It's too hard, too complex. It carries too much risk. The Greens have been inundated by small business owners and their workers contacting us for help and guidance. I'm increasingly concerned that we're not going to see the huge uptake in this payment that we might expect. As a Tasmanian senator, this is of the utmost concern to me, as small business literally is the backbone of my state. Early res survey results in a very hard-hit industry as in tourism and hospitality, suggests that a third of eligible businesses are not applying or had hesitancy in applying for this scheme, perhaps more. The question is why and what can we do about it tonight? Many of the stories are all the same. I've already laid off workers, stood them down, shut down, I've closed my doors. I've dealt with that grief and that frustration. I can't stay afloat any longer. This package carries too much risk for us. Many rely on casual workers and visa holders in a state like Tasmania, 
many of whom will not be eligible for the payment. The single biggest factor is that waiting for the payment to come through in May is not an option for many small businesses that have no revenue, no savings and have their doors closed. There simply isn't the money for them to pay their workers in the next month, and I will be introducing a substantive amendment in committee stage to try and rectify that. According to the ABS, half of our businesses have already let go staff or cut hours due to COVID-19. A business confidence survey from the Tourist, Tourism Industry Council Tasmania showed 75 per cent of respondents 75 per cent had to suspend business operations in Tasmania until restrictions ease. That's three quarters of Tasmanian tourism businesses, and 80 per cent had to reduce staffing levels. My home state has been hit particularly hard by COVID-19, and it is highly leveraged to tourism and hospitality. I've heard numerous stories that business who have closed their doors have no revenue and no cash flow and have lost hope. Uh, this is a consistent criticism that we have received from small business around the country, and I look forward to bringing that amendment in committee stage to try and fix that. Now, we've heard a lot of talk in here tonight, uh, for, especially from the Labor Party and the Greens, about problems with this legislation that leaves too many people left out. Unions Tasmania have said that nearly 24,000 casual workers in our state will not be eligible for JobKeeper payments because they have been with their employer for less than 12 months. How many of them will be let go and forced into Centrelink lines? It looks like nearly all of them. The decision to exclude casuals with less than 12 months' employment is not an economic decision, in my opinion. It is purely a political one and a foolish one. It's simply penny-pinching at a time when everyone should be treated equally, all workers, all industries. Universities. Universities Australia warned the sector could lose more than 21,000 jobs in the next six months. 21,000 Australians who don't know if they're going to have a job when we get through COVID-19. Why not give them certainty? We know that many people who work at universities are employed on a casual basis. Way too many. This casualisation trend has been, or cancer in many people's minds, has been occurring for far too long. And they are the second biggest, if not the biggest, employer in my home state of Tasmania, particularly in places like Launceston, where I'm based. And then, of course, there's local government employees, which we've also heard a lot about in here tonight. One of the challenges after this legislation hearing tonight and this sitting is to come up with a package to help local government casual employees who have also been put on the scrap heap. And we've got some good ideas on how to do that. I also wanted to talk about temporary visa holders, uh, Acting Deputy President. I've been contacted by many temporary visa workers in my state and their bosses and their bosses saying, please, take this to Canberra. We want our business to survive. We want continuity like any other business in this package. We want to keep our jobs. The Tourism Ministry Council of Tasmania tells me they have perplexed as to why temporary visa holders would be exempt, given how critical they are to our economy and our community. This would have a devastating impact on tourism in Tasmania if we were to lose these people and they weren't to return. They have told me this move is unfair, irresponsible and is likely to do long-term damage to the Australian tourism industry's international reputation. The TICT, the Tourism Ministry Council, and I actually want to have a quick shout out to Luke Martin, who I've been working with in the last week, and he's, we may not agree on many things, but uh, on these issues we are, we are certainly on a unity ticket. Um, their statement today said, as an industry we are not comfortable with the message it says to the world about our country and its tourism industry that we are not prepared to support our international workers in these most challenging of times. We would expect if our own children or family members were specifically recruited to work in a remote visitor destination like Tasmania on the other side of the world, their community and government would support and sustain them through such extraordinary times. There are stories of these workers being stood down across my state with no income, and with global travel restrictions, no chance, no chance of going home. They are completely at limbo and are being looked after by local communities and, may I say, by many employers. It's just not good enough. It's another political decision. It's cruel and it's miserly. So this job keeper package we're debating tonight is far from perfect. It's very complex 
It doesn't fill the cracks that many workers have fallen into, and it won't work for all small biz, even those who are eligible. Whilst, of course, the intention of these measures is not to pit uh, employees against employees, there still will be some biz owners who choose to exploit workers through changes to the Fair Work Act. And the Greens have worked hard tonight with our amendments to try and rectify this. While jobs are important, so is a roof over your head. And I want to commend the work of my state colleagues in Tasmania, uh, Cassie O'Connor and Rosalie Woodruff MPs, for the work they've done on banning rental evictions in Tasmania. Uh, and many Tasmanians have fallen on hard times. They've lost their jobs. They're under financial hardship. This is what we should be doing all around the country. So there are many issues to be resolved, and we may well have to recall Parliament again to get through additional measures. We need to get cracking on tailored support packages for acutely impacted industries, such as for artists, our small brewers and our recyclers. I'll be writing to the Treasurer myself to suggest ways forward here for these industries. There is an opportunity to move. Uh, actually, this is an opportunity for me to move, Acting Deputy President, a uh, second reader amendment on behalf of Senator Hanson Young to support the arts and creative industries. Senator, which will, you can foreshadow it. I will foreshadow order. that. Thank, Thank you. you, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, for these artists uh, and casual and foreign workers who have missed out on this package, um, I say to them tonight: Don't despair if tonight's package passes without giving you access to the job keeper. The fight is far from over. The Finance Minister still has discretion over billions of dollars of expenditure and can revisit these issues if the government is pushed. It beggars belief that they are throwing millions of workers to the wolves. Common sense tells you they should adopt this for all workers, just like they did for others. And I believe that there is a reasonable chance uh, that we may get there. Um, lastly, uh, I urge indeed plead with all uh, eligible small businesses to get on board to do the right thing by your workers, your state and your country. This wage guarantee was hard fought to get here and it will be passed tonight. Please look into it. There's plenty of people to help you navigate the details. Sign up and get your workers on it. Get the certainty that they need to get them through the coming months to put food on the table uh, to pay the rent. Um, I'd also like to say uh, on behalf of Senator McKim, uh, my fellow Tasmanian senator, he's had a lot of people petition him uh, about Australians abroad, and I know it's been raised in the chamber here today that many Australians are currently stuck abroad and want to come home but are not getting adequate government support to return. It is imperative that the government do more to clarify what help is available and provide more direct assistance to people who want to return to our country. And in the last minute that I've got left, uh, Acting Deputy President, I want to put out a special message for Julian Assange, an Australian citizen, a Walkley Award-winning journalist who is still in Belmarsh Prison in the United Kingdom on a show trial, an extradition trial to the US. We know that Mr Assange is critically ill and is highly vulnerable to COVID-19. Belmarsh Prison has had an outbreak of COVID-19 infections. Indeed, they recorded their first death of a prisoner on April the 7th, just yesterday. Nearly 4,000 prisoners have been released from UK prisons because of the risk of COVID-19. Why isn't Julian Assange being released? He hasn't even been charged with anything. He has served his sentence. He has just passed 12 months in prison. This is ridiculous, and your gov the government in this country, Senator Payne, needs to do more to get him out of prison and get him home to Australia, where he is safe. Thank you, Senator Wilson. Uh, Senator McAllister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, we learn a lot about ourselves in times of crisis. Earlier this year, Australians responded with enormous generosity to the communities that were devastated by the summer's bushfires. And now we're faced with a new challenge, and Australians have responded once again. Across the country, there's been a recognition of the responsibilities that we owe one another, the collective responsibility we have as members of a community, and a willingness to make sacrifices, the necessary sacrifices to get through this. We've seen communities organise grassroots groups to ensure vulnerable people get the help that they need. Healthcare workers, cleaners, other essential service workers turn up to work every day, despite the possible risks to their health, to
to ensure that crucial services continue. And millions of Australians have put their lives and their livelihoods on hold in order to stay home. We have brought our best selves to bear. And that is not just a responsibility for the Australian people. It is a clear responsibility for us here in this place. Parliament has a duty to bring the best version of itself to the challenges that lie ahead. And this legislation represents that duty. Labor acting constructively to make suggestions about how we proceed, working with unions with the labor movement and the government responding. And I'm proud to support the legislation before us this evening. As we move into the next phase of our response to this pandemic, it is appropriate for us to think deeply about what comes next. How do we act as a parliament in a way that not only responds to the immediate health challenges, the immediate economic challenges, but leaves our society and our politics better off, better able to respond to future challenges? A core plank of the response must be a shared understanding of how we need to change our own behaviours as individuals, as communities, in workplaces to limit the spread of the virus and to save lives. Australians have responded to calls for social distancing. Movement tracking shows that in my hometown of Sydney, for example, movement has fallen from 121 per cent of normal in March to 17 per cent on April 5. There will always be a role for police in responding to the minority of people who put their interests above everyone else's. However, policing and enforcement should not be the start and the end of our approach. We cannot arrest our way out of a pandemic. Australians deserve a response that recognises the capacity for people to make responsible decisions for themselves, for their families and for their communities. And this demands openness and transparency from government. Government should not just communicate decisions, issue direction. Government needs to communicate the reason for decisions. The release of the modelling is a good start. It's a good step to build trust, but much more will be required over the long term. Government should be thinking creatively about ways to draw on the community to lead local responses. It is particularly important for young people. We will do much better if we engage rather than scold and hector. Ultimately, restrictions can only be maintained with the ongoing support of Australians this is not an argument in favour of simply adopting the lightest touch approach. It is an argument for building and maintaining a sense of shared purpose and allocating the leadership responsibility to all sorts of people right across our community. People want to do the right thing. Young Australians want to do the right thing. We should help them. Parliament sat through the Spanish flu and it sat through World War II. And our democratic traditions are not just a luxury for the good times. They are absolutely critical and arguably all the more important at a time like this. The contest of ideas produces better outcomes. There is no party, no individual with a monopoly on good ideas. And we don't hold elections to anoint a dictator for a term. We hold elections to, re to elect 227 people to represent us. And that task of representation is continual and ongoing. Different people in our community will have a very different response, a very different experience of the pandemic. And our policy response needs to have a mechanism to capture that and respond to it. Scrutiny is essential for transparency. And transparency is essential to building the trust that is absolutely necessary when we are asking Australians to make real sacrifices, very considerable individual sacrifices, to deal with this pandemic. Now more than ever, we need the parliament to sit. And I call on the government to reconsider their glib dismissal of calls for regular sittings of the parliament. 
It is hard to imagine, but we will come out of this eventually. But we will not emerge into a world in which all of our old challenges have gone away. Many of them will have intensified. And we will have to manage those old challenges whilst also trying to manage our recovery from what looks to be the economic event of the century. If this crisis has taught us anything, it is that we are all in this together. But some people aren't getting the message. Like a broken record, these people are stuck on the old track. I'm thinking about right-wing think tanks that are calling now already for austerity and for spending cuts. I'm talking about Liberal ministers in state parliaments calling for cuts in environment protection. I'm talking about employers that are calling for wage cuts. Well, I've got a very clear message in response. Salvation does not lie in austerity. We cannot cut our way back to prosperity. We cannot ask the most vulnerable people in our community to bear the cost. Because aside from anything else, it turns out that these are some of the people that we rely on most to get us through a period of crisis. And we shouldn't sow the seeds of a new disaster to pay off the debt of our current crisis. Environment protection is there for a reason, and the warming trends that drove our horror bushfire season will continue to punish our communities unless we can find an enduring and effective global solution. An enormous national and global challenge lies before us. We should meet it with all of the energy, creativity and goodwill that we can muster. Thank you, uh, Senator uh, McAllister. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And great on well, that pronunciation, by the way, too. Can well, I just say for the record? Senator Ciccone, then no one else will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to briefly uh, talk this evening um, on the bills that are before us um, here in the Senate. And uh, as a number of my colleagues have already outlined uh, in the Senate today, uh, Labor does stand ready to pass uh, the bills enabling the legislation for the JobKeeper payment. Now, Labor has taken a very constructive approach with this, and uh, it is really good to see that uh, in a time of crisis, uh, you know, the major parties coming together for the betterment of our community. We are living through extraordinary crisis. There's no question about that. The coronavirus pandemic is unprecedented. And it's clear that what we are doing as a parliament, the action that we are all taking together as a community, is working to slow and hopefully stop the spread of the virus. And that is good news. But our community is not just impacted in terms of our health. We are also impacted economically, as the steps that we must take to stop the spread force enormous change on the way that we work, where we go, what we do and how we interact with each other. And just as our community is working to keep as many people healthy and save as many lives as possible, we must also work to protect as many livelihoods as well. We're interested in getting a good outcome for the community not engaging in political point scoring with our opponents, Labor has moved amendments in the House of Representatives today to make the JobKeeper payment work for more Australians, to try and keep as many people employed, and to make the JobKeeper payment available to many thousands of temporary migrant workers, which our economy relies so much on. Many of my colleagues in the other place have already raised concerns for the situation of more than a million casual workers who will not be eligible for the JobKeeper payment. Many of my colleagues have also raised concerns for the well-being of temporary migrant workers, for international students and for many other non-permanent residents who will also not be eligible for JobKeeper. And I endorse those remarks. As part of the bills before the Senate this evening, the Treasurer will now have the powers to expand the payment to other workers. And I really do urge the Treasurer to make JobKeeper available to as many casuals and temporary migrant workers 
who fall through the cracks. But today I want to particularly focus on the plight of workers in agriculture because it's not just hyperbole to say that without a strong and capable agriculture workforce, we would be in a far trickier situation in relation to coronavirus than we currently find ourselves. In Australia, we currently grow and produce enough food for our population, three times over in fact. Most Australians are only leaving the home for essential reasons. For many of us, a quick stop at the supermarket or farmer's market is the only outing we're taking. Our shopping lists are pretty much simple, Madam Acting Deputy President. Fresh fruit, veggies, a bit of meat, some pasta, and dare I say, hopefully some toilet paper as well too. This new way of life, where an outing to buy some groceries is something of a highlight, has many of us reflecting on what we buy and where it comes from. And as I said in an opinion piece that was published today by the Weekly Times, this crisis has many Australians thinking about what it takes to get produce into a supermarket or a farmer's market. We are reflecting on who milks the cows in my home state, Victoria, down at Gippsland, who planted the apple trees in Shepparton, who tended the grapes in the Mallee, who picked the tomatoes in Meldura, who fed the lambs in Bendigo and who made the cheese in Millowa. We are extremely lucky to have the farmers and workers in agriculture for growing what we eat. That means that we can continue to shop without panic but with confidence, knowing that we'll be able to get what we need during these very testing times. There are approximately 40,000 temporary visa holders currently working in Australian agriculture, some of which are skilled at undertaking complicated or scientific work on many Australian farms. However, many of them are doing low-skilled work, but absolutely critical work on farms across Australia, whether it's picking and packing our fresh produce. All of it is essential. And I salute these workers for doing an absolutely wonderful job. These jobs are often filled by overseas seasonal workers or by backpackers who are travelling in Australia. And without these workers, we would face the possibility of produce being left to rot because there would be no one else out there willing to pick the fruit or cut the vegetables. The fact is, we as a nation rely on temporary visa workers, whether we like it or not. They pick and pack our fresh fruit and vegetables that we conveniently just grab off the shelf at supermarkets. None of us can afford to support temporary visa workers in agriculture, but I'm pleased that the government has offered opportunities for visa extensions for some Australian farm workers. And this is, in fact, a step in the right direction. And I really do want to acknowledge the work by many ministers on this front, in particular Alan Tudge. But we know that the coronavirus is not just stopping to check someone's visa status. And this is the point that Labor has made through Senator Keneally time and time again. If a temporary visa holder can go home during this crisis, well, maybe they should. But the reality is there are so many of them that can't. 1.6 million temporary visa holders in Australia are not in a position to simply just pack up and leave. There are many borders that have closed. And as we know, international flights, there just aren't any that are leaving Australia or coming back here. They've simply shut down. So what will happen if a temporary migrant can't afford to, rent, to pay their rent, can't afford to get medical assistance, can't afford to pay for simple things like groceries, can't afford to isolate themselves if they fall ill? 
We can and we must do more to support the situation that these temporary visa workers find themselves in. If a worker is here because we rely on them and they cannot get home, then surely it is in our interest to support these workers. Surely it is in our interest to support them, be it financially. Surely it is in Australia's national interest to make a temporary worker, to make sure that a temporary worker has access to financial support so that they will need that if they fall ill and are required to self-isolate. Not to mention supporting the many farmers who will then have to self-isolate and ensure that there are provisions in place that these workers themselves don't spread the virus to their workforce on site. I again urge the government to expand the JobKeeper program to include casuals and temporary migrants. Because in the case of farming and agriculture, Madam Acting Deputy President, we rely on them. Thank you, Senator Chicona. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, as has been acknowledged by pretty much every speaker in this debate, Australia and the entire world currently faces a massive crisis, a health crisis and an economic crisis, and indeed a social crisis, uh, as more and more people are affected by uh, COVID-19. Uh, as at today's date, over 6,000 Australians have been diagnosed with coronavirus, and sadly, uh, this has caused the death of 50 Australians. And try as we might, despite what we might want to think, these numbers are likely to rise. I want to thank the essential workers who have played their role in fighting both this disease and the economic ramifications it has caused, the health workers, the aged care workers, the retail and transport workers who have kept our supermarkets stocked, the farm workers who have continued producing uh, produce for Australians to consume, and so many others on the front, front line uh, helping all of us through this. Now, from the very beginning, Labor has adopted a bipartisan approach in the way it's, it has approached uh, this crisis. We haven't used this as an opportunity to point score, and we won't do so in this debate again tonight. We've supported pretty much everything that the government has put up to deal with both the health and economic ramifications of coronavirus. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that we will just agree to every single thing the government wants. Uh, that's not a democracy, and there is a role for the opposition and other parties here to put up constructive suggestions about how the government's approach can be improved. We have made, and we will continue to make, constructive suggestions to make sure that Australia comes through this in the best way possible. And in fact, the bills that we're here debating tonight arise from one of the constructive suggestions that Labor has made. Because Labor supports the JobKeeper wage subsidy that these bills put into place. We always supported it. In fact, we called for it alongside working people, the union movement and many business groups. Now, it's worth remembering that initially the Prime Minister opposed this idea when it was first called for from, by Labor, and in fact he, he and his colleagues said that Labor was playing politics. We weren't. We were just making constructive suggestions to ensure that Australians were cared for in these times. Uh, now I'm pleased, and Labor is pleased, that the Prime Minister did eventually agree that this was a good thing to do. Uh, and we wouldn't be here today if he hadn't done so. So I congratulate him for listening to Labor uh, on this suggestion. And whatever happens here tonight, whatever amendments are moved, Labor will deliver this JobKeeper wage subsidy. But we do want it to be better. We think it can be better, and we want it to be better. The reason is that millions of Australians are depending on us to make this JobKeeper wage subsidy better. I think. Pretty much every single senator and every House of Reps member has had an incredible influx in calls, emails and inquiries to their offices over the last few weeks from Australians in incredible distress, uh, whether because of the health 
consequences or the economic consequences of coronavirus. Just to give you a couple of examples of, of people that my office and I have assisted, a mid-twenties woman from North Queensland. Her husband is a tradie and he earns just too much for the new income test uh, applied uh, for job seeker payments. She's a casual health worker. She's now lost her job and she misses out on meeting the government's requirement that a casual worker has worked for 12 months in that job. She's missed out by three days. She's three days short of working for 12 months and as a result, under the government's rules, she won't qualify for the JobKeeper payment. She's recently married and they're saving to start a family uh, and to buy a house. And she's genuinely worried that after this last paycheck runs out, she doesn't know what she and her partner are going to do. They have loans to pay and they're worried that even when movement restrictions are lifted, business will take some time to start up again and employ her. Another example, a Gold Coast scaffolder who has worked crew to crew, company to company, many, many times in the industry for almost 13 years. And sadly, we see that too much in the construction industry and many other industries where people are only engaged on a casual basis. He's been with his current employer as a casual since September, so again, he doesn't meet the 12-month rule that the government has imposed for the JobKeeper payment. Now, admittedly, it looks like he will qualify for the job seeker payment, the old new start. But he and his wife have got five kids. They'll be getting $550 a week with five kids to feed at a rental cost of $425 per week. It's just not going to cut it. I could give example after example, but the bottom line is that the government's rules as they currently stand for this JobKeeper payment exclude short-term casuals, migrant workers who cannot return home, no matter what the government says about them needing to return home, council workers, workers in the arts and entertainment industries, university staff and casual school teachers, and workers for many charities. Now, we have moved a number of amendments in the House to try to rectify these gaps, and I was very disappointed to see the government vote against every single one of those amendments. So that's why we're taking the opportunity here in the Senate to again move these amendments and there still is an opportunity for the government to vote with us and fix these gaps to make sure that these casual workers, these migrant workers, these council workers, these arts and entertainment industry workers actually receive the JobKeeper payment that many other Australians will receive. Because the bottom line is that no worker should be left behind. I don't want to take too much longer, but I do just want to also reject the suggestion from the government uh, that people who miss out on JobKeeper will be fine because they'll qualify for the JobSeeker allowance, what was called Newstart. In many cases, that is just not true. It's not just a matter of people missing out on one form of payment and getting another. For starters, even if they do get the JobSeeker allowance, that's significantly less income than what they would get under the JobKeeper payment. But there are many people who won't qualify for the JobSeeker uh, payment, either because their partner earns just a little bit more than $78,000 a year, the income test, or when we're talking about places like the Gold Coast with a large New Zealand population, they may not have lived in Australia long enough to be able to qualify for the job seeker payment. And again, just one example I'll give you of people we've heard from in our office over the last few days. A 35-year-old woman from the Gold Coast with two kids under six years of age. She's lost her casual job in a restaurant. Her, her husband earns just over the new income test of $78,000 a year, so she won't qualify for JobSeeker. As she says, after you pay rent of $450 a week, there's not much left. We pay our taxes and get nothing. Why do they think I go to work five nights a week after looking after the kids all day? What would I do? Oh, sorry, why would I do that if I didn't have to? We have no assets, no savings, nothing to fall back on. We have $50 to Saturday. These are the people who are going to miss out from both the JobKeeper payment and, in this woman's case, the JobSeeker payment as well. I am genuinely concerned about how these people are going to survive over the next few months until we see economic conditions recover. Just in conclusion, I support 
the amendments that have been moved by my colleagues to try to fix these gaps. These are gaps that will affect the real lives of real Australians and their families. In this time, we have heard many, many politicians across all sides of politics talk about this is a time for us to pull together. I wholeheartedly agree with that, and I encourage the government to think about that view of the world once we come out of this crisis. There are benefits in us sticking together. There are benefits in us thinking of ourselves as a community, as a collective, not just as a series of individuals in some survival of the fittest. Um, there is going to be a time for us to think about how the economic structure of our community, about the spiralling rates of casualisation that we're now paying the price for, uh, about this overemphasis on individuals getting ahead rather than thinking about how we work together as a collective. We've got to see an end to the demonisation of those on income support because we now understand very well that income support is there for a reason, in good times and in bad, to support those who need our assistance. We've got to see an end for the disrespect that so many show to those in low paid work, the very low paid work that we are now depending on, the aged care workers, the early childhood educators, the transport workers, the disability carers who are out there continuing to help people no matter the risk to their own health. These people are paid far too less and we've got to fix those kind of things as we come out of this crisis. And more than anything, we have to reject the idea that small government is always good government. Because if this crisis has highlighted anything in the way that governments operate, we are now seeing the consequences uh, of too much emphasis on reducing government, on small government and cutting back on services. We're rightly now seeing massive government spending, uh, I might note, of the kind criticised uh, after the GFC by those who are now legislating for it. But we have seen in those incredible Centrelink queues that we've all seen the costs of cutting back on government services and continually outsourcing those services. We must take stock of these issues as we continue, as, as we come out of recovery. But right now, tonight, that's the time to get this bill passed. Um, we do hope that the government will back the amendments that Labor is putting forward to fix these gaps, but Labor is not going to hold up this bill. There's too much riding on it. This is something that we called for for over six million Australian workers. We'll be supporting it. We're not going to indulge in games where we make amendments that we know the government aren't going to agree to in the House of Representatives. This is not a time for ping pong between the Senate and the House of Representatives. We need to get this done. We need to get the money out the door, but we do need to give it to as many people as we possibly can, those who really need it uh, and those who are currently excluded uh, by the government. So again, I encourage the government to think about those amendments that we put forward. Thank you, Senator Watt. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, all those senators who have contributed to this important debate uh, and uh, will take this opportunity to just briefly address the various second reading amendments that have been circulated. Uh, firstly, the government will oppose second reading amendments on sheets uh, 8939, 8945, 8949, 8950, 8951 and 8952. In relation to the opposition, a, a second reading amendment on sheet 8947, let me note the following. It essentially just notes the power available to the Treasurer in this legislation and encourages him to use this power. It doesn't mention any specific way in that amendment that the Senate feels the Treasurer should use this power other, other than to protect more jobs. The Payments and Benefits uh, Bill establishes a framework for coronavirus economic response payments. Under this framework, the Treasurer will be able to make rules to provide for new payments administered by the Commissioner. This is a deliberate feature of this legislation which allows for flexibility of the payment arrangements and ensures the payments can be quickly introduced and revised to appropriately respond to the evolving impact of the coronavirus. And in so doing, we will be protecting more jobs as this second reading amendment encourages us to do. However, let us also make uh, the government's position in relation to temporary visa holders, local government employees and casual workers who have worked for a business 
for less than 12 months and other groupings covered in those various second reading amendments I have listed as being opposed by the government, very clear. We have no plans to extend the JobKeeper payments to those groups. Local council workers are the responsibility of state and territory governments who understand that this is the case. Government schools and TAFEs are also the responsibility of state governments. The government has ensured charities will be, uh, able to have, will be able to access a lower turnover decline test of 15 per cent for the JobKeeper payment. We will not extend the JobKeeper payment uh, to temporary visa holders. Temporary visa holders are expected to support themselves while in Australia. The government has announced it will allow temporary visa holders with work rights to access their superannuation funds to help them buffer the economic impacts from the coronavirus outbreak. Those unable to support themselves over the next six months, either through work, savings or access to superannuation, are strongly encouraged to return home. The time to go is now and they should make arrangements as quickly as possible. The situation will be per periodically reviewed and further changes may be made if and as required. The definition of casuals used for this legislation is taken directly from the Fair Work Act, which defines a long-term casual employee as an employee who has been employed by the employer on a regular and systemic basis for a period of at least 12 months. The government has provided clear and consistent advice to employers and employees regarding eligibility for JobKeeper. This will give certainty to those facing an uncertain period ahead. The proposed eligibility rules are appropriate for the conditions we face now, but the government acknowledges that there are likely to be currently unforeseeable issues which may be ahead of us and which, we will, which will need to be dealt with. That is why the Treasurer has the discretion to amend JobKeeper eligibility in the future to provide flexibility to deal with these issues as they arise. This power is not there to expand the eligibility of the JobKeeper program to local council workers, temporary visa holders, casual, um, <coughs> casuals who have worked for business uh, for less than 12 months or other categories covered by the various second reading amendments in front of us. The Australians who find themselves out of work have the opportunity to apply for the significantly boosted job seeker payment and of course uh, the government has waived many of the usual eligibility requirements or waiting periods for those payments but uh, yes it is right I mean there are I mean some eligibility requirements uh, do remain. In relation uh, to the issue of leave arrangements when I mean, these are a matter to be resolved by agreement and subject to relevant agreements between employers and their employees an employer can request an employee take paid annual leave under the provisions of this bill and the employee cannot unreasonably refuse. Where an employee is of the view that they are being treated unfairly, there is capacity to ask the Fair Work Commission to review any such arrangement. Importantly, while on leave, the worker would be paid at their full wage, subsidised by the $1,500 per fortnight payment, whereas depending on the circumstances, it may well be that the worker would only be able to receive the $1,500 payment per fortnight. That is, it may well be in the employee's interest and his or her choice to draw down on their leave while they can before going on to the uh, job uh, keeper payment only. Uh, so it, not just in the interest of the business. Uh, I commend the bill uh, to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Minister. I think, uh, Senator Gallagher, you foreshadowed uh, an amendment. You moved your amendment? Well, the question is that the amendment uh, moved by... This is... Uh, uh, Eight nine four uh, seven. That the uh, amendment uh, foreshadowed by Senator Gallagher on sheet eight nine four seven be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? Uh, the ayes have it. Senator Patrick, what is your? We are supporting. You are supporting it. I think the ayes have it. Uh, I think we might then move to the amendment of Senator Waters. I'll just take them in the order that the clerk has just listed them. Yeah, Senator Waters, you need to move your amendment. Uh, thanks, Acting uh, Deputy President. I did move it in my second reading speech, but I hereby move it again. Okay, thank you. The question is that the amendment uh, moved by Senator Waters on sheet 8950 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against? Senator? No. no. Senator Patrick, your the eyes. Uh, the eyes have it. Uh, thank you. Uh, the nose have it. The nose have it. 
There seems to be some confusion. Senator Patrick said he was supporting that. Well, I'll call a division in that case. No, we've gone. We've done that one. No, for this one as well, Senator Coleman. I just asked Senator Patrick, and he was voting. Uh, he was voting for the amendment of Senator Waters on. Okay. All right. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Jackie put them in order because it was a bit of a mess. I would normally say lock the doors, but I'll ask the attendants to prevent anyone else entering the chamber on this occasion. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Waters on sheet 8950 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. 
I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. I'm going to ask senators to speak a bit quiet because. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 21. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, there will likely be other divisions. And could I ask you to remain extra quiet during the count because the tellers are standing further away from the clerks than they normally would? <laughs> the question is now that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Keneally has— Senator Keneally, I'll need you to come and formally move your amendment before I put it. I formally move the amendment uh, foreshadowed. The question in is that the speech. amendment um, on sheet 8939, moved by Senator Keneally, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Cease the ringing of the bells. I'll ask the attendants to prevent anyone else entering. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Keneally on sheet 8939 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 21. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Walsh, we will now move to your amendment, number 8952. And I believe, looking at the clerk, I'll need to ask you to formally move it. Yes, Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. I move the amendment circulated in my name. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Walsh on, Senator, on sheet 8952 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
whoops, okay. Okay, metaphorically lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Walsh be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes, and I ask senators to keep the volume down a bit because the tellers are standing further away from the clerks. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 21. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator Seward, I'm coming to your matter number 89 on sheet 8951. Thank you, Mr. President. I move um, the amendment that I foreshadowed on sheet 8951 relating to those that are being left behind by these packages. Thank you. The question is that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Cease the ringing of the bells. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell of the noes, and I ask senators to remain silent to allow um, Senator Urquhart to do the count.
The result of the division is ayes 4, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Sheldon, could I come to your matter on sheet 8949? I'll give you a moment to get to a seat. Senator Sheldon. Yeah, thank you very much. Shall I uh, move the um, matter which I spoke to earlier? The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Sheldon on sheet 8949 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Sheldon on sheet 8949 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 21. The matter is resolved in the negative. We have several matters remaining, Senators. I will now call on Senator Hanson Young to move. Senator, Senator Wish Wilson is going to move that amendment on her, is it on her behalf or in your own name, Senator Wish Wilson? Uh, uh, President, I, uh, I move the amendment um, on behalf of Senator Hanson Young uh, to give uh, artists and the arts community in it's Australia. Not, sorry, it's not not the the amendment to the on sheet 8945. So the question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rich Wilson on behalf of Senator Hanson Young on sheet 8945 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is 
that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson on behalf of Senator Hanson Young on sheet 8945 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 21. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question is now that the second reading as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Bill 2020. Coronavirus Economic Response Package Omnibus Measures No. 2 Bill 2020. Appropriation Bill No. 5, 2019-2020. Appropriation Bill No. 6, 2019-2020. The committee is considering the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Bill 2020 and three related bills. Order. If you're not participating in the next stage, please uh, sit quietly or leave the chamber. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. As a number of requests for amendments have been circulated, I'm advised that, as required, senators proposing requests have circulated statements of reasons for framing them as requests, together with statements by the clerk on whether the amendments would be regarded as requests under the precedence of the Senate. Is it the wish of the committee that the statements accompanying the circulated requests be incorporated in the Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate? There being no objection, it is so ordered. So the question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments. Uh, Senator Seward. Chair. Um, I have a number of questions that I would like to ask, which I will try and move through expeditiously, um, and um, then I would like to move my first amendment. I, colleagues also may have other questions, as, do, as does Senator Patrick, I'm told. Um, could I please ask? I wanted to get some things clarified about the way that JobSeeker will work, the, the JobSeeker payment and the uh, JobKeeper payment will operate together. And uh, can I put on record, please, uh, thank you for uh, the briefing yesterday. It helped, and some of the questions that were answered in writing, it helped clarify things uh, enormously. So thank you to, for the gov to the government for that. Um, we talked yet I understand the process in terms of um, uh, that it's the, the transition between job seeker if somebody has already entered uh, issued a notice uh, applied and done a notice of intent for job seeker and that it's the process is aimed to make sure it's seamless. Um, I, I must admit I do have some concerns around that um, just in terms of the way it will work but in terms of if I have um, nominated for uh, or sought nomination to be part of JobKeeper and I'm pending the first uh, employer that I nominate for doesn't, can I, uh, doesn't decide to enter the scheme, do I have to wait for that or can I also indicate for the second employer 
beforehand. So there's no sort of gap between between that process. Oh, Minister, wait for the call. Minister. So in relation to JobKeeper, uh, there is no issue of second employer. There is only one employer, and so that is in relation to JobKeeper. Uh, now, if the employer is uh, not eligible, um, then um, and a, a particular employee finds himself or herself out of work, uh, that employee would have the op that former employee then would have the opportunity to apply for. Um, job seeker, though, I mean, clearly, I mean, we have waived um, many of the usual eligibility requirements and waiting periods, though not all, um, and so there are some tests that continue to apply, but, um, you know, if um, an employee is not able to participate in JobKeeper um, and has lost his job, uh, he or she would have the opportunity to apply for um, job seeker and the waiting period was waived. Senator Seward. Sorry, um, Minister, what I, what I meant, and I apologise if I, I was not clear, the problem, that some casual employees, as you know, have a, a number of jobs. So what we're concerned, or what I'm concerned about, is the transition, the, the process of applying for the second, um, if the first employer, just say I've, I've chosen my first employer for the job that I most want to, to work for, or that I think is, is the best opportunity, but that employer decides not to opt in to the process. How long time frame shall I I'll put it this way, do you envisage before I know that that employer hasn't opted in and I can then go to my second employer? If because I've got a second job. Minister. So it's the employer that applies and the employer nominates the employees uh, under the arrangement. And uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, if a casual employee working for uh, two employers, um, that employee would have to nominate their preferred em employer. And if that employer, and that is I think the scenario you're getting at, if that employer then ultimately was not eligible, yes, they would absolutely qualify to go into the JobKeeper um, a program through the other employ employer. Senator Seward. Thank you. Have you looked at the time? So what I'm after is the time frame to make sure that there is a continuous process. I'll continue to get JobSeeker while I go through the first nomination process, then keep it for the second one. Is that correct? Minister. The thing is, I mean, assuming that both employers uh, applied at the same time uh, and that there is no time gap there, then yes, that is correct. Senator Patrick. Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, along the similar lines, Minister, um, I just want to s describe a scenario to you and just uh, understand whether or not uh, JobKeeper would uh, would the, this person would be eligible for job JobKeeper? Uh, typical scenario is a uh, is a, a chef who works uh, obviously uh, in restaurants, works in ref restaurant A for nine months, and then switches to restaurant B for three months. Uh, is that uh, uh, that chef entitled to a JobKeeper? Um, it, you know, so he clearly had tenure. Uh, in the industry, it's quite common for, for, for a chef to go from one restaurant to another. Uh, uh, does that chef uh, qualify for job keeper? Minister. Um, I think this is a pretty black and white um, scenario. Um, the tenure is as consistent with the long term casual definition of the Fair Work Act. Uh, it is, uh, the test is uh, an association of 12 months or more with the same employer. Now, it, it could well be that the business is owned by uh, a new owner, uh, so the uh, business transfer pr provisions would, 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 would kick in. But if you're saying that this is an individual that has worked in the industry but across different employers over, over a period, uh, then no, they would not qualify. But of course, they would uh, uh, be able to apply for the job seeker payment. Senator Keneally. 
Uh, Minister, uh, there is a small business run by, owned and run by people on a safe haven enterprise visa holders in Minister Rustin's home state of South Australia that I visited last year. They employ a range of Australian nationals in their business. Can the minister confirm if a business owned and run by Chev holders would be eligible for JobKeeper funding for their Australian employees? Safe Haven Enterprise Visa, Chev holders, who own a business and run a business and employ Australians, would that business be eligible to apply for Safe Haven Enterprise Visa is a visa created by this Liberal government. It is a form of a temporary protection visa. Minister. So, in terms of eligibility for the job keeper payment, what um, is relevant is the citizenship um, of the employee. Um, Senator Keneally, wait for the call. You have the call. If I can confirm, then you are confirming that a business owned by people who are on a safe haven enterprise visa, a temporary protection visa, that business is eligible for to register for JobKeeper and provide it to their Australian citizen employees. Is that correct? Minister. We understand where you are confused because, I mean, an Australian business employing Australian citizens uh, who, which are eligible for the JobKeeper payment, uh, these citizens would be able to uh, receive the JobKeeper payment. Senator Keneally. The confusion arises, Minister, because your government has said that safe haven enterprise visa holders and temporary protection visa holders as employees are not eligible for job keeper payments. So there does seem to be a very interesting inconsistency here that a, a, a person on a temporary protection visa, either a TPV or a CHEV, that has a business that employs Australians as this one business I went to in Adelaide does, the, that business can register a JobKeeper and ensure that its Australian citizen employees are able to get JobKeeper. But those same temporary visa holders, if they are employees, are not eligible to receive JobKeeper. Is that correct? Minister. Well, well again, I mean, it's entirely straightforward. I mean, the JobKeeper. Uh, program is designed to keep uh, Australian employees and, and of course, uh, uh, triple four visa holders from New Zealand connected uh, to uh, their employing business when that business is in financial distress and might otherwise be unable to hold on to their employees. And this is, this is about providing support to employees through employing businesses. And uh, I, think the, I think the situation is very clear. Senator Keneally. What kind of support then can the, the temporary visa holders who own this business receive from the government to ensure that their business stays afloat and is able to continue to employ Australian citizens? Minister. Well, in the context of this legislation, I mean, you know, clearly uh, the JobKeeper payment does not extend to temporary visa holders. I've gone through that in some detail. Uh, again, during my uh, second reading summing up speech. Uh, but in terms of Australian businesses, I mean, we have announced a whole series of um, uh, measures to support, uh, in particular, small and medium sized businesses with a turnover of less than $50 million, including, of course, uh, the uh, you know, cash flow uh, boost, uh, you know, the uh, measure where um, Australian tax buying businesses uh, who are employing Australians, uh, who are, who are <laughs> Uh, withholding tax for their employees are uh, able to get payments of um, up to $100,000, depending on what their uh, payroll um, uh, and withholding tax um, liabilities are. Senator Keneally. My last question on this, because I'm mindful other senators may have questions. Minister, you keep using the term Australian businesses, but it's not run. You've just interjected that it is an Australian business, but it's not actually run by people you consider Australian. 
So, you're not provide you, you. These are temporary protection visa holders. You have not given them permanent residency or any permanent status in Australia. So, can you clarify that all of those supports that you have just outlined to the Senate are available to a business in Australia, regardless of the visa status of the business owners? Minister. Well. I, again, I don't understand why Senator Keneally is in any way confused. I mean, it's, it's very clear that Australian businesses with an Australian business number uh, are able to participate in uh, this uh, JobKeeper uh, program, but that the JobKeeper payment uh, is uh, available only to um, Australian citizens and, uh, and you know, relevant others, uh, but not to temporary, not to temporary visa holders. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, to the Minister, the, the JobKeeper package currently, as we know, applies to sole traders who are able to claim the $1,500 a fortnight payment. They can demonstrate a 30 per cent decline in turnover. My question is about sole traders who operate as partnerships, they typically owner drivers. For example, in the trucking industry, many small contractors operate as a family partnership, including husband and wife partnerships. Is it the case that these kind of partnerships will individually be eligible for a single JobKeeper payment, regardless of the fact that there are two workers actively, actively operating the business? Minister. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the business participation requirements are that at any time in a fortnight the individual is actively engaged in the business carried on by the entity. The individual must be uh, actively engaged in the operations and activities of the body disengagement in the business must occur in Australia. Further, depending on the types of entity the business is, the individual uh, must have a particular role within the business. In the case of an entity uh, that is a sole trader, the individual must be the entity. In relation uh, to a partnership, uh, the individual must be a partner in the partnership and it only can apply to one uh, individual. Senator Ciccone. Ask, what was the reason that the government provided New Zealanders access to the job keeper program? Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Well, we, we do have a special relationship with um, our friends from New Zealand, and uh, this uh, category of uh, um, working New Zealanders who uh, are employed uh, in uh, Australia, have been employed and have the opportunity because their employer uh, wants to remain connected to them, to continue to be employed, well then that is something that we uh, felt was uh, appropriate to support. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, just in relation to this, uh, this particular issue, there's a number of people that are stuck in this country, as we've articulated a number of us in this chamber, that have no uh, income. Um, they're not eligible for job seeker or, in fact, job keeper. I've had a number of emails from Australians overseas who are in similar situations in the country in which they live. They've, um, because they've been away, because they're stuck overseas, um, they've exceeded the extensions or they've already um, that have been made to some of the payments, or they had already fallen off the payments, and they have no visible means of support in the countries in which they're staying. And now we're doing, and we're doing the same here. Um, are you negotiating with any other countries to support Australians overseas, um, uh, and then in, uh, for them to be supported overseas, and for uh, all of those non-residents that are here, and they're basically stuck here with no income and no access to income support? How are those people going to survive? And when we've got citizens overseas who can't survive either. Minister. Uh, so in relation to Australian citizens overseas, and you know, in particular Australian uh, citizens receiving or in need of a government payment who are overseas and unable to return to Australia within the portability limits of their payment because they're unwell with coronavirus or affected by coronavirus travel restrictions or country lockdowns, uh, they have generally had their portability automatically extended. Uh, anyone who has stopped receiving uh, a payment uh, should um, let Services Australia know immediately to have their payment uh, reinstated. Now, in relation to uh, temporary visa holders uh, who um, are here in Australia, we don't accept that there is uh, no capacity for um, temporary uh, visa holders to return 
uh, home if they are unable to support themselves in Australia. It's uh, a long established principle and I think reading through one of those second reading amendments, uh, I think from the Labor Party, even in that motion it was recognised, it's a long standing uh, principle that temporary um, visa holders are expected uh, to uh, be able to support themselves while in Australia. And uh, you know, we have made a decision to facilitate access to um, their superannuation for those um, temporary visa holders uh, who have work rights. Uh, but what we would say and what we do say is that those uh, temporary visa holders who are unable to support themselves over the next six months, either through work, through savings or by accessing their superannuation, we strongly encourage them to return home and, and this is the time to go. Um, it is a situation that we will continue to review periodically and, and further changes may be made if required, but at this point in time, our very strong advice to any temporary uh, visa holder who cannot support themselves uh, is to uh, return home. Senator Siebert. Thank you. Um, are you saying to international students as well they should return home? It, what happen, and what happens if they can't return home? Minister. Uh, uh, th thank you. Um, I mean, international students uh, do come here on the basis that uh, they are expected to support themselves while uh, in, in Australia. I mean, that is, that is the basis on which uh, they come to Australia, and that is uh, the reason why um, you know, we expect temporary uh, residents, temporary visa holders, to support themselves either through their savings, through work, or through accessing their superannuation if they have work rights here, which um, you know many working international students would have access to a level of superannuation. Senator Siebert. Minister, do you accept that, given the, the current situation with employment, that many, many students will have lost their jobs? Yes, they are working. They'll have lost their jobs. They'll have probably little superannuation, in fact. And, they can't, and it's going to be very difficult for them to gain those jobs, particularly as they can't access JobKeeper. Minister. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, in Australia, when it comes to uh, income support uh, and related arrangements, um, it has always been based on a uh, residency requirement. Um, that is not a new principle. That is not a new principle at all. Um, and you know, we, we of course understand that this is a difficult circumstance, but the Australian government has got a responsibility uh, to prioritise uh, you know, Australians in the first instance, and indeed we have extended uh, support to permanent residencies and waived uh, the waiting period for permanent residents that hadn't yet served the entire uh, waiting period to be able to access relevant income support uh, payments. But you know, just to put this into context, I mean, we are here about to uh, spend $130 billion in relation to 6 million working Australians, nearly half the Australian workforce, probably uh, another 2 million uh, Australians who will receive uh, job seeker uh, payments. I mean, so that is well over half uh, the Australian workforce that will be receiving payments from the government. And you know, while uh, you know, I, I hear that uh, some are saying we should do more and more and more and more, uh, the truth is that in this circumstance, uh, you know, in, in, in the context of the capacity of what we're able to do, uh, we do have to, in the first instance, prioritise the interests of Australians. Senator Seward. Can I uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for your answer? I don't agree with you, um, and we have amendments that we'll put on that particular issue. Um, can I just ask, you made a comment about Australian overseas, Australians overseas, and I did acknowledge that the portability, some of the portability uh, re um, processes had been extended. There are people stuck overseas that don't have, have previously been on payments. They've fallen off them because they got, for various reasons, got caught over there. Are you saying, um, or overseas, are you saying that they could potentially apply for uh, a, uh, some form of income support from Australia, even though they've actually then exceeded their portability requirements? Minister. So, um, just to clarify this, uh, those Australians who uh, had their payments stopped, who were receiving payments but had their payments stopped uh, because uh, they exceeded their portability requirements, they uh, should uh, approach Services Australia to have their payment reinstated. Uh, in relation to Australians uh, who are uh, overseas and who are unable to support themselves overseas, our advice would be the same to them. And in fact, it has been the same to them um, for some time now come home um, and uh, you know of course uh, Australians would be able in that circumstance to uh, be uh, able to support uh, to receive the relevant uh, income support in Australia and to apply for that income support here 
Senator Seward. Uh, uh, there are occasions where people can't come. I'm aware of occasions where people actually can't come home for a, a number of reasons. Um, so, but I will pass on your answer. Could I also ask the um, the issues around superannuation? If I'm stuck overseas, can't get a payment, am I able to access my superannuation while I'm overseas? My Australian super superannuation that's been generated in Australia, can I access that while I'm overseas? Minister. Um, thank, you, thank you, Chair. In relation to uh, Australians who have permanently moved overseas, I mean, there are long standing, no, 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 there are long standing uh, provisions that enable um, uh, people to withdraw uh, their superannuation. In relation uh, to uh, those Australians who find, any Australian who finds themselves in a position of um, hardship and complies with all of the relevant eligibility requirements, would be able to uh, access their superannuation. Senator Ciccone. Um, Minister, um, last week the Prime Minister said the inclusion of New Zealanders in the, new, in the JobKeeper program was due to the fact that they've been making a life here, work here and connected to businesses here, um, and they've made commitments here and they own properties and rental properties, etc. Um, why then has the government not included other long-term visa holders that have made a similar contribution to the Australian economy? Minister. Uh, because we have a particularly <laughs> special relationship with New Zealand. Senator Ciccone. Um, the legislation before us tonight will allow the Treasurer to include classes to, assess, uh, to access the JobKeeper program. What is the process and assessment that will occur for the inclusion of any new classes of people? How will you determine whether they qualify and will it simply be up to the Minister's will? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would very respectfully refer um, the Senator to my statements in my second reading summing up speech where I addressed that precise question directly. I mean, so the uh, Treasurer will have, um, I mean, is given the power under this legislation to exercise discretion, as you've rightly pointed out, and he uh, will have the capacity to uh, issue rules and determinations to give effect uh, to that. But I've, I've spelled all of that out in some detail in the second reading summing up speech. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Minister. Um, as we know, um, Minister Rustin has been given similar powers to expand the job seeker program to other categories of people. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to also understand too is um, with the Treasurer's powers with JobKeeper, um, I guess what can you give confidence or, or provide any commentary around um, how will the Treasurer go about um, assessing whether there will be a need to look at different categories when the need arises, and I'd be interested to see, uh, um, you know, what, what trigger points will there be that the government will say, well, okay, we'll, we'll agree to, um, you know, uh, include certain categories of uh, of people onto the JobKeeper program. Minister. <laughs> Again, I mean, I really have addressed this in my second reading summing up speech. Um, the reason we have given, or why this legislation proposes to give the treasurer this uh, flexibility is because we recognise that. Uh, this is an evolving situation and there are likely to be unforeseen issues uh, that will arise in the future and uh, it is going to be important in that context both for the Minister for Social Services and for the Minister for, uh, and for the Treasurer uh, to be able to adjust uh, relevant rules and uh, eligibility criteria and the like in the context of an evolving situation. By the same token, I've made very clear the, the government's position in relation to a number of categories that have been put to the government now. We are not proposing uh, to expand the JobKeeper program to uh, local council workers. I mean, local council workers are the responsibilities of uh, states, and the state governments recognise that. We're not proposing to expand uh, the JobKeeper payments to uh, TAFE uh, or state school employees. Again, these are matters uh, for state governments. We're not proposing to expand them to temporary visa holders for the reasons that I've uh, clearly spelled out. We're not proposing to expand the JobKeeper payment to uh, casuals that uh, have been with the same employer for less than 12 months, again, for the reasons that I've already outlined. But in, in the future, 
um, issues might arise that we can't currently foresee. And out of an abundance of caution uh, in this legislation, uh, the government has proposed to give the Treasurer uh, this discretion uh, to be able to flexibly respond. I mean, these sorts of decisions will be subject to the uh, normal decision-making processes of uh, government. Uh, but uh, by giving the Treasurer the um, f um, discretion uh, in this legislation and uh, Senator Rustin that discretion uh, in the legislation that we passed about 10 days ago or so, a couple of weeks ago, um, we are able to flexibly respond to an evolving situation. Senator Giacone. And I appreciate the Minister's response. Um, and I guess with coronavirus highlighting the complications that can arise when the economy um, <coughs> becomes heavily reliant on temporary visa workers, um, um, will the government consider measures in the future to encourage more permanent forms of migration? Minister. Um, th thank you, Chair. Um, Australia is a great migrant nation. Um, Australia's success um, in large part has been built over, like, on, the, on the back of um, generations and generations of um, people who have chosen to make Australia their home, and many, uh, many represented in this chamber come from a proud, um, proud uh, migrant tradition. And um, I think this government, like other governments, uh, you know, supports the uh, contribution uh, made by permanent migrants and, and, and migrants that have chosen to make Australia their home uh, all throughout our history. Senator Chacon. Um, <coughs> given that holders of uh, the working holiday maker visa make up a significant proportion of the low-skilled um, workforce in the ag industry, and given how important this labour source is to Australian farmers, why does this bill provide no support for working holiday makers who make temporary um, uh, who may be temporarily experiencing a reduction in work but want to stay in Australia and make a contribution to our national economy? Minister. Well, we've got a lot of Australians out of work and our priority uh, is to ensure that Australians are able to, uh, at this point in time, uh, pursue those jobs that are available. But um, those working uh, holiday makers who have jobs, and, and you know, of course, I mean, they are welcome to stay. In fact, we have uh, announced certain flexibilities in relation to their visa arrangements during, during this period, including um, uh, letting them uh, work for the same employer for longer than they ordinarily would be able to and, and, and various, other, various other arrangements. But the, the principle is very basic, simple principle. If you are a temporary visa holder, including a temporary visa holder with work rights, you are expected to support yourself while in Australia. Uh, you either uh, you are expected to support yourself either uh, through work or through your savings or by accessing your superannuation. We've made it easier for temporary visa holders to access their superannuation in this current circumstance. And if you're not in a position where you are able, if you're not in a position to be able to look after yourself, then we would expect you to go home. Senator Seward. Thank you. I wanted to ask about. Um, the job keeper and the payments going to part-time workers. So there's a flat rate and in terms of part-time workers, they normally work a certain amount of time. Will an employer be, uh, be able to require part-time workers to work more if they don't want more hours? Minister. Th thank you very much. Uh, so they can't require, but of course uh, consenting parties can agree, as they can under ordinary laws. Uh, Senator Siwa. Sorry, you'll be aware that I've got a, an amendment on this. So uh, is, I want to be really, really clear um, that employers can't force a part-time worker to take on more hours if they don't want to, given that there's a flat, there's a flat rate they can't say, well, this is how much, this is the number of hours that in the old, you know, previously you would have, um, would equate to that much money. They can't force that. I want to be really clear about it. Minister. I thought I was extremely clear about it. They can't force it, but, but of course consenting parties can reach agreement and, uh, you know, we would encourage, uh, you know, all uh, those businesses and employees in this situation to seek to come uh, to uh, sensible uh, 
common sense agreements with each other. Oh, Senator Wish Wilson stood at the same time. Senator Wish Wilson. Just a slight variation of that question, uh, Minister. So, um, if, a, if an employer was to say to an employee, if you want this job keeper, you want me to sign you up for the job keeper scheme, I'll expect you to work the equivalent hours of the $1,500 a fortnight payment, that employee would be able to go to Fair Work and complain, or where would, where would they take uh, where would they take that situation? Minister. Well, so, so for the third time, uh, yes, an employer can't do that. Um, and yes, uh, an employee could complain in, in, that, in that circumstance. Uh, but again, um, uh, you know, we would encourage all uh, Australian workers and all Australian employees and their employers uh, to work uh, together through this period uh, in, in, a, in a consensual spirit. Senator Patrick. Um, just a couple of questions in relation to businesses that are seeking to make uh, uh, that are seeking to uh, provide their workers with uh, uh, a basic a tie over until such time as these payments commence in May. Uh, I believe that's the advice on the uh, on the fact sheets. Uh, I've had a couple of constituents contact me and basically say they've been to their bank and their bank uh, is refusing to provide them with enough uh, money to a cover off on the job seeker payment. Uh, I spoke with Anna Bly this morning. Uh, she uh, said there may be some latency issues associated with, uh, uh, with uh, some banks understanding uh, what all of the uh, requirements are. Can you please lay out um, what the government uh, has done formally in respect of guaranteeing uh, or indeed communicating to banks to try and uh, assist uh, to make sure that uh, these businesses can tie themselves over until the May payment. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, I spoke to a, uh, someone in a bank this morning who said that they still have quite rigid requirements in respect of uh, uh, requirements from the regulator uh, uh, that require them to go through a number of hoops. Are there any changes in that space in respect of uh, 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 directions to banks to uh, in, ensure that people are not tied down in, in paperwork as they seek to, and I'm talking about businesses seeking access to loans from banks to cover them over between the 30th of May, sorry, between the 30th of March, and the uh, and the payment first payment, which is expected to come sometime early May. Minister, uh, th thank you, uh, Chair. L let me just first make an observation that. Um, in the context of the coronavirus crisis, the banks have actually been fantastic. I mean, they, um, they have really uh, sought to do their bit to help support our economy uh, through this period in terms of the way uh, they have uh, approached, you know, in particular, uh, business lending uh, and, uh, and indeed um, challenges faced by uh, Australian borrowers more generally. In, in relation to the issue of the JobKeeper program and being able to use um, that program um, and the expected payment as a basis to seek credit, well, that is an initiative uh, which, as you know, um, Anna Bly, as the CEO of the Australian Bankers Association, did um, flag in a statement that she released on the 5th of April. Now, I'm, I'm reluctant. I mean, you mentioned a specific example. Um, it's always hard to make judgments without knowing the financial circumstances of an individual business as to why uh, they may or may not be able to get financing. And I was just observing my own mind that really, in terms of our mindset towards the banks, we seem to have come a long way from, um, you know, essentially um, all of the uh, recommendations for stronger protection of borrowers uh, in the wake of the Banking Royal Commission and now the proposition that you put that we should make sure we get rid of all this paperwork so they can get easy access to finance. So I mean, it's, 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 it's quite a spread uh, in terms of the aspiration and what we're asking uh, our banks to do. But that's just, that's just an observation on the side. In terms of the broader issues, I mean, the government has taken unprecedented action in coordination with the RBI and APRA to ensure the flow of credit in the Australian economy, in particular for small and medium enterprises. This includes the government providing a guarantee of 50 per cent to SME lenders for new unsecured loans to be used for working capital, which enables lenders to provide credit, which will result in SMEs being able to access additional funding to help support them through the upcoming months. To ensure support is being provided to small and medium-sized businesses across Australia, any particular bank or 
non-ADI lender is required to provide weekly reporting on a number of factors, including the average interest rate they're offering. This will be a way of comparing what lenders are offering, ensuring they're not taking advantage of SMEs under the scheme. In addition, the government has provided ASIC and APRA with record levels of funding, which has enabled them to increase their focus on consumer protections to ensure that all regulated entities are complying with the law. The government has also provided the Australian Office of Financial Management with $15 billion to invest in structured finance markets used by smaller lenders, including non-authorised deposit-taking institutions and smaller authorised deposit-taking institutions. This provides SMEs with the option of going to a wider number of lenders, including small banks and non-bank lenders, to get the credit they need without having to only rely on the big four banks. The government is also providing a temporary exemption from responsible lending obligations, going to the question of uh, piper work, I guess, for lenders providing credit to existing small business customers to help small business get access to credit quickly and efficiently. The government is confident that with these measures in place, banks across Australia will do the right thing and provide support to assist otherwise viable businesses across the economy who are facing significant challenges due to disrupted cash flow to meet existing obligations. And I stress here to support and to assist otherwise viable businesses across the economy. Should banks not comply, then the government would be able to take action under existing frameworks, including the Banking Executive Accountability Regime, which holds banks and their senior executives to account, and includes a range of tougher consequences if expectations are not met. This framework will incentivize good behaviour and ensure that banks and individuals are held to account where they fail to meet the standards expected of them. Uh, Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you, uh, Minister. Look, look, I wasn't uh, intending to say anything bad about the banks. I was just trying to understand what uh, the government had put in place, and so thank you uh, for that answer. Just one question that flows from that answer is. Uh, uh, and again, it's uh, based on a, another constituent who is uh, in, a, in a pretty good position, but has noted that uh, the margin between the official interest rate uh, set by the RBA and the, the credit that is being offered to them in support of uh, uh, their business during the crisis is quite high. So it's quite a large margin. Um, you mentioned that there were reports going back, I presume, to um, the regulator in relation to interest rates. Uh, does the government have uh, any sort of expectation, and I, I, appreciate, I appreciate it does depend on risk profiles, but as, as to what is reasonable in respect of the uh, difference between the RBA uh, 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 interest rates and what banks should be um, setting as interest rates in, in relation to these coronavirus uh, payments? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. The government doesn't set uh, prices. The government doesn't set uh, the interest rates charged by the banks. I mean, in the end, we have a, a competitive uh, banking sector, and uh, we are uh, going out of our way to ensure, as you've as you've indicated, that there is the capacity of comparing what lenders are offering, ensuring they're not taking advantage of SMEs under the scheme, and specifically by requiring uh, weekly reporting on a number of factors, including the average interest rates um, that are being offered. I just would make the general observation compared to what. It was the case in the past, and in particular, and including on the back of some of our uh, initiatives, I would put it to you that the interest rates available to um, small uh, business borrowers uh, now um, are better than what they have been. Senator Wish Wilson. Sorry, I did, I did note you were on your feet a second ago, Senator. I just wanted a small <laughs> clarification uh, in relation to the relaxing of responsible lending laws. Uh, through this period, uh, Minister, does that only relate to helping businesses, uh, for example, pay their first month of the, uh, the, the economic stimulus, the JobKeeper package, or does it relate to tying them over during the period, or can they, for example, go out and get a massive capital loan uh, under this, under this, uh, this risk, you know, lift it, relax r restriction regime? Minister. Uh, uh, th th thank you very much. Well, I mean, the banks will still make uh, their proper assessments, uh, but um, and uh, you know, th the answer to the first question is no. It, I mean, the um, uh, exemption from the um, um, responsible lending rules uh, is not just limited to the uh, loans in the context of the JobKeeper program. Uh, that is uh, something. The temporary exemption from responsible lending obligations for lenders providing credit to existing. Small, existing small business customers to help small business get access to credit quickly and efficiently 
uh, is a, a general exemption, uh, but it's existing uh, businesses, uh, existing small business customers, and, and so they would have a pretty good read on their uh, viability and profitability in the ordinary in ordinary times, and um, and we think in current circumstances that is appropriate. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you. Um, uh, Deputy President, just uh, in relation to the previous question they asked regarding partnerships uh, to the Minister, uh, would the government consider amending the package to allow the active partner along with the principal and the partnership to claim the job seeker payment? Minister. So um, that, that is not something that we are proposing or considering. This is for one individual in the partnership. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions that hopefully I can, um, I, uh, can get, uh, go through fairly quickly, and they relate to um, issues relating to um, uh, income support and the process under uh, this next six months. Can I confirm that the reviews that are normally carried out on a periodic basis of uh, people on DSP, carer payment and carer allowance um, have been or and or will be uh, suspended? Minister Rustin. <coughs> Senator Seward, as you, you would imagine, um, the absolute priority and the, pretty much the full um, sort of use of, of the workforce um, at Services Australia has been directed towards uh, making sure that we progress the applications for payment of people who have come onto payment. Um, in limited circumstances, um, particularly where it was in the interests of the of the person, uh, the person who was, the assessment was un needed to undertake, we would probably do so. But there would have to be quite exceptional circumstances where um, the safety of both the person undertaking the assessment and the person who the assessment was um, being undertaken with um, were not compromised in any way. So. Um, whilst there hasn't been a blanket decision to cease all f reviews over this period of time, um, there certainly has been uh, a decision that we will only be undertaking them under exceptional circumstances. Senator Seward. Uh, I think the minister. I've had a number of people. That was my understanding. Um, but I've now had a number of people approach my office saying that it seems like the standard review doesn't sound like it falls into that exceptional circumstances. In those instances. What happens? Will they continue, um, even though they're not exceptional ones, or can they say no? They don't want to, you know, don't want to do it at the moment because they don't want to expose themselves to risk. Minister Rustin. Uh, look, thank you, um, Senator. So, what I'd suggest you do is what you have been doing over the last few weeks. Um, often, what happens is there's a lag in the system where a decision is made, and it takes a little bit of time before the system actually slows down and, or, or, or actually enacts the, the action. So, what I'd suggest you do is um, provide me with the advice, as you have been on other circumstances. Uh, we will address them, and, uh, and if the matter persists, we'll obviously need to take stronger action. But at this stage, it appears as if it may just be a lag in the in the system. Senator Seward. I appreciate um, that, Minister. We're just we're getting people. Um, as I said, ringing up and, and saying that it's difficult to respond. So we'll, we'll take those on notice um, and, and go straight to you. Thank you. Um, can I also confirm the issue around income um, reporting that was suspended during that very intense period of uh, Centrelink being swamped? Uh, my understanding was was that you know people tried they did try to report their debts and I'm aware that a number of people did but a number of people did and it was not successful. Mine, I've again had people come to me and say they've now had debt notice, which seemed actually quite quick. Um, so they and there's other people saying, well, we're really really anxious that we're going to get a debt notice. So there's a couple that have, but there, there's a lot of people that are anxious. It was my understanding is during that period where they couldn't. Um, and they did try um, to report their income, that they're anxious that they will get one. Can I confirm that, in fact, that is not going to be the case? Minister Rustin. Uh, Senator, so once again, I'd be very interested in seeing the individual cases because um, we did sus suspend um, reporting um, and so that there would be no reason why um, Centrelink would be aware um, that if somebody hadn't reported income that they actually had income. So. I'm a little confused about how it might have been raised, but if debt notices have been raised for the period you're talking about, that uh, would seem like it would have been an error uh, and we'll pursue them. 
Senator Seabrook. Thank you, but thank you very much. That's appreciated. Um, the because I, I found it a, a bit incredible, but they uh, are a bit confusing. But they assure me that that's what it was related to. So I will follow that up. But I just want to confirm that for those that are anxious, and we have a lot of people that are just plain anxious because there's because they weren't able to report, um, that they won't get a notice because they're very worried about it. Minister Rustin. Um, thank you. Uh, my understanding was between. Um, I'm just checking the dates that it was suspended. Yeah, to, well, they, they was, the income reporting was suspended until last Friday, um, and so for the period, I think it was the two weeks prior to that, um, nobody was required to have reported income. So uh, you can be absolutely assured in giving an assurance to anybody who is anxious, um, who believes that they should have reported income during that period and didn't, that there is no issue at all that they didn't. Income reporting commenced again last Monday once the system was back able to cope with it. Senator Seward. Thank you for that reassurance and I can assure you that we were reminding people that they needed to start income reporting as well so there was no issue. Um, I wanted to go to the issue and the recent announcement about the, the debt um, the suspension of, of debt processing. There have been people that have sought advances on their Centrelink payments, you know, when they seek advances for big costs, that have been told no in the past because they had uh, debts. Now, for people that do need advances and they have frozen debts, are they now going to be able to seek those advance, advances um, where you know, some crisis happens, etc? Minister Rusta. Um, Senator Seward, I'll endeavour to get you an answer to that in the next few minutes. Um, my understanding is that they should still be able to get their advances, but I will check that and, and get back to you during the questioning. Senator Seward. That's uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Um, now, you've uh, suspended mutual obligations to the 27th of April. Again, very much appreciated. And you've also indicated that if there's ongoing problems, that'll be extended on um, what basis will you make um, that decision? Minister Rustin. The, uh, the original reason for us sus suspending mutual obligations was obviously to make sure that our systems were completely focused on making sure we got new people onto payment. Um, but um, you know, there, there are a number of things that will impact um, people's ability to, to meet their um, obligations. So a number <laughs> of things could occur. We could continue to suspend them if, if it seems an unreasonable expectation because of the, the, the level of quarantining and, and, um, and the, the requirements of the states in terms of people's actual behaviour. Um, but um, equally, um, it, it could just be um, you know, that, that there, are, there is no, no work available. So it's one of those things that we're going to be constantly keeping an eye on and we'll be making the decisions closer. But I will certainly undertake to make sure that a decision in relation to any extension on mutual obligations or a limitation or a limiting or changing of what those mutual obligations that we give you as much time as possible. Senator Seward. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Could I um, ask, in terms of the National COVID-19 Coordination Commission that was announced by the Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago, uh, it, it, there were some members of that named up front in the announcement. Uh, it was uh, my understanding that there would be subsequently there may be additional people added to that. You'll be aware that um, we felt very strongly there should be somebody from the community sector um, that with an experience in working very strongly on the ground. Um, uh, we're also of the opinion there should be somebody from First Nations there, for example, and, and from vulnerable groups um, represented as well. I'm wondering, has there been uh, further people added to commission, and if so, who are they? And if not, when do you expect to be reporting uh, or letting people know there's been additional people appointed? And are you considering making sure First Nations and other vulnerable uh, people, other you know, vulnerable groups, are on the commission? Minister Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, and, and I very much respect that this, um, these are issues that. Um, Senator Seward you know, feels very strongly about and is very passionate about. They're not commissions related. They're not issues related to this bill. They're legitimate questions, and I'm happy. Um, they're legitimate questions, and I'm happy on notice to provide answers to them. I would also encourage uh, you through the. Um, I, th I believe you will be a member of the Senate Select Committee, and I'm sure that through your work you would um, 
uh, one of the organizations that you will ask to appear will be the COVID-19 uh, Coordination Commission Chair. I'm, I'm sure that you will do that. And uh, I would encourage you to put these questions and pursue these questions with him too. They're not related to the legislation in front of us. And I'm just mindful of, of, of the time and, and the fact that we probably, that Australians probably expect us to get this to a close in a not too distant future. Senator Seward. Sorry, Minister, I'm trying to be as expeditious as possible. This does relate to the things that this package of legislation relates to. And I appreciate what you've just said in terms of uh, the Commission appearing before the committee. However, I was asking about the membership of that Commission. That Commission has a very important role. And I would have thought it would have been easy to answer the question to let me know. It's not up to the chair to tell me who's on that commission. It's actually up to the government who appointed the commission. I am trying to be as expeditious as possible, but these are issues that Australians are asking us about constantly. So the question is, oh, Senator Waters. Uh, yes, thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. I've got a, a number of questions across a range of issues, but likewise I intend to be very brief. Um, just firstly on the rulemaking power, can the minister confirm that the broad rulemaking powers granted under the Payments and Benefits Bill cannot be used to override or otherwise alter any employment conditions or social security entitlements that a person might otherwise have? Minister. Um, well, the Treasurer in this legislation doesn't get the power to change IR laws or Social Security laws, if that is, if that is the question. Um, there are obviously, uh, there is the capacity here through the rulemaking power for the Treasurer to vary payment rights, but that can only be prospective and that is in the context of this legislation and this, and this payment. Uh, we've also previously legislated um, as, a, as a parliament uh, to give the um, Social Services Minister certain powers for a temporary period, sunset it to the 31st of December uh, 2020 to make changes to various um, payment rights, eligibility criteria and the like in relation to income support payments. Senator Waters. Yes, thanks, Minister. I might come back to you with some follow-up questions. I'm aware of the general provisions, but it was more a specific question about whether employment conditions could be unilaterally varied. Um, and I, I, my understanding is no, but I was just hoping for a confirmation. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, thanks for the clarification. Um, just a couple of quick questions on paid parental leave. Um, just again confirming that um, PPL uh, leave taken does not affect the continuity of service for casuals, such that if they return from paid parental leave, but they haven't returned for longer than 12 months, that their previous service in that role would would count and that they would be eligible for job keeper as casuals that had been employed for more than 12 months but had been on that period of paid parental leave. Minister. Unpaid parental leave does not break continuity of service under the Fair Work Act to the extent that a casual employee is a long-term casual employee who is eligible for unpaid parental leave under the Fair Work Act and they are on unpaid parental leave. That period can count for the purposes of satisfying the 12-month regular and systemic requirement as a casual for the JobKeeper payment. Unpaid parental leave does not break, as I've said, the employee's continuity of service. So as long as that employee is on the employer's books on 1 March 2020, then that employee will be eligible subject to any other criteria which might apply. If a casual employee is on paid parental leave, for example, under the terms of an enterprise agreement, then that period will also count as service towards meeting the 12-month regular and systematic requirement for eligibility for job keeper payment. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, just a related question on um, PPL. If a worker is on PPL but due to COVID their employer closes down, what happens to, their, to the uh, worker's ability to continue to receive the 18 weeks government funded? PPL 
who, who would administer that if their employer closes its doors? Minister. Uh, there is no change to these arrangements. I mean, these arrangements will, will continue to operate as normal. If an employer remains viable, remains a viable business, has shut down by standing down its staff, an individual will continue to be paid by their government-funded PPL according to their current arrangements, typically paid to the individual by their employer. If an employer is no longer a viable business and an individual no longer has an employment relationship with their employer, Service Australia will instead pay individuals their pay parental leave entitlement directly on a fortnightly basis. Senator Waters. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Minister. Just one question about the appropriations bills. I understand we're cognating those, so I can ask about those. Thank you. On the $40 billion uh, discretionary fund, I understand that amendments um, in the bills before us pertain to when that money can be spent and that now it's permissible to spend it in subsequent financial years, not just the current one. We don't have a problem with that. Um, I'm just seeking some clarity. There's a mention in the explanatory memo about how the large amount reflects the associated uncertainty about what may be required as part of the government's response. So I'm just interested in what are the parameters that will guide that discretionary spending? Are, are there any written anywhere? Um, how close a link to COVID is the expenditure required to have? Um, and where is the, the oversight of the discretion in the exercise um, in dispensing that fund? Minister. Uh, uh, thank you. F first, let me make a slight correction in terms of uh, when the fund is available. So part of the problem is that this financial year it was not yet available. It, um, under the supply acts that we uh, legislated last time, the uh, fund, uh, the, the advance to the finance minister to the tune of $40 billion was becoming available from 1 July 2020. And clearly, uh, the uh, urgency and emergency is with us now. And so um, we did uh, believe and we are proposing to the parliament and we're very appreciative of the support from the opposition and as I understand from what you've just indicated from the Australian Greens that it was um, prudent uh, for the government to be able to have access to this fund, this, this larger fund earlier. We're not adding to the fund, uh, we're just um, making it available essentially from uh, Royal Assent uh, um, for the remainder of this financial year and then the appropriations acts for 2019-20 uh, will lapse and then the Supply Act 2020-21 will kick in and uh, whatever um, uh, amount is spent out of the um, Appropriations Act, um, five and, uh, Act 5 and 6 for 2019-20 will be deducted from uh, the fund that is legislated in the Supply Act 2020-21. That's, that's the first bit. Uh, in terms of um, the um, uh, circumstances in which uh, this uh, advance to the finance minister can be spent. Uh, this is a, a long-standing, it's a long-standing um, uh, arrangement in our Appropriations Act. In, in fact, in the Westminster system, it's been in place uh, for hundreds of years uh, as, as um, a, a prudent management tool to deal with urgent and unforeseen um, uh, items of expenditure. Um, and um, there is established um, there are established rules in relation to all of this, and there are established accountability requirements. Um, as Finance Minister, I've got a report um, uh, to the Parliament, um, to the Senate, uh, on the use of the advance. The Auditor General uh, reviews uh, the report that is prepared on the use of the advance um, on an annual basis. Um, but in the context of this particular fund, given it's got a, a larger size, we have agreed to some additional uh, transparency measures in our uh, engagement you know, with the opposition. I've uh, made a uh, commitment that every week uh, when a determination has been made under the advance of the Finance Minister that I would uh, issue a statement um, explaining uh, what funding has been allocated and for what purpose. And you would have seen that I issued such a statement last Friday when we uh, committed $800 million to the Department of Health for the purchase of uh, more masks essentially and um, uh, other uh, personal protective uh, equipment uh, for our health workers. Um, I, I essentially, right now, I mean, I can't uh, foresee what is unforeseeable. Uh, I mean, so this is this. The reason we have this fund in place is to deal with unforeseen uh, requirements in the context of the crisis that we're dealing with. I mean, so um, the cost of um, uh, medical uh, equipment and uh, personal uh, protective equipment is uh, higher than what it has been in the past. Uh, the competition globally is more intense. 
and the demand domestically in Australia is higher than uh, you know what it usually is and so we do expect that there will be uh, more calls on that uh, fund in that context. I should also say that if there is any expenditure item uh, that goes above one billion dollars then I would seek the concurrence of the opposition uh, for that payment through the um, shadow uh, Minister for Finance. Um, and so there is that additional check uh, and balance uh, in there as well. So it's not just a matter of uh, me running off. Uh, in terms of uh, the decisions underpinning the allocation of funding, the normal uh, processes of government would apply. Um, so I can't just make a decision myself to incur expenditure. Um, the uh, decision uh, to incur expenditure is going to be a decision by government through the normal processes subject to the authority of the Prime Minister and, and as applicable uh, decisions of the Expenditure Review Committee and the like, but ultimately I have the capacity then, the fiscal capacity, uh, to allocate funding to these urgent and unforeseen needs. I hope that answers your question. Oh, thank Senator you very Waters much. waits for the call. Oh, sorry, Senator Waters. Yes, thank you, Minister. It does. I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple of uh, additional questions that uh, sort of pertain to subsequent amendments. I'm happy to ask them now to expedite things if that suits. Okay. Um, just a question about the prescribed period in the bill. It's defined as running from the 1st of March to the 31st um, of this year, but under the rules, it shows that job, the job keeper fortnights end on the 27th of September. So my question just asks about why it is that the power to make new rules goes beyond um, the job seeker fortnights and um, what, what does this pertain to? Do you intend to keep making payment schemes after August when Parliament should resume and would otherwise be available to approve future payment schemes? Minister. Well, I mean, the, the truth is, uh, so Parliament is scheduled to resume, but we don't know what we don't know in terms of how this uh, crisis plays out. And it is prudent to give ourselves that flexibility to be able to deal with these things you know, over like a six month period. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, Minister. So can I just seek your reassurance that were Parliament to resume, that you would seek to use the normal courses of Parliament to approve any future rulemaking rather than relying upon this catch-all power? Minister. Well, I mean, the, the reason this um, power is in this legislation, as in a similar power in the uh, legislation that we um, passed last time is to give ourselves flexibility to deal with an evolving, continuously evolving situation. Uh, but of course, I mean, once we return back to normal, we would return back to the normal processes of farming. Senator Waters. Thanks, thanks, Minister. That's good to have that um, that statement. Now, on the rulemaking power in Section Seven, it does appear incredibly broad. What other payment schemes do you have in mind as yet to create future rules that you're able to share with us at this point? Minister. And predict uh, what unforeseen circumstances might arise in the future. I mean, the definition of unforeseen circumstances is that they're unforeseen. But uh, what I do believe is that it's prudent for the government, for the Treasurer, uh, to have this power so that we do have the capacity to uh, respond to a, a continuously evolving situation. Senator Waters. Thanks, Minister. Do they have to be connected to the COVID um, pandemic, though, on, in an economic sense? They've got to be. Minister. Uh, well, they've got to be related to the JobKeeper payment, which is directly related to the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis and the economic implications of it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Minister. So do they have to be for the benefit of workers as such, or could payments pertain to an entity? Um, be made for any purpose that you see fit. Minister. Uh, look, th th this is part of the coronavirus economic response, and uh, the, uh, you know, as, as we've indicated, it is prudent for the uh, Treasurer to have powers to flexibly make rules that are relevant to responding to the economic response to the coronavirus crisis. Senator Waters. Sorry, Minister, so just so I understand what you've said, the payments wouldn't just relate to workers. The new rules could also relate to money that could then be issued to entities. Is that what you just said? Minister. I, I, why don't I read you what it says? I mean, because it's actually very, uh, it's very self-explanatory. The rules may, and this is um, section seven, it's on page four. 
the rules may make provision for and in relation to one or more kinds of payments by the Commonwealth to an entity in respect of a time that occurs during the prescribed period, and you've already mentioned the prescribed period, and the establishment of a scheme providing for matters relating to one or more of those payments and matters relating to such a scheme. Paragraphs A and B do not limit each other. So it is, it is a broad-ranging discretion that will enable the government to uh, respond uh, to the um, economic challenges flowing from the coronavirus crisis in a, uh, you know, in a, with the appropriate level of flexibility. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. So, um, Minister, that, that could, could, for example, relate to a, um, a potential rescue package for an industry like small brewers in this country who, who have, uh, are potentially looking at losing their, their, uh, their stock and their, their, their livelihoods because the product they produce can't be, can't be sold through, through outlets anymore, and a lot of it is in, uh, in keg form, and they're looking at potential, potentially millions of dollars of losses of inventory because they've been forced to shut down. Is that the kind of thing that could be useful? Minister. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm, I'm not going to start speculating on the circumstances which may or may not arise. I mean, there's lots of... Uh, I mean, our, our approach uh, to this uh, coronavirus economic response as much as possible is to work through existing uh, systems and processes and to make economy-wide and sector-wide um, uh, um, decisions and measures, pursue sector-wide and economy-wide measures. Um, I mean, the section here is, is extremely clear. Um, it uh, relates uh, to um, one or more kinds of payments and all the way through uh, the second part, the second paragraph of section 7, uh, talks about the eligibility criteria for a payment, if or how an application for a payment may or must be made. So it is, it is a broad-ranging discretion, discretion that will enable the government to flexibly respond to what is an evolving situation. Senator Waters. Uh, yes, thanks, Minister. I'm almost finished. I'm just back on that earlier point. So the Section 7 payments that can be made to an entity, my question, um, apologies if I wasn't clear earlier, was can that payment be made for any purpose or must the payment be made for the benefit of workers? Minister. It doesn't limit uh, who the payment could be made to, but it can't be for any payment. It's obviously, uh, it is a section on coronavirus economic response payments. So it is in relation to payments that the government uh, may uh, or may not decide from time to time may be required in order for us to uh, appropriately support the Australian economy throughout this uh, coronavirus crisis. That's Senator right. Waters. Okay, thanks, Minister. So it's not necessarily just for the benefit of workers. It sounds like you're envisaging it as a more broad um, economic measure. Minister. Well, that is what it explicitly says in the section. And in fact, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it is, it is extremely, it's extremely clear in the section. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, President. Um, look, seeing as other people are asking questions about their amendments, I might just ask a few quickly so we can, we can, we can get them out of the way. Um, but just, just, just before I do, though, Minister, is it your understanding that um, the UK, New Zealand and Canada um, uh, aren't discriminating between foreign workers and domestic workers in terms of accessing their, their stimulus payments, their emergency economic stimulus payments? Minister. Uh, th thank you very much, um, Chair. What I know is that um, if you compare internationally uh, what uh, we are doing and what other countries are doing, uh, our scheme is uh, materially, significantly materially more generous. Um, I, I just, compare, just to compare uh, to New Zealand, the United Kingdom uh, and uh, Canada. So in New Zealand, um, for um, somebody working at least 20 hours a week, uh, they receive $585 ID a week. For somebody working less than 20 hours a week, $350 a week. If subsidy exceeds wages usually paid to an employee, any difference is to be used by the business for wages or other employees affected. So when that is obviously an amount that is lower uh, than the Australian amount. In the United Kingdom, uh, it is the lower of uh, two and a half thousand pounds per month, per month or 80 per cent of uh, their regular wage. And in um, Canada, it's 75 per cent of the first uh, $58,700 normally earned by employees representing a benefit of up to 
$847 per week. However, employers who suffer a drop in gross, gross revenue of at least 30% in March, April or May, when compared to the same month in 2019, will be able to access a subsidy. Um, but employers would have to keep records demonstrating their reduction in arm's length revenues and remuneration paid to employees. And there are many details that are yet to be confirmed in relation to this. Where well, the JobKeeper scheme is more generous than the New Zealand scheme, the JobKeeper scheme is broader than the UK scheme. Uh, and uh, you know, we believe that we have uh, uh, developed a system that is administratively more efficient um, to um, administer using existing channels through the ITO, which allows uh, government uh, to ensure businesses are passing on the subsidy in full to workers. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Deputy President or Chair, but that, that, wasn't, that wasn't answering my question. My question was, are you aware that those countries in particular are allowing foreign workers access to their emergency stimulus payments? Minister. Uh, th thank you very much, Chair. I'm, I'm not aware of the uh, visa arrangements of uh, all other countries around the world. What I do know is that in Australia, uh, and I've uh, said this many times now, and this will be the last time that I make this point in the interest of time. Um, it has always been an expectation under our um, laws that temporary visa holders are able to support themselves while in Australia. Those who are unable to support themselves over the next six months, either through work savings or access to superannuation, are strongly encouraged to return home. Uh, the time uh, to do so is now. Senator Wish Wilson. The reason I ask the question, uh, M Minister, is the last seven years under your government in this chamber we have signed multiple uh, trade, trade and treaty agreements with countries all around the world, not, not just bilateral agreements but um, huge multilateral agreements that cover a whole range of uh, rules and regulations around, for example, the mobility of labour. Uh, and I'm just wondering if your government has, has sought any reciprocal processes with these countries whereby if we pay foreign workers or allow them access to our schemes, we can seek compensation from those countries further down the track and vice versa for Australians who happen to be in Canada or the UK and other countries. If they seek those schemes, whether we would potentially compensate their governments as part of the uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, the, the answer is no, and we're dealing with a real-time crisis. And uh, quite frankly, the, the time is just not available to be able to do these things. But like our, our visa laws are very clear, and we believe that the arrangements that we have made are overwhelmingly supported by the Australian people. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Minister. Look, just just a a, a simple question: uh, what, Why? Why, why has the government chosen May? I understand you haven't got a date, a specific date yet, as to when the first payments will flow to employers uh, under the JobKeeper scheme. Uh, why, why the one month? Well, actually, it was a six-week delay from the time this was announced. Minister, I've, I've made that point many, 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 many times. I mean, uh, organising this sort of program and these sorts of payments. For six million Australians, is a huge logistical exercise, and uh, to get this set up does take time in terms of making sure the system is able to do so accurately and um, efficiently and effectively. Uh, it's entirely driven by the time required in order to get all of the systems in place to uh, do this at this sort of scale. So the question is that. Excuse me, madam. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Roberts. Thank you. One Nation agrees with the sentiment in many of the amendments, yet now is not the time and for discussing these, and I will explain and then check with the Minister. Minister, I have two questions after first confirming my understanding. <laughs> Firstly, as I said in my reply to the Minister's statement earlier today, we have been concerned about the complexity of legislation already in place and the added complexity now of this legislation and the speed with which these changes are being made. Yet the legislation allows ministers to make changes as regulations. Like the opposition, we understand the short-term need in the circumstances to give this government the power and this power, and we'll be holding them accountable throughout the period of managing the virus and after the virus passes. We will continue to listen to our constituents and make and we'll continue to advocate for them to put ideas to the government to protect workers and any groups that fall through the cracks. Our understanding is that unions have publicly acknowledged that the government has worked well with them on making changes to the legislation. 
The opposition, too, has publicly and in this Senate acknowledged the government has worked well with it. Our party has passed constituent concerns and ideas to the government, and the government has implemented them. Secondly, the government and opposition have stated that they will oppose all other amendments. Any amendments to this legislation, regardless, would need to go back to the House of Reps and delay this package getting out to the people who need it. Thirdly, given the complexity of the amendments and the lack of costing, some of these amendments have no time for us to check the legislation. We would be neglectful to, su to support these amendments with such little notice. All parties, as I understand it, have had ample opportunity to suggest changes to the government. Minister, can you confirm the minister's ability to make regulations to close the cracks in legislation to ensure fairness for any people in need that have been missed in this legislation and regulations to protect taxpayers from abuse of the new provisions? Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and I thank Senator Roberts uh, for uh, those comments, for those remarks and those questions. Uh, the Treasurer does have um, a wide-ranging discretion, temporary, as the discretion for Senator Rustin in uh, the legislation we passed a few weeks ago is also temporary, uh, to um, respond to unforeseen circumstances. And, and also, I mean, of course, we will continue to monitor the situation. Uh, as it evolves, and we do want to ensure that uh, those Australians and, um, who, who need um, support can get appropriate levels of support. Uh, and uh, even as issues emerge that require our attention, we will have the flexibility under that rulemaking power to respond uh, to any such circumstances. And um, in terms of scrutiny, uh, there will be the opportunity, of course, for the Senate Select Committee to scrutinise the government's response. Uh, and it's a very wide-ranging, with some very wide-ranging terms of reference, both the government's uh, response on the health front as well as on the economic front. And uh, I would, uh, and I know that Senator Roberts has uh, nominated to be a participating uh, senator on that committee, and I would encourage uh, him uh, to uh, pursue all of the issues of concern to him and to One Nation and through that process. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Minister, just following on from that, can you please confirm that because of the answer that, that uh, ministers can make uh, changes in, through regulations, there is no upper spending limit on this bill. If the estimates are in error, then $130 billion could become $150 billion. What is the top end? And that's my last Minister. Uh, thank you. I mean, uh, so Senator um, Roberts is right that the $130 billion is, a, is an estimate. Uh, it's an estimate in a demand-driven program, uh, though some of the uh, commentary that I've seen from um, uh, observers, and I, I believe that I've read some comments from Chris Richardson, uh, the, the view among commentators appears to be that we have erred on the side of conservatism rather than uh, on the side of um, rather than on the side of underestimating. But the truth is, it is a demand-driven program. These are estimates. Uh, and um, changes in uh, parameters, in economic parameters, or changes um, in terms of decisions could vary, could have, a, could have a, a, an impact on the estimate moving forward. Senator Seward. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I um, wish to move my uh, amendments relating to the definition of uh, charity the cha and the charity uh, specific eligibility. Um, which means that I'm, move, would seek, I'm seeking leave to move uh, clause uh, one and two on sheet H930. I have made the argument in my second reading contribution onto why I think this is essential. There are a couple of uh, short points I wish to make. Um, what I didn't talk about in my second reading uh, amendment due to time is the, the fact that this uh, pandemic and the crisis have an impact on charities' ability to, um, work, to uh, support and also um, have volunteers supporting their efforts. Um, um, there's Senator a number. Seward, let's just get them oh, moved by leave. Yeah, sorry. Is leave granted? Thank you. Please continue, Senator Seward. Uh, thank you. I did just want to make the point that charities are struggling now to uh, access volunteers and in fact a number of uh, charities I understand and not-for-profits have been told that their volunteers won't be covered for insurance and, uh, for COVID-19 which means that they are not being able to access volunteer support. I mean, in some instances they are then um, trying to see if they can get uh, other volunteers or in fact um, having to pay workers. The point here is, is that 
we recognise and appreciate that we've gone down to a 15 per cent versus the 30 per cent for not-for-profits. The point being is that a lot of charities and not-for-profits actually get a lot of tied grants. They have no discretion over that funding, but they've seen significant drop-off in their funding in donations and their revenue-raising capacity. And ACOS did a short survey. I won't go through all the detail because of time, but one of the outstanding statistics for me of their members, and they got over, over less than 24 hours, I understand 168 of their members, um, who represent a lot of uh, people, uh, uh, responded and said that they felt that at this stage 37 per cent um, thought that their job uh, who thought that they have job losses um, th thought that they wouldn't come under the 15 per cent turnover drop because they have those tied grants now that's 37 per cent um, uh, would have job losses is quite a significant amount so I'm moving this amendment I won't rehash all my other arguments for this but I do ask under what basis I do realise that the tax commissioner has some discretion. Under what basis is the government prepared to reconsider this issue? If you don't support this amendment, which I'm sort of guessing from what people have said won't get supported, so I'm keen to know under what is there a point that you would keep reassessing the not-for-profit and charity sector to see when the tax commissioner. Um, would be looking at exercising their discretion. Minister. Thank you, Chair. The government will not be supporting this amendment. Uh, the turnover test for charities has already been relaxed in light of their special circumstances. And let me say we worked very closely with ICOS in relation to this. Uh, it's true that um, we haven't been able to deal with all of their issues, but where we could, we certainly have gone out of our way to address their concern, excluding additional forms of income from the turnover test could result in assistance being directed to charities that have not been significantly impacted by COVID-19. In addition, it would be difficult for the ITO to source such information and verify the accuracy in a timely way. The bill already provides flexibility to adjust the turnover test if the need arises. In relation to the Commissioner's discretion, well, that, that is a matter for him. In relation to the question of uh, in what circumstances we might make further changes, well, as I've previously indicated, we will continue to assess uh, an evolving situation and we will continue to make decisions. I mean, I can't um, make any predictions here or, or speculate on what we may or may not do, but we will continue to assess how uh, the coronavirus is impacting on the economy, on jobs, on business, on uh, the community services sector, uh, and, and on all Australians, and we will continue to make adjustments and, and, and decisions even as required. Senator Seward. Um, Minister, I did make the point that we acknowledge that there was a different, uh, a different test. You have actually made different tests for businesses to break them down into um, uh, allow the entities where they're joined to get where the businesses are as a group. You've allowed them to separate out into entities for the purposes of the uh, of this provision. Why can't you then make the make a, a concession or make? Uh, the same sort of consideration to charities, because this will impact on charities, charities that you are relying on to make sure that we get through this pandemic. The, this isn't about themselves. This is about their ability to be able to support Australians that are in crisis. That's why they're asking for this. So the question is that the motion is, are you seeking Senator Rich Wilson the call? Okay, I'm putting the motion. Senator Patrick. Uh, I'm, I'm just not sure of the process in respect of uh, divisions here. Uh, if uh, a division is not going to be called, I wish to indicate the Centre Alliance. Well, support. let's get there first, Senator sure. Patrick. So the question is that the um, motion on sheet 8930 is moved by Senator Seawett by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Senator Seward? Can I, do, uh, I won't call a division. Can I please have it registered that the yes. Greens support The Greens Party and Senator Patrick, Centre Alliance? Yes, Centre Alliance will, will, will be duly noted that uh, you, uh, object, you agreed with the amendment. Uh, Senator Seward? Um, can I um, move now? Uh, request one. 
Order. Can I move um, request one on sheet 8948? It relates, relates to temporary visa holders, um, access to JobKeeper. Um, we have had substantive discussion in this chamber um, about uh, this particular issue. We, we, very, uh, we are very deeply concerned um, about this uh, issue and about access to um, the, these provisions that the parliament is quite rightly moving um, to address the current crisis. We think that the people that are on temporary visas uh, do need access to these uh, provisions as well as uh, to, to be able to um, have a form of income and, in this instance, to be able to work um, where um, jobs are available and where they've had jobs. Um, I've, we've, we've covered this substantially in the chamber, so I won't rehash those arguments other than to try and say, please change your mind. Please support these workers. Please support, support these people that have no form of, will have no form of support. And I tabled a, a petition earlier today that had nearly well, 20,523 20, uh, people sign on to it in a relatively short space of time to urge the government to move and to support uh, the people that are being left behind. So the question is that um, the amendment on sheet 8948 as moved to, by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. uh, I believe the noes have it. Senator Seawitt? The Greens uh, be recorded as supporting this amendment. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Patrick? Is asked that uh, Senator Alliance be recorded yep. as supporting the, Thank you. the amendment. Duly noted that the Greens and Senator Alliance uh, supported that amendment. Senator Seawitt. I would now like to move to request one on sheet 8934 relates to um, casual employees. And we, again, we've had substantial debate in this chamber about uh, casual employees who um, for some reason aren't able, for um, no apparent reason um, that we can see, that's justifiable, that uh, have had their work less than 12 months. And, and I, I heard another, uh, an instance quoted in, in the chamber earlier today. I think a person was three days uh, outside the period of qualifying for 12 months. I had someone that, I think it was 13 days is outside the period of qualifying for this. Um, and surely the idea here is to keep as many people uh, working as possible and as many people connected to work as we move out of the crisis and the economy picks up. The idea is to keep these uh, workers, I would have thought, uh, connected to work as much as possible. There's over a million, as I understand it, over a million workers who fall, who are working. They're working, they're casual workers. Uh, who just don't happen to have had their jobs for uh, 12 months, some very close to. Um, there's, in some instances, there's very little difference about the amount that these casual, uh, cas the casual workers that have been working for under 20, uh, 12 months have uh, been earning. Um, and as I articulated in my second reading contribution, um, for the households where some of these workers, for households where these uh, the, these workers are part of. 50% of the household income is coming from these workers, these casual workers that are missing out. I, I, I don't know how we can justify to a worker that's been working, working, that you don't get JobKeeper, you can't access JobKeeper because you haven't had that job for 12 months, um, where some where casuals have um, been working for 12 months. Um, it's just it's not justifiable. We should be extending this to casual workers so we keep as many people connected to work and supported in the workplace as possible. I strongly urge the government to extend these provisions to all those workers, a million workers, a million workers. I had a, a, an older gentleman contact me who's actually a part-time pensioner who's been working just under the 12 months. In fact, now I tell a lie, I've had two in the last 24 hours. Another one contacted me just a couple of hours ago saying, part-time worker, uh, a part-time worker on a part pension um, doesn't qualify because uh, they, they had changed jobs and uh, haven't been connected to the job for 12 months, just under the 12 months. Um, they're gonna miss out. They're gonna miss out. 
um, and they're on a part pension. So this is important to Australians. It's important to workers who what they want to do is hold on to their jobs. So the question is that the request on sheet 8934 as moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. And are you requesting this a division? Um, ring the bells for four minutes. Hello. Stop the clocks and I advise that no further senators are to be permitted into the chamber. 
The question is that the request on sheet 8934, as moved by Senator Seawick, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawick as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being four ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just allow senators a few moments to get back to their respective places. Senator Patrick. Chair, I um, move uh, request uh, one on sheet 8932. Uh, Senator Alliance uh, is moving this amendment because uh, we're of the view that visa holders that have a, a visa that permits them to work, that work in this country, that contribute to this economy, uh, that are working uh, within our society, ought to be able to have access to job seeker. Um, in some sense, uh, it, 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 there's a racist a aspect to this. We've got people in Australia who are working, uh, working hard, just as much as their their, uh, their Australian colleague. They're contributing, and yet the government will not uh, uh, allow them to uh, uh, to have access to uh, the job keeper payments. And uh, so we'll uh, we'll, we'll be urging. Uh, senators, to, senators to vote for this amendment. But before I put the amendment, I'd like to make a plea to the opposition, who have indicated that they simply won't support any amendments because of urgency. Now that's poppycock. The, uh, the, the government's made it clear that the payments associated with the bill that will pass through this chamber tonight will not be made until May, until early May. There is no need to pass this uh, uh, tonight urgently. Uh, there's no need to even provide certainty because we know that Mr Albanese has said that he will give support to it. So to, to make a claim of urgency is in, in fact somewhat, uh, somewhat misleading. Uh, I've watched uh, Labor senators come in to the chamber tonight and stand up and genuinely state cases and stories about uh, visa holders, about casual workers, about a whole range of people who will be affected by, uh, uh, by this legislation passing in the form that it is tonight. There's an opportunity. The Greens have been uh, moving amendments that fill some of those cracks. Central Alliance has just moved an amendment that seeks to fill those, those, uh, those uh, cracks. Unfortunately, what we see is you shout and you yell and you, you um, uh, posture that you, care about, uh, uh, that you care about these people. You start your negoti negotiation off by saying that uh, we want amendments, but no matter what, we will pass the legislation. 
It's like going into a car yard and saying, I'd like to buy that yellow car over there. Uh, I, I do intend to buy it. Now can we negotiate the price? You're not going to be able to negotiate in that way. I don't know why the Labor Party can continually does this, where they say, uh, we will support the legislation uh, even if you don't support our amendments. It just doesn't seem uh, correct. And then, of course, uh, Mr Albanese says, uh, we're only going uh, to move our amendments and if they don't get up, we're going to vote for the legislation in, 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 uh, in any case. And where do they go and move them? They move them in the House where they know they won't get up. When the green bells ring in this place, you know what the answer is already. Because if the government doesn't want to do anything, they have the numbers. If you're serious about moving amendments, don't move them in the other place. Move them in the, in the Senate. You can see that there is support for the thing, sorts of things that you hold uh, dear to your heart. It makes no sense. If you really care, you will bring these into the Senate where there is actually some chance that the cracks will get filled. Now, I, I hear you saying you, you, you don't want to do that because that will take time. You'll have to send it back to the House uh, if the amendments get up. You know what? That's our job. That's our job. There is no rush to get home. I'd rather spend an extra day here getting people uh, 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 supported properly than racing home to a parliamentary holiday for four months. Okay, so um, please, if you really care about people, and I genuinely believe that Labor senators do, I don't, I don't think that uh, Labor senators have stood up and said what they've said without, uh, without meaning it. They do. Yet somehow the leadership here simply says, we're not going to support uh, an amendment that actually most of your members agree with, because you simply don't want to uh, spend the time sending it back to the other place. You don't know that they're not going to support it, Senator Keneally. You're not even trying. You're not even trying. Order. You pretend Order. to be an opposition. You pretend to be an opposition. It's not good enough what you are doing. Uh, you know, one of the roles of the crossbench in this place is to keep an eye on the government, but unfortunately we have to keep an eye on the opposition as well. We are moving amendments that I know that your senators, your members and your constituents uh, want uh, uh, to pass, yet you're going to sit on the wrong side of the chamber. Uh, because you want to get home early. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. And, um, I have kept my comments fairly limited in uh, this debate, other than speaking to second readers. But I will make some comments in general about the amendments, but I do have to uh, first respond to that very um, inflammatory um, contribution from Senator Patrick. And I mean, anyone who knows Senator Patrick in this place knows that he goes and uh, you know, he's a a bit of a going goes wherever it's convenient for him. So having to suffer through a lecture about uh, conviction um, and principle is a bit rich coming from you, Senator Patrick. Frankly, uh, the leader of the opposition has made it very clear about Labor's position on this, and frankly, the convenience of being on the crossbench and the lack of responsibility that you have to have yes. around the the bigger picture does not apply to the Labor Party. So I'll take a political lecture in the context that you are the crossbench and you can vote however you feel like on anything and you can blame the major parties, but the parties of government have to think of the bigger picture. This is a good package overall, $130 billion Order. going to six Order. million workers, many of whom are facing a fortnight or in the past fortnight losing their entire income. And what you are saying is let's play a ping pong between the House of Representatives and the Senate for those six million workers. Well, we will not do that. We will not do that. If you think that passing an amendment here, based on the contributions from the minister in charge here, 
that we've heard tonight and the contributions from the government in the House of Representatives where they have a majority, that an amendment from here, if it got up, would change the mind of the government tomorrow. What a crock. You know it. You know it. And what you're doing is um, grandstanding Senator through Gallagher, you, Madam your Deputy seat, President. Resume your seat. There's a point of order, I think. Senator Wish Wilson. The yeah, President, I just think in terms of inflammatory that the uh, the Senator should be addressing her comments to the chair, not, not, not across the chamber to an individual senator. Uh, thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. I have allowed some leeway, but you are correct. Please address your comments through the chair. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, I will. <laughs> but to run the argument that an amendment moved in this chamber will suddenly change the government's mind tomorrow and not result in the government ignoring that amendment and it coming back here, and then what? Then do we all fold? And say, oh, or do we then send it back? Do then we, we have a game? We have a game. We have tried. We tried in the House of Representatives to change the government's mind. That is what we did. That is what we did. And we made it clear that if the government did not change their mind and support our amendment, Order. we would not insist on those Order. because we wanted those workers to have access to this lifeline and the businesses. It's the right decision. It's a decision that parties of government need to make, and we are making it in the national interest, not in the interest of Senator Patrick, who'd like to get a media grab up tomorrow, frankly, whose pay isn't under threat. Well, six million workers' pay is under threat, and two million more people who have lost their jobs and might need job seeker. And we have a job to do here tonight. We have uh, put in place Order. the appropriate scrutiny. We have given powers to the government for them to amend their program if they have to, based on what happens over the next couple of months. We have taken every step to be responsible. And we will not be lectured by Senator Patrick, who's playing a game. We will not play that game. So the question is that the um, request, as moved by Senator Patrick on sheet 8932, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I believe the noes have it. I'm not hearing anyone call a division. So you request a division. Division required. Can we ring the bells for a minute or people need them for four? A minute? Ring the bells for a minute. No, we're on the we're on the phone. Is there enough? Stop the bells and uh, no more senators into the chamber. So the question is that the uh, request 
as moved by Senator Patrick on sheet 8942 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being four ayes and 22 noes, the matter is resolved in a negative. Just advise senators if further divisions are required uh, and if the leaders are okay with one minute, that's how the time we'll ring the bells. We'll just wait for senators to get back to their seats before we move on to the next amendments. Senator Waters, you're seeking the call. Um, thanks very yep. much, uh, Deputy President and Chair. I should say I move amendment. Uh, the request to amend on sheet 8942 in extremely brief rundown. This again pertains to casual workers. Of course, we'd like all casual workers and international students and those on working visas to be able to be eligible for JobKeeper, but unfortunately we've lost that amendment. So this amendment focuses purely on casuals, um, particularly those who would have continued in work were it not for coronavirus. So there's three further groups that this would cover. Um, the first are people who an employer previously had on and was about to put back on when coronavirus intervened. The second group of people who were about to start work with an employer, um, and the employer is prepared to attest to that in writing, but coronavirus meant that they couldn't start. And the third group is um, the many hundreds of thousands, in fact millions of people who make ends meet doing work in lumpy patches throughout the year. So, for example, the arts sector where people will get work around certain festivals or productions and then take a break and then move on to the next project. This amendment says that if you've got a proven history of earning a decent income, then you should still be eligible to get the higher job keeper rate, not the lower job seeker rate, um, which is eminently fair in this modern workforce. And I commend the amendment to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the question is that um, the amendment is moved by oh, just, yeah, Senator Waters on sheet 8942 be agreed to. Sorry, um, Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Waters. The green support for that be recorded. Thank you, Senator Waters. Um, make sure that's done, Senator Patrick. So our support for that request. Thank be you. Recorded. We will note that um, Senator Alliance and the Greens both supported that amendment. So the question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests, Senator Patrick. Move uh, request uh, one on sheet nine, uh, eight nine four four. It's an amendment that seeks to. Uh, uh, provide casual workers who have uh, been working uh, for uh, more than three months, between three and twelve months, uh, with an average of more than 20 hours per week uh, uh, over that period. Uh, because, uh, so we want them to get the job, job keeper because they are clearly people who have entered the workforce, they are committed to it, they have established a relationship with an employer. Uh, and uh, we're of the firm belief that these people should not be left uh, uh, isolated from that employer. Uh, they are people that are trying to get on uh, and, and assist the economy, trying to get on with their life, uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a pretty important uh, 
it is pretty important that these people are supported properly. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is that the motion, the request is moved by Senator Patrick on sheet 8944 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Senator Patrick. Like uh, Senator Alliance recorded as having supported the motion. Thank uh, you. The request. We'll, we request that uh, that is uh, recorded that way. Senator Waters. Likewise. Thank you, Senator Waters. We will ensure that your request to be um, seen as supporting that amendment is also recorded. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Deputy President, I, um, I move uh, amendments on sheet 8941. Um, I just want to talk briefly to this. Um, Senator Coleman. Uh, which ones are you moving? Are you moving the one and two, and are you seeking leave? Yep, so I'll seek leave to do it together is if that's leave easier. Leave granted to yep. move one and two together. Leave is granted. Please continue, Senator Wilson. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. Um, Senator Coleman said in here tonight that um, he thinks Australians are very anxious to get this legislation and and get on with this, um, but the money is not going to flow for at least another month. And I don't think I'm uh, speaking out of school here to say because I'm sure the finance minister and others in this chamber have all received very consistent feedback from a number of small businesses that that's too late. Now, I think there's a number of, number of reasons why the government is paying this payment in May. Um, and the, the statement from Senator Cormann tonight that they just, the government just doesn't have the capacity to get this ready uh, in time, um, I, don't, I don't think that's acceptable. Um, we were calling for a wages guarantee over three weeks ago. Uh, and I know the government wouldn't come at it then, and they put in place a uh, job seeker payment. Um, but the facts are a, a number of eligible small businesses are not going to sign up to this really important wage subsidy scheme that we've got before us tonight. Now, just in Tasmania, which I think has been acutely impacted by this, especially the hospitality and the retail industry and the tourism industry more broadly, literally forced to shut down over three weeks ago, these operators, the survey that the Tourism Ministry Council has just completed of their members, showed that nearly a third, between 33 and 40 per cent of eligible businesses, business who, businesses who said that they knew they were eligible, were not going to nominate to get the job keeper package. They weren't going to nominate. And the key reason the feedback was because they didn't have the money, they had no revenue, they'd already closed their businesses, they didn't have the savings, and they didn't want to take on the risk of finding the money. And in, in some instances, a small business that might have a turnover of around a million dollars with 20 employees, you're talking about wages bills of $40,000 a fortnight, at least $40,000 a fortnight. So how is a small business that's got no savings and no revenue going to come up with $80,000 to pay their employees? Sure, they get reimbursed when the government puts this payment in place, but if you want to achieve the outcomes that we all want, which is to get as many Australian workers on a wage guarantee as possible, then I urge senators to support bringing forward the payment from May to, in line with the, the Greens amendment here, which is in approximately nine days. So it's not straight away, but it's still over a week away. And I'd like to get on record here tonight that, uh, and I know the Labor Party campaigned on this in the, in the 2019 election, but we've consistently seen cuts to the Australian tax office and to the public service. Nearly 4,200 workers lost their jobs at the beginning, in fact, the first day of the 2019 election, and it's the tax office that's going to be administering this scheme. And I, through the Senate inquiry, the joint parliamentary inquiry into the big four accounting firms, know exactly how much work has been outsourced to the big four accounting firms from the public service. So if the, if the, if the finance minister is saying tonight that this payment can't be brought forward because we just don't have the capacity to do this in time, 
then I would just want to get on record that we need to significantly invest in our public services, especially in the Australian tax office. And I think that's something that uh, many of us would support. So I urge senators to support this Greens amendment tonight. It will make a big difference to the uptake of this package. Uh, we asked uh, Treasury the other night in a briefing, and they've been very forthcoming with information, how many eligible businesses are taking up the JobKeeper package. I've only got the Tasmanian data, and unfortunately uh, it's very concerning. Uh, and they said, yes, there's been 780,000 businesses uh, at least register interest in this. That gives us no idea about the percentage of small businesses that aren't. And we want to see small businesses sign up their employees to this scheme. We want to see it succeed. We fought very hard to get a wages guarantee in place, and we genuinely want to see it succeed. So I'd ask senators to give this amendment serious consideration. Give these payments to these small businesses as quickly as possible. It's a much better chance that we're going to get through that hesitancy and get them to sign up to this scheme. So the question is that the amendments um, moved by Senator Wish Wilson are by leave on sheet 8941 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Is Senator Seawitt seeking the same arrangements to be recorded as yes, supporting please. and Senator Patrick? Yes, that please. will be duly noted. You'll both be down as supporting that amendment. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I seek leave to move not only um, one and two on sheet 835 by leave together, but also for the expeditious um, proceedings of the chamber to also at the same time move uh, amendment one on sheet 8936. Um, very briefly, 8936 goes to— Let's just get the leave oh, sorry. first. Thanks. Um, agreed. Thanks, Senator Waters. Thank you. 8936 um, simply restores the ability of parliament um, to consider any rule changes once we have resumed. We had a discussion about that earlier, so this would simply formalise that. 8935 goes to the broad discretion um, of the Treasurer to create new payment schemes. It's currently so broad that our reading is that the government can hand out cash to any entity that they see, say they see fit. We're concerned about the ability of fossil fuel companies to once again put their hand out. So this amendment would prevent payment schemes to prop up those industries, except were the money to flow directly to workers. Thank you. So the question is that the motions as moved by Senator Waters, so that's the motions by leave on sheet 8935 and sheet 8936 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Senator Seawitt or Senator Waters, aye. same arrangement? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Senator Patrick, same aye. arrangement? It supports those amendments. Thank you. We'll note that the hands out will record the Greens and Senator Alliance as supporting those amendments. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Um, I will with, be withdrawing um, Amendment 1 on sheet 8946 that relates to the protection of part-time employees because uh, Senator Cormann outlined, uh, uh, outlined what will happen there, so thank you very much. And I too seek leave to not only move requests 1, on two, one and 2 on sheet 8937 together, but I also seek leave to move um, the requests on 1 and 2 on sheet 8943 together as well. These relate to— Just a moment. Would oh, sorry. leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Um, these are just uh, very, very briefly. These relate to extending the uh, eligibility criteria, extending eligibility for the COVID-19 supplement, uh, the job seeker payment to uh, those that are in receipt of DSP and carers allowance. You can tell it's getting late, can't you? Um, and also to uh, those people that uh, on, are on temporary uh, visas. Um, as I articulated in my second reading contribution both this time and last time, these workers are, there's one group of workers that have no income and no access to job keeper or seeker, and the other group, those on disability support pension and carers, um, are facing ex uh, much higher costs and also should have a, an increase to deal with those costs. 
Thank you, Senator Seawitt. So the question is that the requests on sheet 8937 and 8943 by leave be moved together, um, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. Leave the noes have it. Senator Seawitt, same arrangement. Thank yes, you. Thank we'll you. note the Greens want it written that they agreed. And similarly for Alliance, please. Senator Alliance. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, President. Um, can I just get you? To, uh, can I just ask you to clarify which amendment? We're on the last one on the page, yep. so it's sheet so eight nine three two, three. Eight nine three three. So I move uh, one and two together on sheet nine eight by three three by leave. Leave is granted, I believe. Yes, thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. So the question is that um, the amendments on sheet eight nine three three. Uh, together by leave be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the noes have it. Do you want a division? So are people happy if we ring the bells for one minute? Ring the bells for one minute.
I stop the bells and no further senators to be admitted. So the question is that um, the amendments on sheet 8933 by leave is moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes. Order. And Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. So, the question, uh, so uh, there being four ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Before I put the next question, I'll allow people a few minutes to get back. So, the question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. <laughs> the committee has considered the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Bill of 2020 and related bills and agreed to them without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Bill 2020, Coronavirus Economic Response Package Omnibus Measures No. 2 Bill 2020. Appropriation Bill No. 5, 2019-2020. Appropriation Bill No. 6, 2019-2020. So the president has received. Sorry, the president has received letters nominating senators to be members of a committee. I call the minister. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I, move, uh, I move the motion circulated uh, in uh, my name in relation to the next meeting of the Senate. Uh, Senator Waters. Yes, Deputy President. I move the, mo uh, the amendment to that motion circulated in my name, and I seek leave to make an incredibly short statement. Is leave granted? One minute. Thanks very much. Um, now, this amendment would reverse the presumption that Parliament does not sit and would in fact say that Parliament should be presumed to sit. It would retain the ability of the opposition, uh, Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Government to agree that we not do so. 
presumably on health reasons. But we note the comments of the president earlier this morning that virtual parliaments are being investigated, and we, we uh, very much support that move. Um, the presumption should be that this parliament sits assuming that it is safe according to the health advice. The presumption should not be that we are not coming back until August. There is a massive amount of discretion that the bills that we have just passed here uh, gives to the government. And because our amendments earlier today to the Select Committee failed, we will not be able to scrutinise decisions and actions of the Health Minister and the Prime Minister directly. And therefore, it is all the more important that Parliament actually sits and that the presumption is that we are able to do that that, and we look forward to that being able to be done remotely. Uh, so I commend this amendment to the Senate. So the question is, the amendment moved by Senator Waters be agreed to? Those of that are Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Just very briefly, Mr. President, uh, we have had a couple of discussions on this um, uh, throughout uh, the last couple of days. Um, the Labor Party has been clear, the Labor opposition, that we would prefer that the parliament sits. Um, we think being here has demonstrated that it can be done and it can be done in a safe way. However, the government has made it clear that uh, they don't uh, agree with that, that they don't believe they need to sit or, or should sit through um, April, May and June. Um, and as such, I think there are limitations on if the government's not willing. Um, you know, we can't uh, force them um, to be here or to present a program. They have control over the program and the legislative agenda. And as such, um, you know, we've put the Senate Select Committee in place to provide some scrutiny uh, during that time. But we cannot force uh, the government, amongst some of the procedural limitations, uh, to attend and uh, if they are not of the view that it's needed. Um, and as such, we won't be supporting the amendment. So the question is, the amendment moved by Senator Waters be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
I've got to go by the hourglass, actually. Stop the ringing of the bells. The question is, the amendment moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. The clock runs a bit faster than the hourglass. For the information of senators, um, I appoint Senator Seawitt tell off the eyes and Senator Urquhart tell off the nose. His Excellency the Governor General notifying assent to 15 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. I have received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Omnibus Bill 2020. There being no other matters pursuant to the orders agreed earlier today, the Senate stands adjourned. I thank senators.